Sometimes I wish I were on it. Not that night you don't, thought Roby. What side of the street were you on? Side facing the bus door or the other side? The door was on the other side. Okay, go on. Well, it just blew up. Scared the hell out of me. Saw stuff flying everywhere, seats, body parts, tires. It was horrible. I thought I was in the middle of a war zone. Did you see anything that might have caused the bus to explode? I just assumed it was a bomb on the bus. You mean it wasn't? We're still trying to figure it out, said Roby. But if you saw something, anything, impact the bus, that could be important. A shot fired into the gas tank, maybe. Did you see or hear anything like that? Jordison shook her head slowly. I know I didn't hear a shot. Did you see anyone? Roby stared directly at her, but hid the tension he was feeling. After the bus blew up, I saw two people on the other side of the street. Before the bus was blocking my view, but then there wasn't any more bus. A man and what looked to be a girl, maybe a teenager. Roby sat back, but kept staring at her. Can you describe them? Better it come out now, he thought. The girl was short, wearing a hooded coat, so I didn't see her face. What were they doing? Getting up. Well, the guy was. The blast must have knocked them both down, maybe knocked them out. I guess I was far enough away, and the dumpster, I guess, acted as a barrier. But they must have been closer. They were on the other side of some parked cars. What happened next? The guy came to first, and then he went over and helped the girl up. They spoke for a few moments, and then the guy started looking around the parked cars. That's when the old guy back there started dancing around, yelling about s'mores. Then the guy and girl took off. Any idea where they came from? No. What did the guy look like? She stared at him pointedly. He actually looked a lot like you. Roby smiled. I guess I look like a lot of people. Can you be more specific? I've got great eyesight. Had eye surgery done before my life fell apart. But there were flames and smoke between you and the man, and it was dark. That's true. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup, if that's what you mean, but the fire really turned night to day. But my height build age, roughly. Yeah. And you're sure you saw nothing hit the bus before it blew up? Well, I was pretty wide awake by that time. But I didn't see or hear anything that would have made that bus detonate. Thanks, Diana. If I need to get back in touch with you, will you be around here? I really don't have any other place to go. She said, her gaze downcast. Roby handed her a card. I'll see what I can do to get you off the streets. Jordison's voice shook as she looked down at the card. Whatever you can do, mister. I'd really appreciate it. There was a time when I didn't take charity. Figured I could get it done by myself. Those days are long gone. I understand. Roby drove back to Donnelly's and was getting out of his car when Vance spotted him. We got a break in the case. She said after hurrying over to him. What? ATF guys found the source of the detonation. Where? Wheel well of the bus, left side. Had a motion sensor. Bus starts going, engages the timer. A few minutes later, boom. Roby stared at her, his mind racing. The guy after Julie certainly wouldn't have gotten on a bus he had just rigged to explode. That left only one explanation. I was the target, he thought. Chapter 50 Roby spent an hour with Vance going over the ATF findings, and then he slipped away and made a call to Blue Man. Her name is Diane Jordison, Roby described her. She'll be hanging around the area where the bus detonated. She was very helpful, and I think she might be more helpful down the road, but she needs to get off the streets. Too risky otherwise. Blue Man said he would take care of it and Roby had to trust that he would, at least for now. He planned to check on that later. At the end of the day, Roby could not trust anyone. I also want you to run down whatever you can find on a Leo broom. Work somewhere on Capitol Hill. 
How does he figure into this? asked Blue Man. I don't know if he does, but I have to cover that angle. That briefing, Roby. I want it soon. Blue Man clicked off. I want a lot of things, thought Roby. I want a way out of this nightmare. An hour later, he was back at his apartment. He took a shower and changed his clothes. He put his gun in a belt holster centered on his back and climbed in the Volvo, then texted Julie and received a response a few seconds later, confirming that she was okay. Roby sent her another text, saying he would be by to see her later and would probably stay at the apartment with her tonight. He drove across town and pulled into a parking garage around the corner from the old Ebbett Grill, a Washington landmark. It sat facing the east side of the Treasury Building, which was located next to the White House. He snagged a space near the entrance. Roby was here to keep his eight o'clock drink date with Annie Lambert. He entered the W Hotel and rode the elevator up to the rooftop outdoor bar, which was actually covered. Up here, one could enjoy views from the White House all the way up to Arlington Cemetery in Virginia. It was a weeknight, so the tables weren't full, but there were about twenty people cradling drinks, munching snacks, and ordering off the bar menu. Roby glanced around but did not see Lambert. He checked his watch. He was about two minutes early. He took a seat at a table next to the railings and gazed out over the cityscape. The buildings here were impressive. Anyone would think so. Well, probably not the people who were doing their best to blow them up. The waiter came over, and Roby ordered a ginger ale. He sipped on it and constantly checked the door into the bar. On his fifth rotation, he glanced at his watch. Fifteen after. Lambert might turn out to be a no-show. She might have wanted to call him, but he hadn't given her his number and he didn't have hers. Maybe late duties at the White House had interrupted her plans. He was about to get up when she walked in, spotted him, and rushed over. I am so sorry, she said. She draped her coat over the back of the chair and sat down, setting her bag next to her. She had kept on her heels, he noted. Her sneakers were probably in the bag. Her hair was down around her shoulders and proved to be an attractive backdrop for her long neck. You fast walked over? How'd you know? You wouldn't ride your bike with heels on, and you're pretty breathless for a short walk followed by an elevator ride. She laughed. Good deductions. Yeah, I left my bike at work and ran over. I got caught up in something right at five to eight. <laughs> Had to get it done, and I did. Then that deserves a reward. Roby waved the waiter over, and Lambert ordered a vodka tonic. The waiter brought it back, along with a bowl of nuts and pretzels, and set it down between them. Roby bit into a nut and took a swallow of his drink. Lambert sipped her cocktail and snagged a handful of the snack mix and gobbled it down. Hungry? No time for lunch today. Or breakfast, either, actually. You want to order off the menu? She ordered a cheeseburger and fries while he went with some spring rolls. My diet is not the healthiest in the world. Sort of an occupational hazard. Roby settled farther back in his chair and prepared himself to engage in small talk. He had wanted to have a drink with Lambert. But now that he was here with her, it seemed crazy, given all that he was confronting right now. I can't be normal, he thought, no matter how much I want to be. I can understand that. You do much traveling in your job? He said trying to sound excited to hear her answer. No, I'm not officially high enough in the pecking order to ever be considered for a ride on Air Force One, or even in any of the secondary planes, but I'm working hard and making a name for myself, and maybe one day, who knows, right? Right. So you enjoy politics? I enjoy policy. I don't really get into the campaigning or election stuff. Energy is my specialty, and I do white papers and briefing documents, and I help write speeches for the administration in those areas. So energy is your background. My undergraduate degree is in engineering. I have a Ph.D. in biochemistry with an emphasis on renewable energy resources, and we are running out of the fossil fuel stuff, not to mention reaping great harm through climate change. Roby grinned. What? Now you sound like a politician. She laughed. 
I guess the place rubs off on you. I guess it does. Their food came, and she bit eagerly into her burger and followed that up with several fries awash with ketchup. Roby put duck sauce on one of his spring rolls and bit into it. So what about you? You said investments and that you worked on your own. Actually, right now, I'm doing as little as possible. You don't strike me as that sort. You seem way too intense to just sit around. I don't just sit around. I've traveled quite a bit, done some interesting work, made enough to take some time off, and that's what I'm doing now, as little as possible. But at some point, that will end. You're right. I am too intense. Sounds nice, though. Just enjoying life. It can be. Or it can be really boring. I wouldn't mind trying it at some point. I hope you can. How'd you end up in D.C., or are you from here? I haven't met many people who are from D.C. I came from the Midwest. How about you? Connecticut. My parents were from England. I'm actually adopted. Only child. You don't have an accent. I only lived in England until I was five. Now the only accent I have is a New England one, and not much of that, actually. Do you have any brothers or sisters? No, just me. Wouldn't have minded some siblings. But kids don't really have any say in the matter. You sound like you wanted some brothers and sisters, too, said Roby. He glanced over her shoulder after he heard a siren. She looked at him resignedly. It feels like we're just going through the motions, doesn't it? Roby didn't process this right away. When he finally did, he looked at her. What? He said. Look, I know you said you wanted to get out more, and it was nice to have a drink together. But I'm not sure you're really here, if you know what I mean. She bit into a fry and looked down. She continued. I mean, I'm just a policy geek. I'll never make much money. I'll spend my life at a desk, writing well-researched papers that no one will ever read. And even if they do, they'll spin them in ways I never intended. You've made a lot of money, probably traveled the world. I must seem pretty boring to you. She nervously picked up another fry but didn't eat it. She just stared at it like she wasn't sure what it was. Roby hunched forward. Coming out of his protective shell in more ways than one, he took the fry from her and bit it in half. I wanted to have a drink with you. If I didn't want to, I wouldn't. And if I was going through the motions, I apologize. I really do. I don't find you boring. She smiled. Did you like the fry? Yeah. You want some of my spring roll? I thought you'd never ask. As they ate from each other's plate, she said, you probably don't usually eat fatty foods. I've seen you work out, of course. Do you run, too? Only when someone is chasing me. She laughed. <laughs> My metabolism must be really high. I eat crap and never gain an ounce. A lot of people would like to have that problem. I know. Some of the women I work with say that, too. She held out her burger. Would you like a bite? It's really good. He took a bite of the sandwich and wiped his mouth with his napkin. He finished chewing and said, I guess being at the White House is long hours, little exercise, eat what you can, and crazy schedules. Did you ever work there? Because you've summed it up pretty well. I don't think I'm White House material. Best and the brightest, you know. At least half the country would disagree with you on that. Roby smiled and watched her munch away on her fries. He took in the view of the city. Lambert followed his gaze and said, Even though I work there, it's so weird to see the snipers on the roof of the White House. Counter snipers, said Roby automatically, and then regretted the slip. He smiled. I watch a lot of NCIS. That's where I learned that word. I DVR it. Great show. They lapsed into silence again. Roby finally broke it. I'm sorry I'm not a good conversationalist. Has nothing to do with intent. Just tends to ebb and flow. Neither am I. So maybe we're very compatible. Maybe we are, said Roby. But now he found himself really wanting to talk. He looked out again, toward Arlington Cemetery on the Virginia side, up a hill. When the Union took over Robert E. Lee's land and turned it into a military burial ground, they said General Lee could have his property back if he paid the back taxes. But the catch was, he had to pay them in person. He understandably never took Lincoln up on his offer. I never heard that one. Don't know if it's true or not, but it's a good story. And you just disproved your point. 
You are a good conversationalist. I guess I have my moments. Do you like the investment business? I used to, he answered. But after a while, simply making money doesn't seem like enough. More to life, you know. There's always more to life than money, Will. Money is just a means to an end. It shouldn't be the goal. For a lot of people, it is. And there are a lot of people with screwed up priorities, especially in this town. Politician again, he said, making her face flush. Want me to be your campaign manager? Yeah, I can run on a platform of caring for others more than you care for yourself. That'll go over really big with the powers that be. Hey, screw them. Take your message to the people. He watched her as she finished her meal. So really, what's next for you after the White House? She shrugged. Just about everybody there has his life planned out 40 years. <laughs> they know exactly what they want and how to get it. Overachievers, I guess. Over something, replied Roby. He was thinking about Julie's similar answer when talking about the future. And when you work at the White House, you're really dedicating your life to someone else, the president you serve. Your whole identity is connected to the success of someone else. Must be tough living your life that way. Frankly, I never thought I'd ever get this far. You must have done something right. Ivy League, connections? Guilty on both counts. My parents are pretty well off, and they're active politically, so I know they pulled strings to get me here. I think to get to the big White House, you have to do it mostly on your own, because everybody at that level has strings to pull. Thanks for saying that. It's not usually what I hear. She pressed her napkin against her lips and studied him. So... What's next for you? Maybe a change in direction. I've been doing the same thing too long. Change is good. Maybe. And maybe we can talk about it some more another time. She beamed. Are you asking me out? Is there an interim step I missed? Can't go from drinks to date? That's okay in my rule book. Later when the check came, Roby picked it up despite her protests. It'll equal out, he said. This comment made her smile. He walked her back to the White House. She'd explained that she needed to finish up a few things and retrieve her bike. Along the way, Lambert slipped her arm through his. When they arrived at the gate, she held out a card. All my relevant info is on here, including my desk at the White House. Roby took the card. Thanks. Is there a way I can get in touch with you? Roby gave her his cell phone number which she inputted to her phone. She leaned forward and kissed him on the cheek. Thanks for a really nice time, Will. And let's work on that date thing together. Count on it. A few moments later, she had hurried through the White House gate. Roby walked off, trying to put aside their encounter, yet feeling the warmth of her lips on his face. It was strange days indeed. Chapter 51 Roby stood in front of the terminal from where the doomed bus had left. In his mind, he went over once more the events of that night. He had failed to kill Jane Wind, and the backup shooter had done his job for him. Roby had executed his escape plan and come to this bus terminal to catch a ride out of the city. He had told no one. He had left no trail of any kind but I did reserve a bus ticket for that day, and for that bus, using an alias that only I was supposed to know existed, he thought. But someone else knew, and they were willing to kill all those people just to get to me. He glanced around. There was no way anyone could have planted that wheel-well bomb on the bus here. It had pulled into the terminal and people had boarded. As soon as the door closed after the last passenger, the bus had sped off. But there were other people around the terminal. Another bus was leaving soon to take people south to Miami. The bomber would have been seen. No, the explosive was not placed on the bus here. Roby walked over to the terminal building. He glanced through the plate glass window and made sure the woman behind the counter was not the same woman who had sold him his ticket. It wasn't. He had confirmed earlier that there were no surveillance cameras either inside or outside the building. 
The company probably didn't have the money to spend on such things. He went inside the terminal. It was as dingy as the buses used by the company. He walked toward the counter and stood in line behind a large woman with a baby clinging to her chest. Another child was in a car seat, which the woman was swinging back and forth. This image made Roby think of Jane Wind and her two kids. When Roby got up to the counter, the young woman looked back at him with a bored expression. It was nearly eleven, and she probably wanted to get out of this place. Can I help you? He held up his creds. I'm looking into the bombing of one of your buses. She sat up straighter and looked more attentive. Okay. I need you to tell me where the buses come in from before they arrive here and load up passengers. We have a maintenance and prep center two blocks from here. The driver checks in there, goes over the trip schedule, and then does a bus safety inspection. It gets fueled and cleaned there, too, stuff like that. Give me the exact address. She wrote it down and passed the piece of paper to him. Thanks. What time do you get off? She raised her eyebrows as though she thought he was hitting on her and was not pleased by it. Midnight, and I've got a boyfriend. He said, I'm sure. You go to school? Catholic University. He looked around the depressing interior of the cinder block building. Study hard, and never look back. He climbed into his Volvo and headed two blocks south. The gate to the maintenance and prep yard was shut and locked. Roby finally got the attention of a security guard who was making rounds. The guy was suspicious until Roby flashed his badge. The guard unlocked the gate. Had some FBI agents in here already, the man said, and some NTSB guys, too, to see if the bus had something wrong with it. Did it? Beats me. So, what can I do for you? Walk me through the prep for the buses. I don't really know that much about it. I just get paid to walk around with a gun looking for trouble. And in this area, you usually find it. Who does know? Is that person here? The guard pointed to the old brick building. Two dudes in there. They work until 2 a.m. Names? Chester and Willie. They've been here a while? I've only been here for a month. They've been here longer. Don't know how much longer. Thanks. Roby swung the door open and looked around at a cavernous space with high ceilings, rows of tube lighting, five parked buses, rolling toolboxes, generators, and work lights in grill cages. Everything was drenched with the odor of oil, grease, and fuel. He called out, Anybody here? A tall, thin black man dressed in work overalls walked around the front of a bus, rubbing his hands on a dirty cloth. Can I help you? Roby held up his cred pack. Need to ask you some questions. Cops already been by. I'm just one more cop coming by, replied Roby. Are you Chester or Willie? Guard outside told me, he added, when the man looked suspicious. Willie, Chester's under a bus pulling a transmission. So... Run me through how the buses are processed. They come in maybe six hours before they're scheduled to head out. We go over them in here. Got a checklist of maintenance items. Check the engine, coolant, tire tread, brake, steering fluid. Clean the inside of the bus. Pick up all the crap people leave behind. Then we take it behind the building to the washing shed. Clean the outside. Then we gas it up at the fueling station near the front gate. Then it sits until the driver checks in and takes it to the terminal. Okay. Look, I showed all them dudes the maintenance records. Ain't nothing on that bus made it blow up. I know we don't look like much, but we take our work seriously here. Had to be something like a bomb. Could you show me where the bus would sit? Look, man, I got a ton of shit to do on three buses. I'd really appreciate it, said Roby, motioning to the door. Willie sighed and led him out and around the building. He pointed to a spot near the fence. They're parked right there until the driver shows up. How many buses were sitting here the night the one blew up? Two, side by side, the one heading to New York and the one heading south to Miami. 
Okay. Somebody looking to put a bomb on a particular bus. How would they know which was which? You asking me to think like some maniac? Nothing on the bus exterior to tell them? Oh, sure, there's a number on the front of the bus. The 112 goes to New York, the 97 bus goes to Miami. Roby said, So whoever put the bomb on there would be able to tell which bus was which if they had the bus schedule or checked online. I guess that's right. Or if they worked here. Willie took a step back. Look, man, I ain't got no idea how somebody put a bomb on one of our buses if that's what happened. And I sure as hell didn't help them do it. I knew two of the people got blowed up. One was a friend, and the other knew my mama. Went up to New York once a month to visit a granddaughter. Wore a damn robe on the bus. I used to think it was funny. Don't think it's funny no more. Almost gave my mama a heart attack when she found out. Roby thought back to the bus ride, to the old lady in her robe who had been screaming. So the 112 goes to New York. He eyed the fence, easy enough to get over. The bomber could have hopped the fence when the guard was on the other side of the property, plant the bomb, and then be gone. Less than a minute. He looked at Willie. That night, how long was the 112 bus sitting out here before the driver showed? Willie thought about this. Didn't have much work to do on it. It got in early from the last trip. Chester did the checklist, vacuumed the interior. I did the outside wash, fueled, and then parked it. Maybe two, three hours? Roby nodded. Did you notice anyone suspicious around? I'm inside most of the time working on the buses. Guard might have seen something, but probably not. Why is that? He does more eating in his little guard shack than walking. You get my drift? Why is so fat? Okay. Can I get back to work now? Thanks for the information. Willie left him and walked back into the building. Roby stood there in the dark and eyeballed the spot bus 112 had been in. Bomber did the bus. Roby got on the bus. Roby got off the bus. Bus blew up. They sent a shooter into the alley to finish the job. Someone really wanted him bad. Another thought occurred to him. But maybe not that bad. Doing some private sleuthing on your off time? He turned and looked through the chain-link fence. Nicole Vance was staring back at him. Chapter 52 Roby walked through the open gate. Where have you been all this time? Let's go back to Donnelly's. Why? I want to check something I should have already checked. Fifteen minutes later, Roby stood in the same spot he had on the night an MP5 had tried to rip his life away. He eyed where the SUV had been, then his defensive position behind the trash cans, and then over his shoulder at the shattered plate glass window. He walked back and forth and framed in his mind's eye the shot pattern of the attackers. Total number of dead and wounded as of right now, he asked Vance, who was watching him. Six dead, five wounded, one still in the hospital but looks like he'll make it. But not us. What? We're not dead. A somewhat obvious deduction. Eleven people shot, six fatally, and yet the shooter misses us? We were the closest target, right out in the open. Aluminum trash cans, the only thing between us, 30-round clips, and a cooler bed at the D.C. morgue. You're saying the shooter missed us on purpose? He looked over to find Vance staring at him, a perplexed look on her face. How does that make sense? How does it make sense that the guy missed us at basically point-blank range with a weapon that is designed for mass destruction in narrow fields of fire? There should be at least eight dead, including you and me. Look at the shot pattern. He was firing around us. Then are you saying they killed all those people for what? A warning? Something to do with the wind case? The bus bombing? Roby didn't answer her. His thoughts were racing ahead, taking him in a direction he had never expected to go. Roby. He turned to her. I guess, looking at it that way, what you're saying makes sense. 
I guess we should be dead. Then it has to relate to the winds, or the bus, or maybe both. No, it doesn't. But Roby- He turned back away from her to stare at the spot on the street again, from where the SUV had launched its attack. Someone has tagged me, he thought. Someone is playing mind games with me. Someone close is trying to get to me. Screw with me. Roby, do you have any other enemies? None that I can think of, he said absently. Other than a few hundred, he thought. Is this something you're not telling me? He broke off his thoughts and rubbed the back of his neck. Do you tell me everything? What? He faced her. Do you tell me everything? I guess not. Then you have your answer. But you told me I could trust you. You can. But you have your agency and I have mine. I'm assuming you'll tell me everything you can and I'll do the same. I've got people to report to and so do you. It all has limits. But that doesn't mean we can't work together to get the job done. Vance glanced down at her feet, poked a cigarette butt lying on the street with the toe of her shoe. So you find anything over at the bus maintenance shop that you can tell me? That bus was parked there a long time. Long enough for someone to plant the bomb on it. So the bomber knew the target was going to be on the bus. Do we have a passenger list? Only partially. For those who paid with a credit card, not for those who paid with cash. Unless a family member or friend came forward and told us a person was on the bus. So how many people on the bus? 36 plus the driver. We're doing background checks on all known persons that were on the bus. That's 29 people. That leaves eight unaccounted for. There were probably walk-ups that night who paid cash for the tickets. Roby thought, that includes Julie and the hitman. Can I see the list? She slipped out her phone and hit some buttons. She held the screen out to him. He ran his gaze down the list. Julie wasn't on it. And thankfully, neither was Gerald Dixon, which meant Julie had not used his credit card to buy her ticket. But no other name on the list meant anything to him, other than the alias Roby had reserved his ticket under. Okay, he had been the target, not Julie. But then, why really try and kill him on the bus, and then miss him on purpose when the MP5 had him in the kill zone? The plan changed, that's why, he thought. They wanted me dead, now they want me alive, but why? Roby? He looked up from the screen to find Vance gazing at him. I don't recognize anyone on that list. His lies to her were piling up quickly. So we still don't know the target. Roby did not want to lie to her again so soon, thus he said, Anything new on Rick Wind? Emmy did the post. Cause of death was suffocation. How? Petechial hemorrhaging was the main clue but he wasn't initially sure how it was accomplished. No pillow over the face, nothing like that. Why hide the manner of the killing? asked Roby, as he drew in a long breath. Harder to find out who did it? Maybe, maybe not. But he did find out the manner of killing eventually. Roby looked at her. And you couldn't tell me that first, why? I like melodrama. How was he killed, Vance? They forced his severed tongue down his throat and wedged it there. They used his own cut-out tongue to kill him. Thanks. Look, Roby, if the killing of Jane Wind and her husband and the bus exploding are connected, there have to be some common denominators. The only reason you think they're connected is because of the gun. That gun wasn't used to kill Jane Wind and her son. As I said before, whoever was in that apartment could have just flung it away after he got out of the apartment. It could have nothing to do with the bus exploding. Or it could. You really believe that? Or do you just want to have a terrorist bust and a murder conviction on your resume? My resume is doing just fine with or without this case. All I'm saying is, don't have tunnel vision on this. If the cases aren't connected, then trying to hook them together is not smart. You make assumptions and decisions based on those assumptions that you otherwise wouldn't make and you pound round pegs into square holes in the process. You get an answer, but it'll be the wrong one. And it's doubtful you'll get a second chance to make it right. She folded her arms across her chest. Okay. What would you do? 
Work both cases, but in parallel. You don't cross the streams unless you have solid evidence of a connection, and that means something more than a gun near the scene. Okay, that makes sense, actually. Roby checked his watch. I'm going to grab a few hours sleep. Anything shakes loose, you can wake me up. You have a place to sleep now? If not, you're welcome to crash at my place. Roby glanced at her. You sure about that? Why wouldn't I be? You were afraid people might give you shit, even though I'm on the couch. You don't talk, I don't talk. And even if it gets out, it was all professional, so screw them. So I can do you the favor. I've got a place. That changes, I'll let you know. Thanks. He walked to his car. He had turned her down for a specific reason. In his line of work, favors were almost never free. And he wanted to check on Julie. Chapter 53 Roby unlocked the door and turned off the alarm system. He shut and locked the door behind him and reset the alarm. Julie? He moved down the hall, his hand on the butt of his weapon. Julie? He cleared three rooms before reaching her bedroom. He eased the door open. She was asleep on the bed. Just to be sure, Roby watched the steady rise and fall of her chest three times. He closed the door and walked down the hall to his bedroom. He sat on the bed but did not undress. He felt hot and cold at the same time. His phone rang. At first he thought it might be Vance, but it wasn't. It was Blue Man. He answered. Got anything for me? asked Roby. Leo Brooms a Fed. Works as a public liaison officer. For what agency? DOD? No, DOA. The Agriculture Department? exclaimed Roby. You're kidding me. No, I'm not. What else in his background? It's being emailed to you right now. Take a read. And see what hits you. There has to be something there, said Roby. Then find it. Roby's email inbox buzzed. He hit the requisite keys and brought up the story of Leo Broom's professional life. He read it over carefully. Then he read it again, putting in order certain elements that seemed most promising. What are you doing up, he said, without looking at her. Julie stood there in sweatpants and a long-sleeved T-shirt and looking sleepy. How did you know I was even standing here? I made no noise. Everyone makes noise, regardless of what they're doing. I think you have eyes in the back of your head, Will. I wish I did, actually. She sat in a chair across from him. Find out anything? Yes, but not much makes sense. Tell me the part that does. I think I was the target of the bomb, not you. That's comforting. So I only had one person trying to kill me? Leo Broom works for the Department of Agriculture. Any spies work there? Doubtful. While lucrative, corn subsidies don't really get bad guys all that excited. So what's the connection? Might not be any. Then again, there might. Roby held his phone screen up. Broom was also in the Army, Gulf One. So? The woman and child who were killed? Her ex-husband was also found murdered. He was in the military as well. Maybe he and Broom knew each other. And if they did, what would they know that would get them killed? And how does that tie into my parents being murdered? I don't know. I'm still working on the possible theories. And whoever blew up the bus, you said they wanted to kill you. Why? For things I can't talk about with you. She sat there looking at him. Roby wasn't sure what her next question would be, but he doubted he could answer it truthfully. He glanced around the confines of the room. For a long moment, he felt acutely claustrophobic. What do you think they did with my parents' bodies? This was not the question Roby had been anticipating, but it was certainly an understandable one. He studied Julie, trying to read something deeper in her question that was probably there. She was still just a kid, despite the street cred, despite the brains. She was grieving for her parents. She wanted to know where they were. He got that. Probably in a place we'll never find. Remember them as you knew them. Don't think about where they are now, okay? It won't do you any good. 
easy to say. Yes, it is easy to say, but I think it needed to be said. Roby waited for her to break down and cry. Kids were supposed to do that, or so he'd been told. He had never done it when he was a child, but his childhood had not been normal in any possible way. But Julie did not break down. She did not sniffle. She did not cry. She glanced up at him, and the look on her face was cold. I want to kill whoever did this. The guy who did it was on that bus. He's just Ash. Stop worrying about him. He's over. I'm not talking about him, and you know it. Killing someone is not as simple as it sounds. It would be for me. You kill someone, you leave a piece of you with them. That sounds like a line from some stupid movie. It may sound like it, but that's exactly how you feel. You know a lot about that. What do you think? She glanced away and rubbed her hands nervously together. Could it be that this wind guy told something to the brooms who told something to my parents? Yes, it could. In fact, that's my most promising line of investigation. And you're doing this part with Super Agent Vance? Roby didn't answer her. So you're not working with her on this? I'm working with her on part of this. Okay, I get that. Do you? I want to be part of it too. You are, you've been helping me. But I want to help more. You mean you want to find the people responsible and kill them? Wouldn't you? Maybe. But you have to think it through. Will you help me kill them? I know you can. You need to go back to bed. The kid gets in the way, right? That's what you're figuring, isn't it? Put me in that box? I'm not going to be a part of putting you in any box. Least of all, a coffin. Julie visibly stiffened at this comment. What you have to get is that this is not a game, Julie. It's not a movie, TV show, or PlayStation crap. You want to kill them? Fine, I get that. It's natural. But you're not a killer. You hate them, but you won't be able to kill them when it comes to it. But keep one thing in mind. What's that? They want you dead. And when they get the chance, they won't hesitate for a second. You'll be dead. And there's no reset button to hit. What if I told you I don't care? I'd say you're young and think you're immortal. I know I'm going to die one day. The only question is when and how. And the answer should be eight decades from now and peacefully in your sleep. That's not how life works. At least not my life. It's not smart to be thinking that way. Look who's talking. You don't exactly lead a cautious life. My choice. That's my point. It is a choice. My choice. She got up and walked back to her room. Roby just sat there, staring at the spot where she'd been. Chapter 54 It was 2 a.m., and Roby had been asleep for exactly one hour, and then his eyes opened. He knew from long experience that it was useless to just lie there. He got up, padded into the living room of his home away from home, and went over to the window. D.C. was asleep now, at least the ordinary citizens of the city. However, there was a vast world here that never slept. They were highly trained, highly motivated people, who rose to the occasion during the nighttime to keep their fellow citizens safe from harm. Roby knew this, because he happened to be one of those folks. It was not always so. He'd grown into the job over the years, that did not mean he liked it. He put his eye to the telescope. The building across the street came into tight focus. He maneuvered the scope up to his floor. There were no lights on except for one. Annie Lambert was on the move. Roby watched as she walked from her bedroom to the kitchen. She was dressed in black tights and a football jersey that came down to her mid-thighs. A New England Patriots jersey, he noted. That would not be too popular in D.C., where the Redskins were the favorite NFL team. But she was from Connecticut, and the woman was in the privacy of her own home. Some privacy, he thought guiltily, but he continued to watch. She pulled out a book from a shelf against the wall, sat down and opened it. She read and spooned yogurt into her mouth. He was not the only one tonight with insomnia. 
He felt embarrassed to be watching her again. He told himself it was for professional reasons, but that wasn't true. He pulled out the business card she had given him. Before he could reconsider his decision, he called her cell phone. He watched through the telescope as she put the book down, reached over, and snagged her phone off a table. Hello? It's Will. He watched as she sat up straighter and put the spoon down. Hey, how are you doing? Can't sleep. Hope I didn't wake you. I wasn't asleep. I'm just sitting here eating yogurt. Fast metabolism? Cheeseburgers already worn off? Something like that. Roby paused and gazed at her through the scope. She was twisting one strand of hair with her finger. Her feet curled up under her. He felt his palms moisten and his throat get crusty. He felt like he was back in high school, about to talk with the girl he had a crush on. You know, there's a nice view from the top of our building. Ever been up there? I didn't think you could get up there. Isn't it locked or something? No problems with locks if you have a key. You have a key? Her voice was tinged with the girlish glee of having been told a cool secret. How about I meet you at the stairwell in ten minutes? Really? You're serious? I don't call people at 2 a.m. unless I'm serious. You're on. She clicked off and Roby watched in amusement as she leapt up and raced down the hall, presumably to change her clothes. Nine minutes later, he was standing at the entrance to the stairwell when she hurried up to him. She had changed into a knee-length skirt and blouse and sandals. She had brought a sweater, too, because it was a little chilly outside. Reporting for duty, sir. Let's do it. He led her up the stairs. When they came to the locked door to the roof, he pulled out his pick tools, and in a short time, the door swung open. That wasn't a key. She said, smiling in admiration at his skill. You just picked the lock. A pick is a key by another name. That's as close to poetic as I'll ever get. She followed him up a short flight of stairs and through another doorway. The rooftop was flat and coated with a sealed asphalt top coat. It radiated a slight warmth. Roby pulled out a bottle of wine from under his jacket. Hope you like red. I love red. Are we going to take turns chugging from the bottle? From his pocket, he produced two plastic wine glasses. He uncorked the bottle and poured out the wine. They stood at the edge of the roof and rested their arms and glasses on the chest-high wall of the building. It is a beautiful view. I guess I never thought about there being one from here. I just look out my window and see the building across the street. Roby felt a pang of guilt as he thought about his vantage point from that building into her apartment. Every place has a view. Some are just better than others. Hey, that was poetic, she said, nudging him with her elbow. The wind blew gently across them as they sipped their wine and talked. The conversation was innocuous, and yet helped to deliver a bit of a respite of peace to Roby. He had no time to be doing something like this, which was one reason why it was so important to do it. I've never done anything like this before. I've come up here before, but not with anyone else. I feel honored, then. She looked out once more at the surrounding area. It seems like this would be a good place to come and think. I can show you how to pick a lock, he said. She smiled. That might come in handy, actually. I'm always forgetting my keys. Another thirty minutes passed, and Roby said, Well, I guess we should call it a night. He looked at his watch. And you might as well shower and get ready for work. I guess you don't need much sleep. Look who's talking. He walked her back to her apartment. She turned and said, I really enjoyed this. So did I. I haven't met many people since I've been here. It'll happen. Just takes time. I meant that I'm really glad I met you. She kissed him on the lips, letting her fingers linger against his chest. Good night. After she went inside, Roby stood there. He wasn't sure what he was feeling. Well, maybe he only hadn't felt it in a really long time. Finally, he turned and walked off, more confused and unsure of himself than ever. 
Chapter 55 Ruby got back to the other building a few minutes later. Part of him wanted to look at Lambert through the telescope to see what her reaction had been to tonight, although her kiss probably told him all he needed to know. He imagined her showering and getting ready for work, but maybe she would think about him today, too, as she went about the important work of the country. And after that thought, Roby refocused on what lay ahead for him. It was time for him to go back to work, too. He checked on Julie and found her sound asleep. He showered, dressed, and left, setting the alarm. He drove through the empty streets. His wandering was not aimless. He had places to go, more things to think through. He passed an MPD cop car going the opposite way, its rack lights blasting blue streaks into the dark. Someone was in trouble. Or dead. Roby's first stop was Julie's home. He parked a block away and approached the house from the rear. A minute later, he was in the duplex. He navigated with the pen light through the dark interior. He knew what he wanted to look at. Two people being murdered here had set Julie's flight in motion. The bodies had been removed and the place sterilized. To what degree precisely was the reason Roby was here tonight? At some point, the Getty's disappearance would prompt calls to the police. They would come here and find the place empty. They would connect that Julie was, or at least had been, in foster care. They would try to find her. They would fail. They would assume that the Gettys had gone off together for some reason, perhaps to escape accumulated debt, or unpaid dealers who wanted payment for the drugs the Gettys were known to have used. The police would put some time in, but not a lot. Without any evidence of a violent end to the lives of the Gettys, the investigation would be put on the back burner. Big city police departments did not have the luxury of expending time and resources on cases like this one. Roby stooped and studied the mark on the wall. Blood to his eye. But the police might not even notice it. Even if they noticed it, they wouldn't test it. That meant paperwork, tech hours, and lab time. And for what? But that little smudge was telling Roby something. Blood spatter, he thought. They got all of it except this spot. This spot is not hidden. It's in plain view. They should have cleaned it off or painted over it, like they did on the other section. Roby straightened. That mark was a message. The Gettys were dead. He had never doubted that. But who was the message meant for? They knew that Julie was aware her parents were dead. She had seen it happen. Was it for one of the Gettys' friends? Who might want to talk to the police, but wouldn't, if they knew they'd been killed? That was a stretch, thought Roby. The friend might never see this mark or know what it was if they did spot it. But I would find it, he thought. I would know what it is. He searched the rest of the house, ending in Julie's bedroom. He shined his tiny light around. He saw a stuffed bear in a corner lying on its side. He picked it up, put it in the knapsack he'd brought with him. There was a photo of Julie and her parents next to her bed. He put that in the knapsack, too. He'd give them to Julie when he saw her again. His next stop was Rick Wynn's. Not his place of business where someone cut his tongue out and then stuck it down his throat. He was heading to Rick Wynn's house in Maryland. But he would not get there. At least not tonight. His phone buzzed. It was Blue Man. We found your handler. You can come and see what's left of him. Chapter 56 There was no stench. A burned body doesn't give off much odor. The flesh and bodily gases, the twin engines of forensic malodor, had been burned off. Charred remains carried a scent, but it was not a disagreeable one. Anyone walking into a fast-food burger place or the aftermath of an inferno had experienced it. Roby looked down at the mass of blackened bone and then stared two feet over at Blue Man. His white shirt was crisply starched, 
His tie point dropped right at six o'clock. He smelled of Keel's facial fuel. It was a little after five o'clock in the morning, and he looked ready to make a presentation to a Fortune 500 board. Blue Man was staring down at the black husk that used to be a man. A man who had ordered Roby to kill a woman and her child. Hard to feel sorry about it, I know, said Blue Man, seemingly reading Roby's thoughts. Sorry doesn't really enter the equation, does it? said Roby. What do we know? His name, position, and employment history. We do not know his recent whereabouts, why he was turned, or who killed him. They were standing in the middle of a park in Fairfax County, Virginia. To Roby's left was a Little League baseball diamond. To his right, tennis courts. I'm assuming he was toasted and left here recently, Roby said. Since no parents reported seeing this pile of detritus while attending their kid's baseball game last evening, I think we can assume that, replied Blue Man. How'd you find out? We received an anonymous phone call with explicit information. We're sure it's the guy? You can't get DNA off charred bone, can you? Blue Man indicated the left pinky of the body, or at least where the pinky had once been. They very helpfully covered that finger with fire-retardant material. We removed the finger and made the match off that. Both prints and DNA. It's him. Phone call, pink pinky. That was very helpful of them. I thought so. You said you don't know why he switched sides. We're checking all the obvious ones. Secret bank accounts, threats to family members, a change in political philosophy. Nothing definitive yet. The truth is, we may never know. They're taking care of loose ends, said Roby. You think this guy would have understood his chances of survival were basically zero? All traders should ultimately recognize that, and yet they do it anyway. Did you come up with any thoughts on Leo Broom? Not yet. Blue Man pointed to an SUV parked at the curb. I think it's time for that briefing. I don't have much to tell you. I'm awake, there's fresh coffee in there. Whatever you can tell me will be more than I know right now. As they walked to the vehicle, Roby said, You ever think about retiring or doing something else for a living? Every day. And yet you're still here. Blue Man opened the door of the SUV. I'm still here, and so are you. And so am I, thought Roby. Roby eased into the back seat. There was a space between him and Blue Man. He closed the door and pointed to two coffee cups in the holder between them. They're both black. I don't like to cut perfectly fine coffee with cream or sugar. Roby nodded. Same with me. Roby lifted the cup on his side and put it to his lips. Blue Man did the same with his. Blue Man said, Leo Broom? Roby could tell the man everything and probably should, but he had a natural disinclination to tell anyone everything. Actually, he had a natural disinclination to tell anyone anything. My handler is lying out there barbecued, began Roby. I wouldn't trust anyone either, replied Blue Man, again reading Roby's thoughts. I can't force you to tell me what you know. He let that statement sit there. What about heightened interrogation techniques? Don't believe in them. Is that the agency's official position now? It's my personal one. Roby mulled things over for a few seconds. Like I said, the girl was on the bus. Her name is Julie Getty. A guy on there tried to kill her. I took him out. We got off and the bus blew up. I lost my gun in the blast. We got away from the shooter in the alley and she's staying at my other place. Ties to Leo Broom? A friend of Julie's parents, Curtis and Sarah. I don't know why the guy on the bus killed them. Maybe they knew something and had to be silenced. We need to check out their backgrounds. Whoever killed them probably thought Julie knew the same thing her parents did. She gave me the names of friends of her parents. The brooms were on that list. I went to their apartment. They were gone. And the place had been scrubbed. So they're either on the run or dead, too, commented Blue Man. Looks to be. Broom was with the DOA. 
not exactly the epicenter of espionage. He was also in the military in Gulf One, replied Roby. That does open up some possibilities. Roby eased forward in the seat, making the leather squeak slightly. Outside, the investigation continued, as the techs tried to find any clue as to who had taken a human being and turned him into a kebab. Roby did not like their odds of success. Killers who guided you to the bodies didn't usually leave useful clues behind. He took another sip of the coffee, let it warm his throat, get it lubricated to talk some more. Roby did not normally like to talk, about anything. But tonight he would make an exception to that rule. He needed help. There's something else, said Roby. I thought there might be, answered Blue Man. I thought initially Julie was the target on the bus. Now I believe that I was. Why? Principally, it's a question of timing. The bomb had to be put on that bus hours before it left. Julie spontaneously decided to get on the bus after the bomb had already been placed. I had reserved a seat using an alias, an alias someone knew who shouldn't have known. They couldn't have known she would be on the bus, but they knew I would be, and that bomb had to be placed on the bus before I even got to the Wynn's apartment. But why kill you? What do you know that can hurt them? Roby shook his head. I can't figure that one out. At least not yet. Blue Man said, You should be dead, you know. You mean from the bomb blast? No, from the shooting at Donnelly's. I know. They let me live. So they wanted to kill you before, but now they want to let you live. Change in plan. Why? Do they need you for something? The way Blue Man said it made Roby look at him. You think I've been turned to? Blue Man stared over Roby's shoulder at where the forensic work lights were illuminating the remains of what had once been a man. Well, if you have been, you can certainly see there's no future in it. Chapter 57 Roby drove north into Prince George's County, Maryland. Prince George's was largely working and middle class, with cops, firefighters, and mid-level government types making their homes there. It was adjacent to its more affluent neighbor, Montgomery County, which had more than its share of lawyers, bankers, and CEOs who lived in massive houses on relatively small plots of land. Rick Wind lived on a narrow street in a neighborhood where people park their cars and trucks at the curb and fill their garages with things their small homes couldn't contain. There was a police presence here, though no crime scene tape was strung for the simple fact that no crime had been committed here. Blue Man had had his people call ahead, and the officer on duty let Roby pass by after he showed his cred pack. Since there might technically be usable evidence here, Roby put on latex gloves and shoe covers before entering the house. He passed through the front door and shut it behind him. He turned on the lights and gazed around. Wynn's pawn shop business had obviously not been doing that well. The furniture was old and shabby. The rug stained and worn down. The walls needed painting. The smells that hit Roby were all deep-fried foods. Wind hadn't been here in a while to cook anything so Roby assumed these aromas were buried deeply in the bones of the place, never to be eliminated until the house was knocked down. There was a shelf against one wall. On it were a few books, mostly military thrillers, and a number of framed photographs. Roby picked them up one by one and saw Rick and Jane Wind and the couple's two sons, only one of whom was now alive. The family looked happy in the pictures, and Roby let his thoughts wander for a moment and wondered what had caused the marriage to break down. He put down the last photo and kept moving. Affairs of the heart were beyond his expertise. He worked his way from the main floor to the top floor and found nothing. He searched the basement and again struck out, 
All he found was damp and mold and boxes filled with junk. He stepped outside and entered the single-car garage through the side door. He assumed the police had thoroughly searched inside here, as well as the house, but they might not have been looking for the right things. As if I know what I'm looking for, either, he thought. A half hour later, he sat down in a lawn chair in the middle of the garage and gazed around. Staring back at him was a push mower, cardboard boxes, power tools, a workbench, a weed whacker, lawn and plant food, some sports equipment, and a combat helmet that Wind had obviously kept from his time in the Army. Hanging from the helmet were Wind's dog tags. Roby rose and picked them up, read off the information. It was not very useful to him. He set the helmet back down. This had been a wasted trip, but at least he could check it off his list. He looked at his watch. It was after eight now. He called Vance. Got time for some coffee? Asked Roby. I'll buy. And what exactly do you want for that? How do you know I want anything? I finally figured you out. Nothing comes before the mission for you. Maybe she does have me figured out, he thought. He said, Okay, how about the medical examiner's report on Rick Wind? Why do you want that? It's a piece of the investigation. He heard her sigh. Where and when? He gave her this information, making the location close by for her and not too distant for him. Roby drove back south, crossing over the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, where he ran into rush hour traffic, but did a decent job threading his way through it. Vance was already there when he arrived at the cafe on King Street in Old Town Alexandria. He sat down and noted that she had ordered a coffee for him. I know how you like it, she said, spooning some sugar into her cup. From when you were at my place. Thanks. Do you have the report? She slid a file out of her bag and passed it to him. It was filled both with photos of Wynne's body from every angle and a detailed analysis of his physical condition and cause of death. Roby studied the pages while he drank his coffee. You look like you've been up all night. Not all night, just most of it. Don't you need to sleep? I get three solid hours a night, just like everybody else. She snorted and sipped her coffee. Find anything interesting? Wind wasn't in the greatest shape. Heart disease and a bad kidney. And reports said his liver and lungs were suspect, too. He fought in the Middle East. You know all the crap they used over there? It can do stuff to you. Can it? My older brother fought in the first Gulf War. He died at 46. His brain looked like Swiss cheese. Gulf War syndrome? Yep. Never got much traction in the news. Too many defense dollars stacked against it. Truth could never get out. I'm sorry about your brother. Roby put the file down. So you find anything useful? Interesting tattoo on his left forearm. He slid the photo of the arm out and showed it to her. I know, I wondered what that was. You don't have to wonder anymore. It's a Spartan warrior in a hoplite battle stance. What? Did you ever see the movie 300? No. It depicted a battle between the Greeks and the Persians. Persia had a far bigger army, but the Greeks used a bottleneck in the terrain to hold off the superior force. A way around this was provided to the Persians by a traitor. The Spartan king sent the vast part of the Greek army away while he stayed back with a small contingent of Spartans to take on the Persians. They were the 300 depicted in the movie. They used the hoplite battle formation. Close ranks, many rows deep, shields up, spears out. They were killed to a man, but it took the Persians a long time to do it. By then, the Greek army had escaped. Interesting history lesson. Makes sense for Wind to have a tattoo like that. He was in the infantry. You mind if I keep this file? Go ahead, I have copies. Anything else? Now really, no. Her phone buzzed. Vance. She listened, and Roby noted her eyes widened considerably. She clicked off and looked at him. I think we just got the break we needed. Really? Roby took a sip of coffee and looked casually at her. We just had someone come forward. 
an eyewitness to the bus blowing up. She apparently saw everything. That's great. Really great. Chapter 58 You want to follow me over? Vance asked, rising from the table in the cafe. Roby looked up at her. I've got a meeting at DCIS I have to get to. Where are you going to be questioning the woman? WFO? Yes. I can hook up with you there later. What's her name? What was she doing there? And why is she only coming forward now? Roby was thinking. Did the homeless woman, Diana Jordanson, get past Blue Man's guys and go to the FBI? If so, she might tell Vance about her meeting with me. Her name is Michelle Cohen. I don't have the other information yet, but I will soon enough. Give me a call when you're on your way. They parted company at the door. Roby hustled back to his car and drove off. He got on the phone to Blue Man and filled him in. The man's remarks were terse. I would stay away from this eyewitness if I were you. I think I had that one covered on my own. But find out what you can about her. Do you have Jordison? She's doing fine and eating quite well. She's cleaned up and has new clothes. Does our help include finding her suitable employment? Yes, it does. Preferably somewhere other than here. And make sure she gets a nice bump in salary over what she was making. Roby clicked off and sped up. Something had just occurred to him. He needed to talk to Julie, and he didn't want to do it over the phone. She was waiting for him when he opened the door. I'm not sure how much longer I can just sit in this place and do nothing, Will. He closed and locked the door behind him. He sat across from her. She wore jeans, a sweatshirt, lime green Converse tennis shoes, and an exasperated attitude. I'm juggling a lot of balls. I'm doing the best I can. I don't want to be one of the little balls you're juggling. I've got a question for you. Depending on how you answer might change the complexity of everything. What is it? Why the bus? More particularly, why that bus on that night? I don't understand. It's a simple question, Julie. There are lots of ways you could have gotten out of town. Why did you choose that way? If her answer was what he thought it would be, things are going to get more complicated than they already were. His head started to throb at that possibility. My mom sent me a note. How? You said you didn't have a cell phone. She sent the note to my school. She did that a lot. They put it in your mailbox, and they send an email to your advisor that a student has a note. I went to the office and got it. When did she send it? I guess the day I left the Dixons. It was hand-delivered. Did the office say your mom had delivered it? No, I just assumed. What did the note say? It said to come home that night, that my mom and dad were going to make some changes, get a fresh start. Sounds like they were moving. I wasn't sure about that, but I knew that could be a possibility. All I know is as soon as I got the note, I wanted to get out of the Dixon's house. I dropped off those photographs of them at the foster care agency that night. All I know is as soon as I got the note, I wanted to get out of the Dixon's house. I dropped off those photographs of them at the foster care agency that night. But what about the bus? That was in my note, too. Mom said if they weren't home when I got there, I was to go to the out-of-town bus station and take the 112 bus to New York City. They would meet me at the Port Authority bus terminal the next morning. They put cash in the envelope that came with the note. Did you recognize your mom's handwriting? It was typed. Did she often send you typed notes? Sometimes. She used the computer at the diner. They have a printer, too. Why not just come to the school and talk to you directly? She wasn't allowed to. I was in foster care. They wouldn't have let her in to see me. But she could drop off a note at the office. Roby sat back. She stared pointedly at him. You think my mom didn't write that note? I think the odds are very high she didn't. Why would someone else send me that information and the cash? Because they wanted you on that bus. And it was a pretty big coincidence that the moment you walk in the house, the guy comes in with your parents and starts shooting. And think about it, Julie. The man who killed your parents... Do you really think he would have let you get away? You mean it was all a setup, and he let me escape so I'd get on that bus? Yes. We wondered where your parents were from the time your mom got off work to when they showed up at their house. I think they were abducted 
and held until they saw you sneak in the house. But the bus was rigged to blow up. If they were going to kill me, why didn't he just do it at the house? I don't think that bomb was set on a motion timer to blow up. I think the plan was, if we got off the bus, they would detonate it remotely. If we didn't get off the bus, the bomb wouldn't have been triggered. We would have ended up in New York City. But that wouldn't have happened. Why? The man who killed your parents was instructed to get on that bus and kill you. He obviously didn't know about the bomb, or else he never would have gotten on. Loyalty is one thing. A death wish is something else. They were counting on the fact that I would have intervened when the guy made his move against you. Then the most likely result is, we both get off the bus. Roby thought, especially if they knew what I was running from. You say we, as though we were paired together. Roby said, I think that's exactly what happened. We were supposed to team up. But why? Wouldn't they want us dead? Apparently not. I could have gone to the police about my parents. And you're investigating the case. Why would they have wanted that? They might have correctly guessed you wouldn't have gone to the police. And maybe they want me to investigate. That makes no sense. If I'm right, it makes sense to someone. But wouldn't they be afraid my parents had told me something? If they killed those other people because of that, why not me? You already answered that question. You were in foster care, no access to your parents, no cell phone. When your mom told the guy you didn't know anything, I think they knew that was true. Roby unzipped his knapsack and pulled out her stuffed bear and the photo he'd taken from her home. He handed them across to her. Why did you go back there? She asked, looking down at the objects. To see if I missed anything. Did you? Yeah. They wanted me to spot the blood. They wanted me to know that your parents were dead. I could have told you that. That's not the point. They also want me to know I'm being played. What about that guy in the alley with the rifle? If they wanted us to get away, why send him after us? The bus had already blown up. At first, I thought it was a change of plan on their part. They didn't want me to live, but then they did. But now I think their plan all along was for me to walk away. But they knew I'd get suspicious if they made it look too easy. Easy? I have higher standards than most people, at least when it comes to survival. They had to send someone else after me. It was probably the shooter from the Wynn's apartment. But if they wanted you to live, and me too... That means they need us for some reason. That's exactly what I was thinking. But why? Nobody puts this much effort into something, kills that many people without a damn important reason. And we're caught right in the middle of it. No. We're caught right in the front of it. Chapter 59 Roby was on the move with Julie. He had her pack up most of her stuff in her knapsack without really giving any explanations. He glanced at her from time to time as he steered the Volvo through traffic. She caught him doing it more than once and said, Why do you keep staring at me? Why do I keep staring at her? wondered Roby. The answer was actually easy, if unwelcome. I have somebody other than myself I'm responsible for, and it's driving me nuts. His phone buzzed. It was Vance. Roby, you need to get down here, she said into the phone. What's up? The eyewitness, Michelle Cohen. She saw a man and a teenage girl get off the bus right before it blew up. She also said the man's gun flew away and landed under a car. That's the gun we found that ties into the wind killing. So there is a definite connection. I was right. Where was she while all this was going down? And why is she only coming forward now? She's married, and she was leaving a hotel in the area after spending some time with a man other than her husband. Okay. We're having one of our techs put together a digital image based on her description of the man and girl. It should be ready shortly. Did she see where they went? They were knocked out for a few seconds, but then they fled into an alley. And your witness just went home to her hubby? Cohen was scared, disoriented. When she got home and thought about it, she finally decided to come forward. What's the background on her? What does that matter? We have to verify that what she's saying is true. Why would she lie about something like this? 
I don't know, but people do lie all the time. Just get down here. I want you to hear her story, and you might have some questions for her I haven't thought of. I'll be there as soon as I can. Roby. He had already clicked off. He slid his phone back into his pocket. It buzzed again, but he ignored it. He knew it was Vance calling back, and his answer would be the same. Problems? Asked Julie. A few. Insurmountable? We'll see. Julie picked up the file folder that lay between them. What's this? Not something you want to look at. Why not? Is it classified? Not really, but it's an autopsy report on a guy. What guy? Roby glanced over at her. What's it to you? Is it connected to what happened to my parents? Doubtful. But you're not sure? I'm not sure of anything right now. She flipped it open and looked at the glossies. Gross. This is disgusting. What did you expect? The guy's dead. Julie's hands began to shake. Roby slowed. Don't get sick in the car. I'll pull over. It's not that, Will. What then? She held up a photo from the file. It was a full-on shot of Rick Wynn's right arm. Roby was about to explain about the tattoo, but Julie broke the silence first. It's a Spartan warrior in a hoplite battle stance. He looked at her in amazement. How'd you know that? Because my dad had a tattoo exactly like it. Chapter 60 Roby pulled the car to the curb, slipped the Volvo into park, and turned in his seat to stare at her. You're sure your dad had the same tattoo? She held the glossy up. Look at it, Will. How many tattoos like this do you think I've seen in my life? Roby took the photo from her and studied it. Okay, his name is Rick Wind. That ring any bells with you? No. You sure? Yeah, I am. Roby looked down at the photo again. He thought, what were the odds? Was your dad in the military? I don't think so. But you don't know for certain. He never talked about being in the military. He didn't have any medals or stuff like that around. But he has that tattoo. Did you ever ask him where he got it? Sure, it was really unusual. He said he was into ancient Greek history and mythology. That's where it came from. He explained to me what it was. When did your dad start using drugs? Julie shrugged. As long as I can remember. You're 14. How old was he? I saw his driver's license once. He was 45. So, 31 or so when you arrived on the scene. A lot of time before that, he could have been doing something else. How long were he and your mom married? I'm not sure. They never talked about it. They never celebrated anniversaries? No, just birthdays. In fact, just mine. But they were married. They had wedding bands they wore. They signed stuff, Mr. and Mrs. Other than that, I don't know. Never saw any wedding photos? Never talked to any of your other family members? No and no. They didn't have any family around, at least that they told me about. Both of them were from California, at least that's what they told me. When did they move to D.C.? Julie didn't answer. She gazed out the window. What's the matter? Your questions made me realize I knew shit about my parents. Lots of kids don't know much about their parents. Don't lie to try and make me feel better. I'm not. I didn't even know my parents. She looked over at him. So you were adopted? I didn't say that. But you said... So you don't know if your dad was in the military or not. I need to find out for certain. Why? If he was in the military and has the same tattoo as Rick Wind, it might be that they served together. Lots of grunts from the same unit did similar body art. If we can track that down, things might start making sense. Can you find out if my dad was in the military? Shouldn't be a problem. The Pentagon is great at keeping track of who served. Roby slid his phone out, hit a speed dial key, and was soon talking to Blue Man. He relayed his request and clicked off. We'll know soon enough, he told Julie. Why did you ask me when my dad started doing drugs? No reason. That's crap. 
You have a reason for everything you do. Okay. He might have started using drugs in the military. Why? Do all soldiers use drugs? Of course not, but some of them do. While they're in the military, and they keep it up after they leave. And if he served abroad, he might have had access to them more readily. So this is all about drugs? I didn't say that. You're not making much sense. Do you know how your parents met? At a party. In San Francisco. And no, I don't think it was a drug party. Roby put the car back in gear and continued driving. His phone buzzed again. He glanced at the screen. It was Vance. Julie saw it, too. Sounds like Super Agent Vance really wants you to go and see her. Well, Super Agent Vance will just have to wait, replied Roby. An eyewitness to the bus explosion? Roby shot her a questioning glance. Super Agent Vance has a loud voice. Pretty easy for me to overhear. Yeah, I got that. Did the eyewitness see us? Would seem so. I don't remember seeing anybody around that night. I didn't either. You think the person is lying? It's possible. But if the person sees you, big problem. That's right. How are you going to get around that? I'll get around it. Julie looked away from him and rested her chin on top of her knapsack. If my dad was in the military, why wouldn't he have talked about it? Lots of people don't talk about their military service. I bet heroes do. No. A pretty accurate rule of thumb is the people who did the most talk about it the least. The blowhards are the ones who did squat. You're not just saying that? I wouldn't lie to you about something like that. There would be no reason to. To make me feel better? Would it make you feel better if I lied to you? I guess not. He glanced over to see her staring at him. How's your calculus coming? I guess you're falling behind on your homework. I use the phone you gave me to go online and get my assignments. The teachers post them each day. I downloaded some files I needed and texted two of my teachers with some questions I had. And I emailed the school office and told them I have the flu, that I'll be out for a few days. But I'll email in my homework assignments and keep on top of things that way. You did all that online with a phone? Of course. No big deal. I have a laptop, but I don't have internet service on it. That costs money. In my school days, we still used erasers and hard-line phones. They drove in silence for a few more miles. If my dad was in the military, do you think he was maybe a hero or something? This time, Roby didn't look at her. He knew the answer she wanted by her wistful tone. Maybe he was. Chapter 61 Will, where are we going? Julie asked. They had driven across Memorial Bridge and were in northern Virginia. The day was crisp and clear. The sun drenched the area in a wash of intense light. Change of location for you. Why? Never a good idea to stay in one place too long. He peered in the rearview mirror, just as he had been doing every sixty seconds. There's no way anyone could have followed me, he thought. And if they have, it won't do them any good. He turned off after driving a few more miles and reached a gate. A man in uniform holding an MP5 on a leather strap strode toward the car. Behind him, Roby could make out another man, similarly armed, who was covering his partner. Roby rolled down his window and held out his cred pack. He told the guard, I'm on the list. The guard checked on this statement using his cell phone. While they waited, two other armed men came forward. One looked inside the car. Next, the trunk of the car was searched, and the underside examined. Julie's bag was looked through, and a machine that could detect pulses behind metal and leather gave the Volvo the once-over. It confirmed that only two beating hearts were in the car. The gate rose and Roby pulled forward, drove down a straightaway, and slipped into an empty parking spot. He unbuckled his seat belt, but Julie just sat there. Come on, he prompted. Where? What is this place? Safe for you. That's all you need to know. Is this like the CIA? Did you see a sign saying that it is? 
They wouldn't have a sign, would they? I mean, it's secret. If they didn't have a sign, how are the spies supposed to be able to find it? You're not funny. No, this is not the CIA. I wouldn't have brought you to Langley. In fact, I couldn't have brought you to Langley without getting into a lot of trouble. This place is a couple steps down, but it's secure. So you're just going to drop me here? Come on. We need to do this, Julie. She followed him across the parking lot, and they were buzzed through the glass doors of a two-story building. They were met in the lobby by an armed guard and led back to a long, narrow conference room. Julie sat while Roby paced. Are you nervous? He looked at her and finally realized that she was scared. And why wouldn't she be, he thought. This was a lot to deal with, precocious teenager or not. He sat down next to her. Not really. He looked around the room. It's just better for you to be here. So is this like prison? Nothing like it. You're not a prisoner. But we do need to keep you safe. You promise? I'm telling you the truth, Julie. Nothing more and nothing less. She unzipped her knapsack. Can I do some of my homework here? I've got some math problems to do. Yes, but just don't expect any help from me. I topped out at pre-cal. Five minutes later, the door opened and Blue Man entered. Ty nodded, slacks pressed, shirt starched, shoes polished. His features were impassive, but Roby could sense the irritation in the older man. He was carrying a manila file. He looked first at Julie and then at Roby. Is this a good idea? He asked Roby, indicating Julie with his free hand. A better idea than leaving her where she was. I told you it had not been compromised. I know what you told me. Blue Man sighed and sat down across from Julie, who stared at him with interest. Roby, sensing that some introduction was necessary, said, This is Julie Getty. Blue Man nodded. I deduced as much. What's your name? Blue Man ignored her question and turned to Roby. And what do you hope to accomplish by this? I hope to accomplish keeping her safe. I hope to accomplish getting to the truth. I hope to accomplish getting to them before they get to me. Paranoia setting in? Asked Blue Man. You're late by about ten years on that, replied Roby. Do you two work together? No said Roby. Sometimes, amended Blue Man. She looked around the room. Am I supposed to stay here somewhere? This isn't like a house or anything. Blue Man stared at Roby, who looked away. Blue Man turned to Julie. We can accommodate you here, comfortably. We have certain quarters for, um, guests. And Will's going to be here, too? I'll have to let him speak to that, said Blue Man. Roby ignored this and said, Anything on my queries? His gaze flitted to the file sitting in front of Blue Man. Quite a lot, actually. Do you want to hear it now? Roby glanced at Julie and then back at Blue Man with an inquiring look. Blue Man cleared his throat. I see no reason why she can't hear this. It's not classified. He opened the file. Miss Getty, your father, had a very distinguished military career in the Army. Julie sat up straighter. He did? Yes, a bronze star with valor, a purple heart, and several other impressive commendations. He was honorably discharged, leaving the service with the rank of sergeant. He never talked about it. Where did he serve that he got the bronze with the V device? asked Roby. Gulf One, answered Blue Man. Roby spoke up. Was his discharge based on anything other than him not re-upping? There were some medical issues. Like what? PTSD, replied Blue Man. That's post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, it is, said Blue Man. Anything else? asked Roby. Blue Man glanced down at the file. Some cognitive issues. My dad's brain was messed up? It was alleged that he had exposure to some materials that might have adversely affected him. Do you? said Roby. Do you? What's that? Blue Man and Roby exchanged a look. Julie saw this and hit the table with her fist. Look, 
You guys can't just keep speaking this code crap and expect me to just sit here and take it. Depleted uranium, said Roby. DU stands for depleted uranium. It's used in artillery shells and also on tank armor. Uranium. Isn't that bad for you? I mean, if you're exposed to it? There have never been any conclusive studies done that demonstrated the truth of that statement in a battlefield environment, Blue Man said matter-of-factly. Then where did my dad's cognitive issues come from? And why did they discharge him if there was no problem? I understand that he was a heavy drug user. Julie glared at Roby. Did you tell him that? Blue Man held up pages from the file. He didn't have to. I could read the arrest and conviction reports for myself. All small-time petty stuff, all quite stupid. Julie stood and said defiantly, You didn't know my dad, so you have no right to judge him. Blue Man glanced at Roby. She always this shy and unassuming? Roby didn't answer. And none of that happened while he was in the army. Or he wouldn't have left just for medical reasons. They would have kicked him out or arrested him. So why did they discharge him? As I said, cognitive issues. But not related to drugs. So it had to be something else. Countered Julie. And you read from the file. It said that he'd been exposed to this DU stuff, and it had adversely affected him. That's what you said. Those were his claims. They were never substantiated. But I do see your point. I guess the Army thought there might be some validity to his claims. Did they run any tests on him? asked Roby. To see what the cognitive issues stemmed from? No. They probably didn't want to prove that this DU crap messed with his mind, said Julie, glowering at Blue Man. He said, when you graduate from college, why don't you apply for a position in the intelligence field? From what I've seen, you might have what it takes to be a first-rate field agent. I think I'll pass on that. I'd prefer to use my life in a more positive way. Roby pulled out the glossy of Rick Wind showing the tattoo. This is from Rick Wind's autopsy. Julie confirmed that her dad had a tat just like this one. Blue Man looked at her. Did they know each other? I've never heard of Rick Wind, and I've certainly never seen him before. Roby said, can we find out if they ever served together? Blue Man rose, went to a phone on a credenza, and made a call, while Julie looked down at the tattoo, and Roby looked at her. You okay? he asked in a quiet voice. Should I be okay? Blue Man returned to them. We will have an answer shortly. Anything on this eyewitness? asked Roby. Michelle Cohen? Not yet. We're checking. She's definitely in FBI custody as we speak. If she can ID me and Julie? That would be slightly more than catastrophic, Blue Man said. Maybe she's lying. Maybe she is, agreed Roby. But if so, we need to find out her motivation. Blue Man said, How will you handle this with Vance? You can't keep ducking her. I'll figure something out. But right now Roby had no idea what. His phone buzzed. He looked at the screen. Super Agent Vance? Roby nodded. The text was clear. Come now, or I'll come and get you wherever the hell you are. He phoned her back. Look, I told you I was in a meeting. Cohen gave us enough to get a bolo on the two people from the bus. That's great. Might be a father and his daughter. Okay. You said the girl was a teenager. Right, light-skinned. The guy was much darker, according to Cohen. Come again? African-American, Ropey. Can you get your butt over here? I'm on my way. Chapter 62 Roby sat across from Michelle Cohen. She was in her late thirties, with soft, dark hair coiled around a long neck. She was petite, about five-two with a narrow build. She seemed nervous, and Roby would have been surprised if she weren't. Vance sat next to Roby in the small conference room at WFO. She was making some notes on her electronic tablet while Roby stared across at Cohen. She had told him her story in great detail, coming out of a nearby hotel seconds before the explosion occurred, seeing the man and young woman get off, 
being stunned and blown back against the wall when the bomb had detonated, running down an alley to her car, driving home to the suburbs where her cuckolded hubby was waiting for her and accepted her story of forgetting the time over dinner with a girlfriend. The hotel had confirmed that Cohen had come in at the time she said she had. A man was also with her. His story had checked out. He was unemployed and had been for a year. There was no reason why either he or Cohen would lie about this. And yet, of course, Roby knew they had lied. She had given detailed descriptions of two black people getting off that bus before it had exploded, and Roby knew that had never happened. But he couldn't tell Vance that without revealing his own secret. These people are playing me, and Cohen is part of it, he thought. They've got me screwed between two packs of Semtex, and I have no wiggle room. They're counting on that. They want to make me sweat, and they're doing a good job. He wondered if Cohen knew that he was the man who had gotten off the bus. Would she have been told that, or did she simply have her part to play? Roby wondered where they had found her. Maybe she was a former actress who needed some fast money, and that was her limited role in all this. Yet she knew she was lying to the cops, to the FBI. That would not be done lightly. She had to be very sure that the truth would not come out, and there had to be a very large incentive for her to do this. Well, if they want to play with me, he thought, then I'll smack some of it back at them and see how they like it. Have you ever cheated on your husband before, Ms. Cohen? he asked. The question got a stare from Vance, but he ignored it. Cohen pressed a tissue to her right eye and said, Twice before. I'm not proud of it, but I also can't change it. Have you told your husband the truth? This time Vance didn't simply stare. What does that have to do with anything, Roby? Again, he ignored her. Could you pick the guy and teen out of a lineup? I'm not sure. There was so much going on, and their backs were to me for some of the time. But you sure they were African-American? Even though it was dark, there was distance between you and them. And as you said, there was a lot of stuff going on. They were definitely black people. I'm not wrong about that. But initially, you didn't go to the police. You only did days later. I explained that to Agent Vance. I was worried about being exposed. You mean your affair being exposed? Yes. I love my husband. Right. And I'm sure you're very sorry for being an adulteress. But your hubby probably doesn't understand you. This comment drew another hard look from Vance. I'm not proud of what I did. But I did come forward. I'm trying to help your investigation. And it's much appreciated. Cut in Vance, with another incredulous glance at Roby. And despite my partner's comments, he appreciates it too. Will that be all? Can I go now? Asked Cohen. Yes, I can have one of my people show you out. Agent Roby and I have some things to discuss. As soon as Cohen had departed, Vance whirled around on Roby. What the hell was that about? I was questioning a witness. You mean you were interrogating her? Same thing in my book. And for the record, I think she's lying. What possible motivation would she have for lying? She came to us. We didn't even know she existed. If I knew that, the case would be solved. Why are you so sure she was lying? Roby thought back to the passengers on bus 112. There were a number of black men, and at least two black teenage girls. They had been on the bus when it blew up, but the bus had turned into an inferno with the full fuel tank. Everybody had been hurled from their seats, burned beyond recognition, many of them down to bone. It would be nearly impossible to match remains with a passenger list. There were at least six black men on the bus and three black teenage girls. The clerk in the depot that night remembers them. Cohen's story fits the facts. Doesn't matter. I still think she's lying. What, based on your gut? Based on something. Well, I have to conduct my investigation on evidence gathered. You've never gone with your instincts? He asked. Yes, but when cold, hard facts trump them, it's a different story. Roby rose. Where are you going? To find some cold, hard facts. 
Chapter 63 Roby knew a quick way out of the WFO and was in his car and waiting out front when Michelle Cohen pulled out of the parking garage and raced down the street in her BMW coupe. He slid into traffic behind her. She cleared three yellow lights and he narrowly avoided being trapped behind the last of them. Ten minutes later, they were heading up Connecticut Avenue toward Maryland. Roby was keeping his eye on the Beamer and thus failed to see the two police cars converging on his Volvo. The cops hit their rack lights, and the officer in the cruiser on Roby's left motioned him over. Roby watched the Beamer accelerate and pass through yet another yellow light. A few moments later, it was out of sight. Roby slowed his car and pulled to the curb. He wanted to jump out and start reaming the guys in blue, but he knew that might get him shot. He sat there fuming as four cops cautiously approached, two on each side. Let me see your hands, sir, called out one of them. Roby held his left hand out the window with his federal badge in it. He heard one of the cops mutter, shit. A second later, two cops appeared at his window. Roby said, I'm sure you guys have a terrific reason for pulling me over while I was tailing someone. The first cop pushed his hat back and stared down at Roby's cred pack. Got a call from dispatch that said a woman was being followed in her car by some guy. She was scared and requested we roll on it. She gave us your car description and plate number. Well, that's a good way for a perp to evade the police, said Roby. Just call in more cops. I'm sorry, sir, we didn't know. Can I go now? asked Roby. Is she really a suspect? We can help you run her down, offered the second cop. No, I'll catch up to her later. But in the future, don't be so quick to hit the panic button. Yes, sir. Roby eased the Volvo away from the curb and pulled back into traffic. In his rearview mirror, he watched the cops congregating around their cruisers, no doubt wondering if this screw-up was going to cost them career-wise. Roby had no interest in derailing them professionally. It had actually been a clever, if ballsy, move by Cohen. She could always claim she didn't know who was in the car, only that someone was following her. And she could tack on the completely true facts that she had just been to visit the FBI and was a valuable witness in a horrific crime and was understandably afraid for her safety. No. Roby would have to go after her another way. Fortunately, it would not be that difficult to track Cohen down. Her home address was in the file Vance had let him read. He crossed over into Maryland and worked his way through a number of surface roads until he reached the one he wanted. Michelle Cohen didn't live in a McMansion, but she did live in an upscale neighborhood. Yet according to Cohen, she was unemployed. Her most recent job had been with a financial planning firm that had gone belly up. Roby didn't know what her husband did. Vance had not mentioned it if she even knew. Cohen probably could use the money, thought Roby. But he wondered if they had some other dirt on the woman. Money alone, he thought, would not get an otherwise innocent person to go along with lying to the FBI in a possible terrorist case. Unless she isn't otherwise innocent. He wondered if Vance had run a criminal check on Cohen, or her husband, or her alleged boyfriend. Possibly not, since Vance clearly did not think she was lying. Like she had said, why would the woman have come forward? Roby could think of at least one reason. To screw with me, he thought. He pulled his car to the curb and phoned Blue Man. Anything on Michelle Cohen yet? No, but you'll be the first to know. I need everything you can find on her husband, too. Already doing it. So she lied to the FBI? Said it was two black people instead of you and Julie? Yes. Her motivation? Hopefully we can find it. Tricky move for the other side. They've exposed a pawn for us to exploit. I was thinking the same thing. That's why I'm nervous. Roby eyed the end of the street where Cohen's Beamer was parked in the driveway of a two-story stone and siding home. I'm going to check some things out. I'll call back in later. How's Julie? Safe and sound in doing her homework. The calculus problem she was working on looked far beyond my pay grade. That's why we're in the intelligence field, 
said Roby. We suck at math. He put his phone away and checked his watch. Cohen would know he had been following her, and would also know that he had her home address. His sitting out here would produce nothing useful. But he had a better idea anyway. He wasn't necessarily afraid of pawns, but nobody who knew what they were doing would leave one hanging out there without a good reason. And now, he thought, I need to find out what that reason is. Chapter 64 Michelle Cohen poured herself a cup of coffee and carried it into the family room where the TV was on. She was alone. She set her cup down, picked up the remote, and changed the channel. I preferred the other program, actually. She screamed. Roby sat down in the chair opposite her. Ah! What the hell are you doing in my house? How did you get in my house? You should lock your doors, even while you're home. I don't know who you think you are, but I'm calling the police. You were very rude to me today at the FBI, and I think you were following me earlier. I don't have to stand for this. It's harassment, plain and simple. She stopped talking when Roby held the item up. You know what this is, Michelle? She stared at the flat square box. Should I? I don't know. Should you? I'm not going to sit here and play stupid mind games with you. It's a DVD from a security camera. So? It was pointed right at the spot where the bus exploded. If that was the case, why didn't the police know about it? Because it was from a webcam a guy had set up in his apartment overlooking the street. I found it because I went door to door before the cops did. This guy had had some problems with burglars, wanted to catch them in the act. It was on a rotation program, clean sweep of the street, and it has a time and date stamp. Would you like me to tell you what it didn't see? She said nothing. It didn't see you, Michelle, or your boyfriend, at the spot you said you were. That's ridiculous. Why would we lie about something like that? And the motel clerk backed up our story. I'm not saying you weren't at the motel. I'm just saying you're lying about what you saw. In fact, you saw nothing. You're wrong. You said you saw the bus explode. I did. And you also said you saw the guy's gun fly off and land under a car. That's right. The bus explosion would have blown thousands of pieces of debris all over the air. It would have been a shitstorm of stuff. And you, all whacked out from seeing a bus explode and lots of people die, you saw one little gun fly through the air, and you were able to follow its path with all the other stuff going on until it landed under a car. He paused. That is total and complete bullshit. She jumped up and raced to the phone on the table next to the doorway into the kitchen. I want you out of here, now, or I will call the police and have you arrested. Roby held the DVD up higher. And we both know that you didn't see two black people get off that bus, Michelle. And the DVD will confirm that. So you lied to the FBI, that will get you at least five years in a federal prison on about three different felonies. No more working in the financial industry for you. And you'll be early 40s when you get out. And prison is not easy on the body or the psyche. You'll come out looking closer to 50, maybe 60 if they're rough on you in there. And it's not just the guys who have the bitches inside, Michelle. The ladies get lonely, too, in there. You'll be easy, fresh meat. You're small and soft. You won't stand a chance. You're just trying to scare me. No, I'm trying to enlighten you on just how serious your situation is. Roby set the DVD down on the coffee table. Two people did get off the bus, but they weren't black. How do you know that? Because I saw it on here, Michelle. Now why don't you sit down and we can talk about this, and maybe come up with a way out of it for you. Why would you do that? Because I'm a nice guy, that's why. I don't believe that for a second. Believe what you want to believe. If I believed for one second that you weren't just a patsy in this whole thing, I would have already arrested you. But if I can use you to get to the people I really want, then that's valuable. That's something you can negotiate with, Michelle. Don't walk away from this deal because you won't get another one. 
He inclined his head to the spot she had occupied on the sofa. Cohen sat, her gaze downcast. Drink your coffee. It'll help calm your nerves. She took a sip and set the cup back down, her hand shaking. Roby sat back, studied her. Who told you to lie? I can't talk to you about this. You'll either have to talk to me or the FBI. Which do you prefer? I can't talk to the FBI. Why? Because they'll kill him, that's why. Kill who? My husband. What's he got to do with this? Gambling debts. He's way over his head. But someone approached him and told us there was a way out. All debts forgiven if we did this. Lie to the FBI? Yes. Big risk. Prison over death? What does your husband do? He's a partner in a law firm. He's a good man, a pillar in the community. But he has a little problem with betting. And he used some client trust funds to make up a shortfall. He'll be ruined if it comes out. Who were the people who got you to do this? I never met them. My husband did. He said he was taken to a room, sat in the dark, and given an ultimatum. They told us everything we needed to do. Why were you chosen to do it instead of your husband? I guess I'm cooler under pressure than he is. We didn't think he would be able to lie to the FBI. Roby thought about this. Respectable couple, believable witness. No motivation to tell an untruth made sense. Who was the guy you were supposed to be having an affair with? They supplied him. We just sat in the motel bedroom staring at the floor. Then we left at the time we'd been given. I didn't actually see the bus explode. I was told to say it was a black man and black teenager who got off the bus. And then the rest that you heard today. Where is your husband now? Confirming that his gambling debts have been taken care of. You really think it will be that easy? What do you mean? You're a liability to these folks, Michelle. Do you think they were going to let you and your husband live? Her face flushed. But we don't know anything. What you just told me disproves that. You think they'll try to kill us? What time is your husband supposed to be back? She looked at her watch, and her face turned whiter. About twenty minutes ago. Call him. She grabbed the phone and punched in the number. She waited. The phone pressed to her ear. It went right to voicemail. Text him. She did. They waited for five minutes, and no text came back. Call him again. She tried twice more, with the same result. Where was he going to confirm that the debts were canceled? At a bar over in Bethesda. Roby thought quickly. Let's go. Where? To the bar in Bethesda. We might be in time to save his life. Chapter 65 On the way, Roby called Blue Man and requested backup. They would meet him at the bar. Roby gunned the Volvo and glanced over at Cohen. Her face was tear-streaked, and her breaths only came in short gasps that might have caused Roby to feel sorry for her under different circumstances. She glanced at him, her look of misery deepening. You think he's dead, don't you? I don't know, Michelle, but that's why we're here. To prevent it if we can. Uh, it seems so stupid now. Of course they wouldn't just let him walk away. But it was the only chance we had. We were desperate. Which made you the perfect people to approach. He made a left, a quick right, and pulled the car to the curb. That the place? He said, indicating a bar farther down the street with the sign Lucky's above it. She nodded. Yes, that's it. Well, he thought, I hope it's lucky for us. Roby looked around for his backup. He texted Blue Man. The reply came back almost immediately. Sixty seconds away. Cohen blurted, That's Mark's car over there. She pointed to a gray Lexus sedan parked a half block down. A few moments later, an SUV pulled up behind Roby. He signaled to the driver. The man signaled back. Roby got out and escorted Cohen to the SUV. There were three men inside. Cohen got in the back seat. Stay put, he told her. No matter what you see or hear, these men will take care of you, okay? Please bring my husband back to me. I'll do my best. 
Roby looked at the man in the passenger seat. You want to come with me? The man nodded, racked his pistol, and put it back in the holster. The pair moved down the street, their heads rotating side to side, looking for anything threatening. When they got to the bar, Roby saw that it was closed. He looked at his watch and eyed the other man. Late opening time for a bar. You're right about that. How do you want to do this? asked the other man. Give me two minutes to access the back. Then hit the front. We'll meet in the middle. The man nodded, and Roby skirted down an alley leading to the rear of this cluster of buildings. He quickly found the back entrance to the bar. He didn't know if the door was alarmed and didn't really care. If the cops came, so be it. They might have to come anyway, depending on what Roby found inside. He used his pick tools to beat the lock, pulled his gun, and slowly pushed the door open. It was nearly dusk outside, and totally dark inside. Roby wasn't going to risk a light. He was already a target enough without helping anybody to see his position better. He let his eyes adjust to the low level of light and moved forward. As he stepped, he listened. He checked his watch. His partner should be coming through the front door right about now. Roby passed through the kitchen and saw nothing except pots and pans, rows of clean glasses and mugs and a line of mops. The next room had to be the bar area. He would meet his guy there. Only his guy wasn't there. But someone else was and Roby's attention was immediately captured by the person. He ducked down behind the bar and took in the room grid by grid, noting all possible shooting points. He waited another 30 seconds and then came out from behind his cover. The room was empty, except for him and the other guy. Roby approached the man sitting in the booth to the left of the front door. He was leaning back against the leather seat. There was enough light coming in from the front windows for Roby to see what he needed to. He thumbed 911 on his phone and spoke briefly. He clicked off and eased over to the man. Single gunshot wound to the head. Roby touched his hand, cold. He'd been dead for a while. Roby grabbed a napkin off a table and covered his hand with it. He snaked his hand inside the man's jacket and pulled out his wallet flipped it open. The name on the license was Mark Cohen. The man's picture, minus the bloody wound to his head, stared back at Roby. He put the wallet back, looked at the front door. Shit. He raced to the door, unlocked it, and stepped outside. There were people walking up and down both sides of the street. Roby noted them, and then his gaze went across the street. His Volvo was there. The black SUV was not. He ran across the street and slid into his Volvo as he heard sirens coming. He got on the phone to Blue Man. Mark Cohen is dead, and your guys took off with Michelle Cohen. Want to explain that to me? Blue Man said, I don't understand. They were two of my best men, my most trusted people. They were supposed to follow your orders. Roby said, There were three guys in the SUV. I only sent two. Then one of them tagged along, and I guess now I know why. This is unprecedented, Ruby. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Go right now and check on Julie. Take a bunch of guys with you. They can't have bought off all of them. Ruby, are you saying, just do it? Chapter 66 when Roby raced into the secure building, the first person he saw was Blue Man. The second person he saw was Julie. Roby's gut unclenched, and he slowed his pace. Blue Man said tersely, Follow me, both of you. They walked quickly down a hall. Roby saw that Blue Man had a gun in a belt holster. Roby looked at Julie, striding next to him. Is something wrong, Will? What's going on? Just a precaution. Everything will be cool. You're lying to me, aren't you? Pretty much, yeah. Thanks for being honest about your dishonesty. Seems to be the best I can do these days. Blue Man closed and locked the door behind them. He motioned for Roby and Julie to sit. Roby gazed at the pistol. 
You don't usually carry a weapon. We don't usually have traitors in the ranks. Michelle Cohen? Roby asked. Dead, along with two of my men, the two I officially sent. Where and how? They just found the bodies in the SUV about ten blocks from the bar. Gunshot wounds, all of them. Who was the third guy? Malcolm Strait. Worked here for ten years. Impeccable record. Not anymore. Describe him to me. Blue Man did so. Roby said, He was the guy who was supposed to come through the front door of the bar. Any sign of him? Not so far. He no doubt had an escape plan in place. What are we talking about? Who are these people? Roby looked at Blue Man and said, I think she deserves to know. Go ahead, then. Roby took a few minutes to fill Julie in. She looked puzzled. Why would they get this lady to tell an obvious lie? They had to know you would track her down, find out the truth. They would have had to kill her and her husband anyway to shut them up. Roby said, You're right. What did they gain by having Michelle Cohen come forward with her story? Blue Man said, Exactly. What did they gain by it? Otherwise, it was a big risk for them. Michelle Cohen had no idea who had approached her husband, said Roby. She said he'd gone to the bar to confirm that his gambling debts had been paid off. Instead, he got a hole in the head. And so did his wife, added Blue Man. Who else did this Malcolm Strait work with here? Lots of people. You need to talk to all of them. At the very least, we need to learn if he left behind anybody. Agreed. So this guy might have somebody else here? Said Julie. She looked straight at Blue Man. Not so safe a place. Blue Man glanced at Roby and said, We will find that out as quickly as possible. This sort of breach is highly unusual he added, looking back at Julie. Well, for me, it's one out of one. Roby said, We can't stay here now. We have to move. Where? asked Blue Man. Roby rose. I'll be in touch. Let's go, Julie. Blue Man said, Where are you going? Some place safer than this, said Roby. Roby piloted the Volvo through the gate and turned left. This is the spot where we could pick up a tail, he told Julie. We're in a funnel here, only one way in or out, so keep your eyes peeled. Okay. Her gaze swiveled from side to side, and then she turned her head and checked the rear. As they pulled onto the main road and sped up, Julie said, I don't see any car lights. How about a satellite overhead? Can you see that? Are you kidding? They could be tailing us with a satellite? The fact is, I don't know. So what do we do? Hope for the best and prepare for something a lot less than that. Where are we going? The only place I've got left. The little house in the woods. Pretty isolated if someone wants to ambush us. And far easier to see someone coming at us. Trade-off. Weigh the pros and cons. I say the pros win in this case. What about satellites? They can't use a satellite to harm us. They have to have boots on the ground for that. They might send a lot of guys. They might. And then again, they might not send anybody. But why wouldn't they? Think about it, Julie. What's their endgame? This Malcolm Strait guy was inside that facility with you. He could have killed you there. And they could have popped me a couple of times already, but conveniently missed. So they want to keep us alive, like you said before, with the bus and everything. But we still don't know why. No, we don't. But we will. Chapter 67 Will, this isn't the way to your place, said Julie. Slight change in plan. Why? Getting a little needed help and making a big confession. Roby had made a decision, an unusual one for him. He had been a loner most of his life. He did not normally seek help from others, preferring to solve his own problems. Yet he had finally realized that he could not do this alone. He needed help. Sometimes asking for help showed strength, not weakness. Whether the decision would turn out to be the right one or a disaster, Roby couldn't know. Yet right now, it was his decision. 
He pulled into the condominium complex and got out of the Volvo. Julie trailed him inside the building. They rode the elevator up, got off, and walked down the hall. Roby knocked on the door of 701. He heard footsteps. They stopped. Roby sensed an eyeball looking at him through the peephole. The door opened. Vance wore black jogging shorts, a pale green Marine Corps T-shirt, and white ankle socks. She stared first at Roby, and then her gaze fell to Julie. Julie exclaimed, You're getting Super Agent Vance to cover your ass. Vance looked back at Roby. Super Agent Vance? What the hell is going on? Who's the kid? That's why I'm here, said Roby. Vance stepped back and let them pass through. She shut the door behind them. Roby said, Got any coffee? This might take a while. I just put some on. I like mine black, said Julie. Oh, really? said a bemused Vance. Michelle Cohen and her husband are dead, said Roby. What? exclaimed Vance. He sat on the sofa and motioned Julie to take a seat. Vance stood in front of him, hands on hips. Cohen is dead, how? She was lying, like I said. The truth caught up to her. Why would she lie? Her husband had gambling debts. This was a way out, or so they thought. How do you know they're dead? I saw him with a third eye at a bar in Bethesda. She died later, along with two federal officers. What in the hell is going on? What federal officers? Maybe that coffee first? I'll help you. He walked into the kitchen, and Vance was right on his butt. She gripped his shoulder. You better start talking and making sense, and you better do it now, Ropey. Okay. First, I don't technically work for DCIS. Big surprise. What else? This needs to be off the record. The hell it is. You want that cup of coffee now? What I want are some straight answers from you. Roby poured out two cups of coffee and handed one to her. He looked out the window at the lighted monuments in D.C. He pointed to them. What's it worth to you to keep that place safe? He said, turning to Vance. What's it worth? Hell, it's worth everything. Roby took a sip of his coffee. Now, what's it worth to keep that girl in there safe? You haven't told me who she is. Julie Getty. Okay, how does she figure into any of this? She was on the bus that night, but got off before it blew up. How the hell do you know that? Because I got off with her. That's why I knew Cohen was lying. As you can see, Julie and I aren't black. Roby took another sip of coffee and turned to look back at the monuments. Vance stood there rocking back and forth on her heels, obviously trying to process this stunning revelation. Finally, she stopped rocking. You were on that bus? Why? And why am I just finding out now? Julie said, Because it was a need to know and you didn't need to know, at least back then. They both turned to see Julie standing in the doorway. Vance looked from her to Roby. Need to know? So you're in intelligence? I swear to God, Roby, if this is some CIA bullshit that we've been running around in circles on, I will seriously consider shooting somebody, starting with you. There's something off with this whole case, Vance, and there has been from the start. Roby, you have a ton of explaining to do, starting now. What were you doing on that bus, and what happened there, and who blew it up? I don't know who blew it up, but it had to be done remotely, not a timer. Why? They didn't want to kill either of us, that's why. Again, why? Don't know. I just know that they want one or both of us alive for some reason. Vance turned to Julie. What were you doing on that bus? Can I have my coffee first? Jesus, here. Vance handed Julie her cup. Now, what were you doing on the bus? Some guy murdered my parents. My mom sent a note to me at school, or at least... I thought it was from my mom. The note told me to get on that bus and meet them in New York. When I did, the same guy who killed my parents got on and attacked me. Will helped stop him. We got off the bus, and that's when it blew up. Knocked us both off our feet. Vance snapped. It was your gun we found near the bus. You were in Jane Wynn's apartment. You were going to kill her. Just listen to him, Agent Vance. Pleaded Julie. Why should I? Because somebody killed my parents, 
and Will saved my life more than once, actually. He's a good guy. When Vance looked back, Roby was sipping his coffee, staring out the window, his back to her. Vance calmed and said, I think I'll take a cup of coffee, too. Julie poured one and handed it to her. Vance glanced at Roby. Is the rest of what you're going to tell me just as bad? Probably worse, he replied. You've put me in an awkward situation. I should report all of this. Agreed, you should. I did with my people, only to find out we had a traitor or two in the ranks. I wonder what the odds are of there being more. She hiked her eyebrows. You mean at the Bureau? You never had any bad apples? Not many. It only takes one. Noted Julie. It only takes one. Vance sighed and slumped against the counter. <sighs> what do you want me to do? Chapter 68 Roby turned the Volvo in at Dulles Airport and took the shuttle bus to the main terminal. He bought a ticket on a United Airlines flight, leaving for Chicago in about two hours, went through security, and hit the restroom along with a dozen other guys. He went into a stall with his duffel bag and came out later with a collapsible roller and wearing a warm-up suit, glasses, and a ball cap. He walked to an exit, rode the bus back to the car rental outlets, leased a new set of wheels using a credit card under an alias, an Audi this time, and sped west on the toll road. He peered in the rearview mirror. If anyone could keep up a tale after that, they deserved to win. An hour later, he pulled into his hideaway in the woods. He drove the car into the barn and closed the doors. Using a rake to shove straw out of the way on the floor of the barn, he revealed a metal hatch. He removed the hatch and hoisted himself down through the opening. He flicked a switch, and old fluorescent tube lighting blinked on. He skipped down the metal steps and put his feet down on a solid concrete floor. He had not built this place. The farmer who'd originally owned the property had grown up in the thirties. When the fifties had come along, he'd decided to build a bomb shelter under his barn, thinking that some wood, straw, and inches of concrete could protect him from any thermonuclear shenanigans the Soviet Union might decide to throw at America. Roby moved down a short hallway and stopped. In front of him was a wall of firepower that he had drawn on in the past to accomplish his work. It included pistols, rifles, shotguns, and even a surface-to-air missile launcher. It seemed James Bondish, but it was actually just the typical stock and trade for people in Roby's field. He took down what he thought he might need and stacked it against one wall. He opened a drawer of a workbench and pocketed a couple of electronic transmitters. He spent another ten minutes picking out various other items that might come in handy and packed everything up in a large duffel bag. He carried it up the steps, closed the hatch, spread the straw back over it, and put the duffel in the trunk of the Audi. Five minutes later, he was speeding back east. He checked in at an extended stay motel and unloaded his equipment. He changed clothes and called Julie. Roby had left her in the care of Vance in the FBI. Vance had only told her superiors that Julie was a possible witness and needed protection. Two agents from out of town had been called in to assist with the protection detail. Right now, Roby didn't really trust anyone in D.C. Julie sounded excited. I got an idea. I called the brooms on the phone you gave me, and I got a text back. They want to meet. You know, it's probably not the brooms, right? Said Roby in a calming tone. They could have had the brooms phone, and when they got your call, they just texted back to your number. If it were the brooms, they probably would have simply called. Do you always have to be a downer? Where and when? She told him. Can you come and pick me up? Julie, you're not going anywhere near that place. He could almost see her face falling across the digital ether. What? This is most likely a setup. You're not going. I'll handle it. But we're a team. You said so. I'm not putting you in any more danger than you already are. I'll handle it and then report back to you. That sucks. 
I'm sure from your point of view it does suck, but it's the smart thing to do. I can take care of myself, Will. Under most circumstances, I would agree with that. This is not one of those circumstances. Thanks for nothing. You're welcome. But she had already clicked off. Roby put the phone back into his pocket and mentally prepared for the upcoming meeting. At some point, whoever was behind this would no longer be interested in keeping him alive. He wondered if that time was about to come. He gunned up and slipped a few other items into his jacket pocket, then called Vance and filled her in. I'll come with you. Are you sure? Don't ask me again, Roby, because my answer might just change. Chapter 69 The Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial's official opening had been delayed because of a hurricane that had exhibited incredibly bad timing as it swept up the East Coast. But now the memorial was open. The centerpiece was the Stone of Hope, a thirty-foot-high statue of Dr. King, comprised of a hundred fifty-nine granite blocks fashioned to look like a single chunk of stone. Its official address was 1964 Independence Avenue, after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The memorial was roughly equidistant between the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials, and sited along the line of leadership between the other two memorials. It was adjacent to the FDR memorial, and was the only memorial on the National Mall dedicated to a person of color and a non-president. Roby knew all of this, and had even attended the opening ceremony for the memorial. But tonight, he was only interested in survival. Roby spoke quietly into his headset as he eyed the memorial. You in place? Vance's voice came into his ear. Roger that. See anyone? No. Roby kept moving and kept looking. He had on night vision goggles, but they couldn't see what wasn't there. Julie? The voice was to his left, near the memorial. It was a man. Roby tightened the grip on his pistol and spoke into his headset again. Did you hear that? Yes, but I don't have a visual on the source yet. A second later, Roby did. The man stepped clear of the memorial. In the wash of moonlight, and with the aid of his special goggles, Roby could see that it was indeed Leo Broom. He recognized him from a photo he had seen in the man's apartment. Vance's voice came into his ear. Is that Broom? Yes. Sit tight and cover my back. Roby moved forward until he was within ten feet of the other man. Mr. Broom? The man immediately ducked back behind the memorial. Mr. Broom? Roby said again. Where's Julie? Broom said. We didn't let her come called out Roby. We thought it might be an ambush. Well, that's exactly what I'm thinking, said Broom. Just so you know, I've got a gun, and I know how to aim and hit what I'm aiming at. Vance spoke up. Mr. Broom, I'm Special Agent Vance with the FBI. We just want to talk to you. You saying it doesn't mean you are with the FBI. Vance came out into the open and held her weapon up and her shield out. I am with the FBI, Mr. Broom. We just want to talk, to try and find out what's going on here. And the other guy, said Broom, what about him? Roby said, I know that Julie's parents are dead, Mr. Broom. I've been trying to help her find their killers. Curtis and Sarah are dead? So are Rick Wind and his ex-wife, both murdered. Broom appeared around the edge of the memorial. We've got to put a stop to all this. Couldn't agree with you more. And with your help, maybe we can. But first we need to get you to a safe location, and your wife, too. That won't be happening. Did they get to your wife? asked Roby. Yes, she's dead. Roby said quickly, Were you with her when it happened? Yes, I barely got out and... Roby was running full tilt toward Broom. Get down, now, down! But he knew he was already too late. He heard the crack of the shot. Broom whipped around and then fell where he had stood. He hit the dirt hard, 
twitched once as his heart gave a final pump, and then lay still. Roby reached him, ducked down, and surveyed the area. The shot had come from the left. He called this out to Vance, who was already on her phone. Roby realized this had been a setup from the start. He was never intended to get any information from Leo Broom. They were still just playing him, giving him a tantalizing piece of gold and then jerking it away when he got too close. Whomever he was confronting knew far more about everything than he did. They had assets on both sides, something he didn't. Vance knelt down next to Roby. Is he dead? Round blew right through his head. He won't be talking to anyone anymore. She let out a long breath and stared down at the dead man. They are always one step ahead, it seems. It seems, said Roby. You were telling him to get down before the shot. How did you know? They killed his wife, but he got away? I don't think so. Same thing happened with Julie. They don't let people just get away. But what purpose did it serve letting Leo Broom live? He could have told us something. They weren't going to give him the chance, Vance. So why let him come here at all? If they were following him, they could have killed him at any point. This seems to be a game to them. A game? People are dying here, Roby. Some game. Some game. Chapter 70 Roby sat in his apartment in the dark. Vance and a quartet of FBI agents were keeping watch over Julie. He had told the teenager about the broom's murders. She had taken it stoically, hadn't cried, but apparently just accepted it as a fact of life. Maybe that was worse, thought Roby. It didn't seem right that a 14-year-old should have her emotions so hardened that violent death didn't shock anymore. He had come back here because he needed somewhere to go that didn't involve other people being around. And though he had a room at the extended stay residence, he had come back here instead. He wasn't concerned about killers coming for him. At least not yet. They want me alive for something, he thought. And then they'll want me dead. He had strained his mind going back over missions he'd performed in the recent past. It would seem that in his line of work there would be many people who would want revenge against him, too many to plausibly investigate. But he had never failed on a task, and that meant his target always had died. And he had exited successfully each time, which meant that his identity should have remained a secret. But his handler had been turned, which meant that Roby had been exposed to anyone with the ability to pay. He rose and looked out the window. It was 2 a.m. There were few cars moving down the street, no people. But then he caught sight of someone, and he moved closer to the window for a better look. Annie Lambert brought her bike to a stop outside the apartment building, got off, and rolled it into the lobby. When she got off on her floor, Roby was waiting for her. She looked surprised to see him but then apparently noted the pain in his features. You okay? Had better days. Long one for you, obviously. She smiled and struggled with her bag. Roby took it from her, slung it over his shoulder. Thanks. I messed up today. Had to work overtime to repair things. What happened? Blue official protocols. I bypassed my direct supervisor to get a question answered, because my direct supervisor wasn't around, got called on the carpet for it. That doesn't seem right. In fact, it seems fairly petty. Well, when you don't get paid much to handle important issues, folks stand more firmly on titles and lines of authority than maybe they should. I think you're being overly generous. Maybe I'm just tired. Here, I'll help you to your door and you can get some sleep. As they walked down the hall, she said, you don't seem too good either. Like you, a long day. Petty rules, too? A little different. Life can suck sometimes. Yes, it can. They reached her door. She turned to him. When I said I was tired, I didn't mean I needed to go to sleep. Would you like to come in for a drink? You sure you're up for it? We both look like we could use one. Nothing fancy like your wine. I can only afford beer. Okay. 
They went inside. She put her bike away and pointed Roby to the kitchen, where we got out two beers and came back into the living room. He felt guilty that he knew the layout of her apartment from looking at it through the telescope. It fit the image of a young government worker whose salary was in no way commensurate with her brains or ability. Everything was on the cheap, but Roby noted one oil painting of a harbor scene and a couple pieces of good quality furniture that had probably come from Lambert's parents. When she came back out of her bedroom, she wore loose-fitting jeans and a long-sleeved T-shirt, and her hair was pulled back in a ponytail. Her feet were bare. He handed her a beer, and she plopped down in a chair and curled her feet up under her. Roby sat opposite, on a small faux leather love seat. Nice to get out of the professional armor. Until tomorrow morning, which is almost here. I actually have the day off tomorrow. Or today, as you pointed out. She took a sip of beer. Roby did the same. Why is that? The president is out of town with most of his personal staff. When he gets back, there's a big White House dinner. I have to work the event. So I'm going to enjoy my day off. I would, too. She smiled resignedly. Especially since I've been working weekends for the past month, and staff morale is a little low. Why's that? The president isn't doing very well in the polls. The economy is awful. The next election is not shaping up to be easy or pleasant. Country split right down the middle. No election is easy anymore. True. I could never be a politician. It just hurts too much, you know? Every second of every day, someone is judging you. And not just for your positions on issues, but for how you talk, look, walk. It's ridiculous. So have you given any more thought to what life will look like for you after the White House? I'm in a phase of life right now where I just take each day as it comes. Not a bad thing, actually. Some would call it lazy. Who cares what some think? Exactly. Great minds think alike, in fact. She reached over and clinked his beer with hers. To great minds. To great minds, he agreed with a grin. So, is this officially our first date? Technically, I wouldn't think so, replied Roby. It was more spontaneous. But we can make it anything we want. It's a free country. I really enjoy drinks at the W. First time I've done something like that in a while. Me too. At your age, you should be out a lot. Maybe I'm older than I look. She teased. I doubt that. I like you, Will. I like you a lot. You don't really know me yet. I'm a good and quick judge of people. Always have been. She paused, took a swig of beer. You make me feel, I don't know, good about myself. You have a lot of reasons independent of me to feel good about yourself, Annie. She set her beer down. Sometimes I get depressed. Hell, we all do. She rose and sat down next to him. She touched Roby's hand with hers. I've had a couple of bad experiences with guys. I promise you won't have one with me. Roby had no way to guarantee this, but as he said it, he believed it to be the truth. At the same moment, they each leaned toward the other. Their lips touched gently. Then they drew apart. When Lampert opened her eyes, he was looking at her. Did you not like that? No, I liked it a lot, actually. They kissed again. I'm a lot older than you, he said, as they pulled apart once more. You don't seem a lot older. Maybe we shouldn't do this. Maybe we should do exactly what we both obviously want to do. She murmured in his ear. They kissed once more, not gently this time, but hungrily, both breathing hard. Roby's hand slipped to her thigh and he caressed it. She edged her arms around his back and squeezed. Her mouth touched his ear. The bedroom might be more comfortable. He rose, lifting her into the air as he did, and carried her to the bedroom door. She hit the door lever with her foot and pushed it open. Roby kicked the door shut behind them. They took their time, disrobing each other. She looked at his tats and scars and the wound on his arm. She lightly touched it. Does it hurt? Not anymore. How did you do it? It was just something stupid. He pulled her to him. 
A minute later, they slid between the sheets, their clothes in a commingled pile on the floor. Chapter 71 It was six in the morning, and Roby was on the move again. His rental glided down the dark street. As soon as he left Annie Lambert still lying in her bed, he had regretted sleeping with her. The sex was wonderful. It had left him shaky and warm and completely out of sorts. It had been a liberating feeling. And yet, it still had been a mistake. He had essentially left a man dead on the National Mall to go and screw a White House staffer. He hadn't been thinking about the case while in bed with her. Well, that would change right now. He called Vance. Despite the early hours, she picked up on the second ring. I'm in the office. Actually, I never left the office. Where are you? Driving. Driving where? Not sure. What happened to you last night? You just sort of disappeared after we got Julie squared away. He didn't answer. Roby? I just had to step back for a bit, get my head straight. Is it straight now? Because we have a case to work. Yeah. I didn't have dinner, and I haven't had breakfast. There's a 24-hour place around the corner from WFO. You know it? I'll meet you there in ten minutes, said Roby. He beat her there and had already ordered them both mugs of coffee when she walked in. I thought you said you hadn't been home. You're wearing fresh clothes, he said. I keep a set at the office, she replied as she sat down and picked up her coffee and took a sip. You don't look good. Should I look good? He wondered for a moment if she could tell he had been with another woman. They sat in awkward silence drinking their coffees until Roby said, How's Julie? Fidgety, depressed. I think she believes you've abandoned her. How did you explain things to your boss about all this? I skirted the line, told him some things, didn't tell him others. The waitress came over and they ordered. After she had refilled their coffee, she left. Roby studied Vance. I'm not looking to derail your career over this, Vance. You know, you can call me Nikki, if you want. This offer seemed to deepen Roby's guilt. Okay, Nikki. At the end of the day, you need to be able to walk away from this with everything in your life intact. I don't think that's possible, Roby. My point is you don't have to cover for me. It was unfair to ask it of you. And my point is if I don't cover for you, the FBI will come down like a ton of bricks. Too many questions, not enough answers. I've got some professional cover. Not enough. And quite frankly, I'm not just doing it for you. If everything does come out, my butt is probably off this investigation, and it'll get so muddled, we'll probably never figure it out. And I obviously have a real problem with that happening. Just so we understand each other, said Roby. I'm not sure I completely get you, but that's neither here nor there. I'm not your shrink. I'm just working with you to see if we can put away some killers. Leo Broom. Anything found on him that would help? He said they had gotten to his wife. He had nothing on him, but trying to trace where he came from. There was no car parked nearby that was unaccounted for. That late at night, we could rule out the metro, probably. We're checking with cabbies to see if we can determine where he was picked up. Or else he could have walked, pointed out Roby. But there was no hotel room key card? Nothing else to show where he was staying? Nothing like that. But we did find one thing. What was that? A hoplite tattoo on his forearm, identical to the one on Rick Wynn's arm. And it has to match the one Julie said her dad had on his arm. So they must have known each other in the army then. What if this isn't connected to you after all? They were in the army together, maybe had some secret. Now it's come back to haunt them. Still doesn't explain me and Julie walking off that bus, or them missing you and me in front of Donnelly's. No, I guess it doesn't. You said they let him escape after they killed his wife, part of the game, you said. They might be screwing with you, but there has to be some purpose to it all. I'm sure there's an excellent purpose. I just don't know what it is. If this is a contest of sorts between you and them, there must be something in your past to account for it. Given that any thought? Some, but I have to give it a lot more. What line of work were you in, Roby? DCIS isn't your real home. 
but somewhere else in the federal government obviously is. He drank his coffee, said nothing, because there was nothing he could say. I'm not read in. Is that why your lips aren't moving? I don't make the rules. Sometimes the rules suck, like now. But they're still the rules. I'm sorry, Nikki. Okay. You don't have to answer, but hear me out, okay? Roby nodded. I think you were at Jane Wynne's apartment to kill her as some sort of sanctioned hit. Only you didn't pull the trigger for some reason. But someone else did, from long range. You took her youngest child to safety and then got out of there. Then you got roped into investigating a crime you were present at under the cover of a DCIS badge. She paused, studied him. How am I doing? You're an FBI agent. I would have expected no less. Tell me about the hit on wind. It wasn't really sanctioned. I never should have been dialed up, but I was. Person who did it is now a burnt pile of bone. Cleaning up loose ends? How I see it, yeah. So someone is playing with you. Digging you in deep. Seems like the start of it was your going after Jane Wind. Her hubby was already dead. So she dies. The winds are out of the way. Point one. Roby finished his coffee and sat up. Looked more attentive. Keep going. Point two. Julie's parents are killed. We know they were friends with the brooms. And Rick Wind and Curtis Getty had the same tattoo on their arms. It must be from them serving together in the military. Have your people connected them up yet? Still working on it. Point three. So Getty, Broom, and Wind, including their spouses, or in Wind's case, ex-wife, are all dead. Roby nodded and took up the thread. I try and make my escape on that bus. They knew that I would. Julie gets routed to the same bus by a message supposedly from her mother. We get off. The bus blows up. The attack outside of Donnelly's where you and I should have been killed? More window dressing, more playing with my mind. Some playing? A lot of innocent people were killed, Roby. Whoever's behind this could care less about collateral damage. They're chest pieces to them, nothing more. Well, I'd love to slap a pair of cuffs on people who think like that. But what's the end game? Why do all of this? She took another sip of coffee. So where'd you spend last night? The image of a naked Annie Lambert sitting astride him flashed into Roby's mind before Vance had even finished her question. I didn't sleep much, he admitted truthfully. Their plates of food came, and they spent some time digging their way through eggs, bacon, toast, and hash browns. When they were through, Vance pushed her plate away and said, How do you want to attack this? Priority one is keeping Julie safe. We obviously had a mole in our operation, and I have to count on the Bureau. We will do all we can to make sure no harm comes to her, Roby. What's the second priority? I have to find out who in my past wants me this bad. You have lots of possibilities. Too many. But I have to narrow it down, and I have to do it fast. You think this thing is on a timer? Actually, I think the timer is just about up. So what are you going to do? Take a trip far away from here. Vance looked astonished. You're leaving? No, I'm not. Chapter 72 Ruby sat in the small room that he had used as an office for the last five years. No chubby middle-aged man in a rumpled suit came to bring him yet another flash drive. He was not here for another mission. He was here to see what had come before. The trip he had referred to with Vance had been one taken in his mind. He stared at the computer screen in front of him, staring back at him with the reports on his last five missions that had carried him back a full year in time. He had eliminated, at least for now, three of them. The last two had captured his attention for a couple of reasons. They were the most recent ones, and they involved targets with long arms and many friends. He clicked a few computer keys and an image of the deceased Carlos Rivera appeared on the screen. The last time Roby had seen the Latino, he had been screaming obscenities at Roby in underground Edinburgh. Roby had killed Rivera and the man's bodyguards and made what he thought had been an undetected escape. Rivera had a younger brother, Donato 
who had taken over much of his brother's cartel operations. The book on Donato was that he was every bit as ruthless as his late brother, but with far less ambition. He was content to run his drug empire without inserting himself into the political situation in Mexico. Perhaps this was also due to what had happened to his big brother. Still, he might want to avenge Carlos's death. And if he had found out Roby's identity through Roby's handler, he might have the necessary information to do so. In his mind's eye, Roby went through the events leading up to the killing of Carlos and company. After completing this process, he thought, Do I fly to Mexico and attempt to kill Donato? Something deep in his gut told Roby that the man's relations could care less who had gunned Rivera down. Little brother was alive and doing very well without big brother around. So Roby moved on to the next target of interest. Khalid bin Talal, one of the Saudi princes, a fixture on the Forbes 400 list, richer even than Rivera. Once more, Roby closed his eyes, and this time transported himself back to the Costa del Sol. On the third night, the target had walked right into his crosshairs along with the Palestinian and the Russian, geopolitically an odd couple. Talal had exited his motorcade, walked up the steps to the hulking plane. Roby had lost visual on him for a few seconds, but then Talal had sat down across from his fellow conspirators. Roby's shot had hit the man dead center in the head. No possibility of survival. Roby had gunned down two bodyguards, disabled the plane, executed his escape, and been on the slow ferry to Barcelona within the hour. Clean kill clean exit. And the truth was, Bin Talal was not popular in the Muslim world. His ideas were too radical for the moderates. The ruling family was well aware that he desired to overthrow it, and it was largely at the family's behest that Roby had been sent out on this mission. And even the Islamic fundamentalists tended to give Talal a wide berth because they did not trust his close business ties to Western capitalists. He sat back in his chair and rubbed his temples. If he still smoked, he would have lit up right now. He needed something to take his mind off a deep sense of failure. Something was staring him in the face. Perhaps it was the truth, the answer he needed. But it wouldn't come. He went back through the three missions previous to Rivera and Bin Talal every step, like he had with the Latino and the Muslim. Clean executions, clean exits, all of them. And yet, if not one of them, who? He took out his pistol and laid it on the desk in front of him, the muzzle facing away from him. He stared down at the Glock, a fine weapon. It almost always performed flawlessly. This was not a mass-produced piece. This was customized to fit his hand, his grip, and his way of shooting. Every piece was meticulously crafted to make success a foregone conclusion. But it wasn't just about aiming straight. There were a million parts to every mission, and if any one of them failed, so did the mission. For Roby, the easiest part was the actual killing. He was good at it, and had some semblance of control over events. The other parts of the puzzles often came down to others doing their job, totally outside of his control. He had not always killed on behalf of the U.S. government. He had worked for others, all allies of the Americans. That's what had gotten their attention. The pay was better on this side of the Atlantic. But if it had solely been about money, Roby would have moved into another line of work a long time ago. There was a reason he kept taking these assignments, kept pulling the trigger on one monster after another. He had never talked to anyone about it and doubted he ever would. It wasn't that the memories were too painful. It was that he had frozen that part of his mind. He was incapable of articulating a single sentence about it. That was the way he wanted it. Anything less would not allow him to function. He rose from behind the desk the sense of failure now profound. His phone was buzzing as he reached the door of his car. It was Blue Man. 
They had tracked down the military ties among Curtis Getty, Rick Wind, and Leo Broom. They had all served together. I'm on my way, said Roby. Chapter 73 Same squad, said Blue Man. He and Roby were sitting in Blue Man's office. They fought together for the entire campaign, along with other assignments post-Gulf One. It was no wonder Julie didn't know about it, remarked Roby. She wasn't even born yet. And her father was tight-lipped about his service, said Blue Man. Maybe he didn't even tell his wife. I know some soldiers don't talk about their time on the battlefield, but they don't usually keep the fact that they actually served secret. Anything in his records to warrant such secrecy? Maybe. Blue Man pulled out another manila envelope from a stack he had on his desk. As you know, during Gulf One, Allied forces never actually went into Baghdad. The mission was to drive Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, and that mission was accomplished. Hundred days, said Roby. I remember. Right. Now, the Iraqis had reportedly looted much of Kuwait, which is one of the richest Gulf states. Cash, gold, precious jewels, that sort of thing. Is this going where I think it is? Nothing could be proven, but Getty, Wind, and Broom might have had sticky fingers when they were in Kuwait. They were each given general discharges under honorable conditions. You told Julie that her dad got an honorable discharge based on medical reasons. That's right, I did. If they were involved in the thefts, do you think they were able to get their loot back to the States? None of the three showed any signs of wealth pointed out Roby. The Gettys worked at crap jobs and lived in a crappy duplex. The winds weren't wealthy, and I saw the brooms apartment, nothing special. Curtis Getty probably put most of it up his nose. Rick Wynn's finances showed that he never earned much money, but he owned a home, and he had the pawnbroker's business. Again, we could find no record of how he was able to buy the business. But he stayed in for the full ride. How would that be possible if he was believed to be a thief? Believed to be is the operative phrase. Lack of evidence, I suppose. But the general discharge he did receive speaks volumes, because there was nothing else in his service record that would have warranted anything other than an honorable discharge. So they got him in the end. And he apparently didn't contest it. Again, speaks volumes. If he did steal the stuff and still got his full ride and pension and no jail time and the fruits of his larceny, Wynn probably thought he got a great deal. And if he was rich from the thefts, why stay in? We don't know how much they might have gotten away with. Maybe he saw it as his nest egg and decided to keep drawing his government check. And Leo Broom? Hit the jackpot there. His apartment in D.C. wasn't much to look at but they had an oceanfront home in Boca Raton, and we tracked down an investment portfolio he'd hidden under another name. Had about four million in it. Okay. At least it seems he stole from the Kuwaitis. So you think someone's coming for them after all this time? And why stick me in the middle of it? You're the worrisome piece, Roby. The three ex-soldiers maybe fit a pattern. You don't. Blue Man closed the file and looked across the desk at him. You went back over your recent missions? Five of them. They're cookie cutters. No clear reason why someone would want to come after me. And no clear reason why they wouldn't. So I wasn't able to narrow down the possible suspects. He brooded for a few moments. Julie said her mother told her killer that Julie didn't know anything. What of it? Didn't know what? About her dad's military service? I can tell you right now that that guy on the bus going after Julie was not Middle Eastern. Means nothing. You're not Middle Eastern either. And yet you've worked on their behalf before. They could have hired local talent to do the job. Makes it easier than trying to slip one of their own into the country, especially these days. Roby glanced up at him. So why didn't you tell Julie about these allegations of theft? I decided to focus on the medals, and nothing was ever proven against Curtis Getty. He might be innocent. But still, what would have been the point? Why? Roby asked again. I have granddaughters. 
Okay, said Roby. I can understand that. But we don't seem to be any closer to the right answers, said Blue Man. No, maybe we are. How so? Roby stood. They want me involved in this somehow, whatever it is. Granted, but how does that help us? I need to make them try a little harder to engage my attention. What do you mean? I'm going to make them push harder. When people push harder, they make mistakes. Well, make certain you don't push them so hard that you end up dead. No, I want them to focus on me. There's been way too much collateral damage on this already. Roby turned and walked out of the room. He was going to see Julie. He had nothing really to tell her, and like Blue Man had said, no good could come from informing her of things her father might have done in the past. Roby was convinced that whatever the three soldiers had done more than twenty years ago was irrelevant to the present situation. They were just convenient pieces on the chessboard. This is about me, thought Roby. It started with me, and it has to somehow end with me. Chapter 74 So Mr. Broom and Rick Wind served with my dad in the Army? said Julie. Roby was sitting with her in the FBI safe house. How safe it was, Roby wasn't sure, but he had few options left. The FBI agents guarding Julie looked professional and alert, and yet he kept his hand near his Glock and was prepared to gun them all down if they made a move to harm the girl. They fought in Gulf One. They left the Army at separate times after that. Apparently a number of soldiers in their squad got that tattoo on their arm. I still can't believe my dad was like a hero. Believe it, Julie, he was. She fingered the zipper on her jacket. Did you find out anything else? Not really. My dad must have been young when he left the military. I wonder why he didn't stay in. No way to tell. Some guys do their stint and go on to other things. Maybe if he'd stayed in, he might have, you know. Well, he might not have met your mother either, if he'd stayed in. That's true. She eyed Roby closely. Why do I think you're not telling me everything? There was something in her look that Roby recognized. It was the same look he gave people who were simply telling him things he knew he wanted to hear. Because you're naturally suspicious, just like me. Are you holding something back from me? I hold lots of things back from lots of people, but always for a good reason, Julie. That's not really an answer. He locked his gaze on hers, figuring that not to look at her now would be simply an exclamation point on his underlying deceit. It's the only one I have to give. I'm sorry. So you haven't figured out what's going on then, have you? Not really. Do you need my help? And don't say you have to keep me safe. There's no such place. Not even here with super-duper FBI guys all over the place. Roby was about to turn her off or down using this very safety issue, but stopped. Something had just occurred to him. Your mother said that you didn't know anything, right? When she was talking to the guy in your house? That's what she said. So that implies that your parents did know something. That your mother, in fact, probably knew why the guy was there. Why he wanted to kill them. I guess that's right. But we've already covered this ground, Will. And Leo Broom, right before he died, implied that he knew something, too. Julie wicked a tear from her right eye. I didn't know him all that well. But he seemed like a nice guy. And I really liked Ida. She was always nice to me. I know. It's a tragedy all around. Now Cheryl Cosman said that the day before your parents were killed, they had dinner with the brooms at the diner. She said they looked like they had seen a ghost. That's right. When was the last time you talked to your parents before you went back to your house that night? Just before I was put back in foster care. I never got a chance to sneak over and see my mom at the diner. And how did your mom seem when you did see her last? Fine, normal. We just talked about stuff. And then later a guy is at their home looking to kill them, and your mother is not surprised by it? Julie blinked. You mean something had to happen after I last saw her and before the guy showed up at our house? No. 
It had to be between you seeing her last and your parents having dinner with the brooms, where they all looked like they had seen a ghost, according to Cheryl. But we don't know what that something is. But narrowing it down to a specific time period helps. The way I see it, either something happened with your parents, they found out something and told the brooms, or the brooms found out something and told your parents. What about the winds? That's sort of the wild card. They weren't at the dinner, but they must be involved somehow, too. Otherwise, why would they have ended up dead? Do you think it has something to do with their time in the military? My gut tells me that it should. But all the facts don't point to that, namely my involvement in all this. If I'm right, and I'm the reason why this whole thing has been orchestrated, why involve your parents, the brooms, and the winds? I didn't know any of them. So you really think all of this is tied to you somehow? Roby could sense the question left unspoken. Was I the reason her parents were killed? Yes, I think it does. Too many coincidences otherwise. Julie pondered this. So either the winds, my parents, or the brooms found something out. Because they were in the military together, the guys might have told each other about it. The bad guys found out, and they had to kill them. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess it does. Julie said, looking away from Roby. He let a few tense moments pass by before he spoke. Julie, I don't know what's going on. If this is really all about me, and your parents and the others were caught up in it, I'm sorry. I'm not blaming you for what happened to my parents, Will. She said, though her voice held no conviction. Roby stood and paced. Well, maybe you should he said over his shoulder. Blaming you isn't going to bring them back, and what I want hasn't changed. I want to get whoever did this. All of them. Roby sat back down and looked at her. I think there was no more than a 24-hour window when whatever got your parents killed was communicated among Wind, Broom, and your dad. If we can trace a call or a movement or any type of communication among that group, we might be able to get a better handle on all this. Can you do that? We can at least give it a hell of a shot. The problem is, so far nothing in their background suggests they were involved in anything that could have been the catalyst for all this. Well, they weren't the only ones in the squad, right? A squad consists of nine or ten soldiers with a staff sergeant in command. How do you know that? American history class. We're studying World War II. So, my dad, Wind, and Broom are three guys. That means you have six or seven more to track down. Roby shook his head, wondering how he'd missed something that obvious. Then he looked down at Julie's chest. The laser dot was centered right over her heart. Chapter 75 Roby made no visible reaction to the laser dot. He knew it was from a sniper rifle. He didn't look to the window, where he knew the blinds must be partially open. The rifle and the shooter were out there somewhere, probably within a thousand yards of a house that had just become as unsafe as it was possible to be. He inwardly chastised himself for not earlier noting the open blinds. He put his hands under the table, separating him and her. He smiled. What's so funny? You ever play a game called Whack-A-Mole? Uh, are you feeling okay, Will? He felt along the underside of the table. Solid wood, not cheap composite. That was good. About an inch thick. That might be good enough. It would have to be good enough. He would have to perform two movements, one with each hand. He drew a breath and his smile deepened. Because if Julie made any sudden movements, it would be over. I was just thinking about something that happened to me a long time ago. Hup! He flipped up the table with one hand so it was shielding Julie from the sniper, and drew his Glock with the other hand. Julie screamed as Roby fired, killing the overhead light. The rifle shot shattered the window and drove into the wood and passed through it, but the barrier had served to throw off the line of fire. It struck the wall to the left of Julie. Get down, snapped Roby. Julie immediately went to her belly. Roby heard footsteps rushing down the hall. Roby moved behind the table. He turned to Julie, 
who lay flat on the floor with her hands over her head. Are you okay? Yes. Did you open the window blinds? She peered up at him. No, they were like that when I got here. The door started to open. A voice called out, Roby, you okay? Roby recognized the voice as belonging to one of the agents guarding them. Roby called out, Put your gun down on the floor and slide it in the room with your foot. One of the men yelled, What the hell is going on, Roby? Just what I was about to ask you. Who opened the blinds in this room? The blinds? Yeah, the blinds. Because a sniper just took a shot right through that opening. So unless you have an answer, I'll shoot the first person that comes through the door. I don't care if it's you or anybody else. Roby, we're the FBI. Yeah, and I'm one seriously pissed off guy with a Glock. Where does that get us? There's a sniper outside? That's what I said. Didn't you hear the shot? Hang tight. He heard the feet running away again. Roby looked down at Julie and back over at the window. He wasn't hanging tight. He pulled out his phone, thumbed Vance's number. She answered. He said, Sniper at the safe house, mole somewhere. Need backup now. He clicked off, took Julie's hand. Keep low, he warned her. Are we going to die? Just keep down and follow me. He led her out of the room, cleared the hall, and they ran, not to the front or back doors, but to the opposite side of the house from where the shot had come. They crouched down in the room while Roby did a turkey peek out the window. There was no way he could do a clean sweep of the area with his naked eye. But he didn't see a scope reflection. Although the high-end equipment they had out there now wouldn't necessarily have such a signature wink of light. He had no idea if the guy who had told him to hang tight was an ally or foe. And Roby didn't think it was a good idea to wait and find out for certain. They would be expecting them to go out either the back door or the window on the side opposite from the sniper fire. So Roby planned to go out the front door. But first they had to get there. They moved back into the hall, and with Roby leading, they made their way slowly toward the front of the house. The house was in a neighborhood with one road in or out. There were no houses close by. You had to really want to get to the place. Someone evidently had and he had done so with help from the inside. When Roby looked around the corner into the front room, he saw the body of one of the agents lying there, feet closest to the front door, blood around his neck. Not a bullet wound. Roby would have heard the shot, and only a shotgun would have made a gash that big. Had to have been a knife. Hand over the mouth, knife slashed to the neck, not much sound. Death would come fast hand over the mouth. Killer would have had to get real close for that. Another traitor in the ranks. Oh my god. He looked back at Julie. She had just seen the body. Look away. He thumbed his phone keypad again. Vance picked it up. Roby could hear the sound of her engine. She must have had it revved to over a hundred. Got one dead agent. Don't know where the others are. Dead guy has up close wound. Whoever nailed him, he thought was a friend. Shit! exclaimed Vance. How far away are you? Three minutes. He put away the phone and turned to Julie. We're going to go out that front door, but we need to draw attention somewhere else. Okay. She said, her gaze darting between Roby and the dead man. How? Roby cleared the chamber on his pistol, popped the mag, pulled out the two top rounds inserted the two rounds he'd taken from his jacket pocket and smacked the clip back into place. He racked the slide, which pushed one of the new rounds into the chamber. He edged to the door and used his foot to move it open. What are you going to do? Shoot your way out of here? Cover your ears. What? Cover your ears and look away from the door. Roby waited while she did so. Then he aimed and fired. The first round hit the gas tank on the Buick car parked in the driveway. The incendiary round ignited the gasoline vapor and the explosion lifted the sedan right off the asphalt. His second shot was aimed at the second Buick car, parked next to the first. A second later, it joined the fireball of the first. Roby grabbed Julie's hand 
and they sprinted through the doorway, keeping the wall of flames and smoke between them and, hopefully, whoever had just tried to kill Julie. They turned away from the house and ran down the street. Roby had debated trying to reach his car, but decided that that would be akin to painting a target on their heads. A car turned onto the street and accelerated. Roby saw the blue drill lights. He flagged Vance down. She hit the brakes and the Beamer skidded to a stop. Roby threw open the door, pushed Julie into the back, and jumped into the front passenger seat. Go, now, he told Vance. She put the car in reverse and smoked her tire tread backing down the street. She hit a J-turn, and as soon as the hood of her car was pointing in the other direction, she gunned it. She reached the end of the street and turned left. She looked at Roby, and then glanced at Julie huddled in the back. You both okay? Nobody hurt? We're okay. So tell me what the hell happened. Just keep driving. Chapter 76 Roby rode shotgun, and he kept rotating his gaze to look behind and then over at Vance. His gaze was suspicious, and his hand gripped the butt of his Glock. That had been unbelievably close. If he hadn't looked down and seen the dot, Julie would have joined her parents among the dead. It was apparent to Roby that the other side no longer required either or both of them to continue living. He settled back in his seat but his posture was rigid, coiled. He did not think the danger was over just yet. Vance kept her gaze on the road, mostly. Every once in a while, she would glance at Roby's gun, and then her gaze would travel to his face. When their eyes occasionally met, she would quickly look away. They had traveled about two miles when she finally spoke. You have a particular reason keeping your gun out with the muzzle pointed in my direction? I have about a dozen reasons for it but you've probably thought of them all. I didn't rat you out, Roby. I'm not the one behind all this. Good to know. I'll take that into consideration. I can understand why you don't feel you can trust anyone, including the FBI. Again, good to know. His voice was flat, dead. Roby didn't even recognize it as his. Where do you want to go? He looked at her, his expression inscrutable. Why don't you pick a place? We'll see how it goes. Is this a test? Why shouldn't it be? Will you guys stop? This is not helping. They both glanced in the rearview mirror to see Julie staring at them. Someone just set us up while in FBI custody, said Roby, his voice calm and even. He said again, so pick a place, Agent Vance. Take us there, and we'll see what happens. How about WFO? How about it? Roby, I'm on your side. He glanced out the window. The guys you called in from out of town? I didn't call them in. They were called in by others at the Bureau. What others? I don't know specifically. I put in a request for agents from out of town. She gave him a hard stare. At your insistence, they were the ones who were sent. One was killed. I doubt he came down here to die. So we can rule him out. But someone left the blinds open in the room where Julie was placed. He looked at her. Which agent sent you back there? Julie said, The one who came to the door after the shot was fired. I recognized his voice. The one who never came back. The one who killed his partner. The one who told us to hang tight. He glanced at Vance. Just like you told me to. Hang tight. Vance slammed the beamer to a stop in the middle of the road. She turned and faced him. Okay, shoot me then. If you don't trust me, I'm no use to you anyway. So put the gun against my head and pull the damn trigger. Histrionics really won't get you anywhere on this. So what exactly do you want me to do? I already told you. For now, just drive. Where? Pick a direction and stick to it. Shit. She put the car in gear and sped off. I heard explosions before I turned onto the street. You're doing? I blew up two bureau cars. Be sure to bill me for that. You blew them up? We needed a diversion, chimed in Julie. It was the only way we got out of the house alive. Ruby sat back in his seat. So I've got traitors in my own organization. Traitors in the FBI. A puzzle I'm not close to solving, and time is running out. So what are you going to do? Vance asked nervously. 
Regroup and rethink. The three of us are going to stick together. But we need new transportation. What's wrong with my car? Principally that people know it's your car. Are you going to steal another car, Will? Asked Julie. Another? Asked Vance in a raised voice. He's really good at it. Makes it look easy. And I hope you're just as good at driving. Why? He had his gun up, and he hit the button to bring his window down. Because we have an SUV on R6, and it's coming fast. Chapter 77 Vance looked in the rearview mirror. An SUV, black, big, and gaining on them way too fast. It looked like a bulky jet barreling down the runway just prior to liftoff. She punched the gas, and the beamer leapt forward. Wait a minute. Do you think they're cops or feds? The shot shattered the beamer's rear glass. Julie shrieked and ducked down as the bullet passed between Vance and Roby and cracked the windshield. No, I don't think they're cops or feds. Vance cut the wheel to the left and screeched the beamer into a 90-degree turn, racing down a side street. Well, then do something. He turned, looked at Julie, who was hunkered down in the seat. Undo your seat belt and get on the floorboard. What if the car wrecks and I don't have a belt on? I think that'll be the least of your worries. Julie undid her belt and dropped into the space between the front and rear seats. Roby took aim with his Glock and fired once through the shattered back window. His shot hit the front of the SUV. Roby had aimed to take out the radiator. His shot had hit dead center. He could hear the round ping off. Armored, he said to Vance. He fired next into the left front tire. The rubber should have shredded. It didn't. Run flat tires. Cute, really cute. If they're armored, we should be able to outrun them. Depends on what kind of horsepower they've got. He fired again at the windshield. It cracked part of the glass, but the SUV did not slow down. Well, at least they're not perfect. He saw the gun appear from the passenger side window. Roby observed instantly that it wasn't just any gun. If it hit them, it would be over. He grabbed the wheel from Vance and slammed the car into a hard right turn that took it off the road, over the curb, and into someone's front yard. A split second later, the gun pointing from the SUV roared a dozen automatic times. The rounds missed the Beamer, but behind them, the car that was parked nearest the intersection exploded. The SUV couldn't make the turn and continued to speed down the road. Then came the screech of brakes and gears reversing. Roby worked the wheel and the Beamer jumped the curb and landed back on the road. He took his hands off the steering wheel and looked back. What the hell was that? It's called a sledgehammer. Assault combat shotgun. I recognized it from the big ammo drum. It must have ignited the fuel tank on that car back there. He pointed up ahead. Take the next left, and then a right, and then hit the gas hard. By the time they get back on our tail, we'll be gone. Vance did as he instructed, and they were soon alone on a road leading west, away from all the shooting. They could hear sirens seemingly coming from all directions. Julie sat up and buckled her seat belt after wiping shards of automobile glass off the seat and out of her hair. Roby glanced at her. You okay? She nodded but didn't say anything. He looked around. You left your backpack at the safe house? She nodded again. Vance said, What changed, Roby? He looked at her after easing his gun back into its holster. Come again? They didn't want to kill us before. Just scare the shit out of us, or intimidate us, or who the hell knows what. But now it seems pretty clear they want us gone. So what changed? Could be lots of things. Without knowing the end game, it's hard to know what makes these folks tick. Or what part any of us play in all of it. So we need to figure out the end game. Easier said than done, replied Julie. What changed? This time the query came from Roby. Vance and Julie looked at him. That's what I just said, replied Vance. He didn't answer. He just stared straight ahead. He would have smiled, only he didn't, because it might lead to nothing. But finally, finally, Roby might have something. 
Chapter 78 Roby directed Vance to his hideaway farmhouse. At his demand, she had turned off the GPS chip in her phone. Vance had called into her supervisor on the drive over and reported what had happened. One FBI agent was dead on the scene, the man Roby and Julie had seen. The other agent was nowhere to be found. In fact, the Bureau could not confirm that he was, in fact, the agent that had been sent to Virginia to protect Julie. Vance dropped the phone into her lap with a grimace of disgust. Damn it. Get the little shit right and the big shit doesn't happen. You have to go off grid. You okay with that? Does that mean you actually trust me? They were willing to kill you back there, too. I have no problem going off grid so long as there's a plan. It's evolving, but I need some information. What kind? He looked at Julie, who sat in the back seat staring at him. What changed was Julie came up with the right answer. What answer? Julie asked. It was a timing issue, really. As soon as you said it, the red dot appeared on your chest. That's when we both might have become expendable. Vance looked at Julie. What did you say? She said, That my dad and Mr. Broom and Rick Wind were part of a squad, and a squad has nine or ten soldiers in it, so maybe they talked to someone else in the squad. And that's where all this started. I mean, if the three of them kept in touch, maybe some others did too. Roby nodded and looked at Vance. So the safe house wasn't just unsafe, it was also bugged. They could hear everything we were saying. And the second Julie said that, the dot appeared. Vance said, You really think that might be it? The other members of the squad? I think we need to find out whether it is or isn't. And we need to do it fast. You can get that info pretty quickly from DCIS. I could. But since DCIS has been infiltrated, I don't want to tip my hand. Vance slumped back as she drove and thought about this. And the Bureau might have been infiltrated, too. Might have been? exclaimed Julie. What part of tonight did you miss, Super Agent Vance? Vance grimaced. Okay, was infiltrated. She looked at Roby. So what do we do? I know someone who might be able to help, he said. An old friend. You're sure you can trust this person? He's earned that trust. Okay. But I have to leave you to go see him. Do you think it's a good idea to split up? No, but it's the only way this will work. How long will you be gone? Asked Julie anxiously. Only as long as I have to. Roby got them settled in the house, showed Vance where things were, set the alarm and perimeter security, and then strode out to the barn. He climbed on his motorcycle, slipped on his helmet, and started the bike. The powerful pulses of the engine soothed him, gave him something else to focus on besides what he had to do later. He rode his bike east and then north. He reached the beltway and followed that long curve north. He raced over the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, the winking lights of D.C. to his left, the green sweep of Virginia running to Mount Vernon to his right. The building he arrived at nearly thirty minutes later was brick, small, and had a high fence running around it. There was a guard in uniform posted out front. Roby had called ahead. He was on the list. He had his proper creds. The guard let him pass through after doing a thorough search. A few minutes later, he was walking down the only hall the building had. Doors on the left and right led off from this main artery. They were all closed. The hour was late. There wouldn't be many people here. But there was at least one. The one he wanted. The man who had held Roby's position before Roby had. He stopped at one door, knocked. Footsteps came his way. The door swung open. A man in his mid-fifties with white close-cropped hair stood before him. He and Roby were about the same height. The man was trim, his shoulders broad, he seemed to have retained much of the strength of his youth. When he shook Roby's hand, that strength was clearly evident. He ushered him in and closed the door, but not without first taking a look down the hall, ostensibly for any threats. Even here, Roby would have done the same thing. It was just a part of you at this level. The room was small, efficiently laid out. 
No personal mementos were evident. The man sat behind his desk, on which was a small laptop. Roby sat across from him, settled his hands over his flat stomach. It's been a while, Will, said the man. I've been kind of busy, Shane. Shane Connor said, I know you have. Good work. Maybe, maybe not. Connors cocked his head to the left. Explain that. Roby took ten minutes to walk him through the recent developments. When he was done, the other man leaned back in his chair, his gaze solidly on Roby. I can get the squad makeup right now. But once you get that, what are your plans? To follow it up, there is a maximum of seven of them left. Local ones will be the focus, of course. I can see that. Connors leaned toward his laptop, hit some keys, and then sat back. Give it ten minutes. He continued to look at Roby. It's been twelve years for you. I know. I've been counting, too. As though on cue, Roby could hear the tick of a clock coming from somewhere in the office. Connor said, Look down the road? I've been looking down the road since the first day. And? And there are certain possibilities, but nothing more than that. Connors looked disappointed by this, but he said nothing. His gaze went to the laptop. For the next eight minutes, both men stared at it. When the email fell into the electronic mailbox, Connors hit a few keys, and a printer resting on the edge of the desk whooshed. Some papers slid out. He picked them up, but did not glance at the pages before passing them to Roby. I need a fresh car. Untraceable, said Roby. I can leave my bike as collateral. Connors nodded. It'll take two minutes. Thanks. He made a call. Two minutes passed. The computer dinged. The man nodded. Done. They rose. Roby said, I appreciate this, Shane. I know. Roby shook his hand. As he turned to leave, Connor said, Will. Roby turned back. Yeah? When you look down the road next time, look farther than a place like this. Roby glanced around the office, settled his gaze back on the man, and gave a slight nod. Then he was walking down the hall, the papers clutched in his hand. Chapter 79 Before starting up the car, a trim, tan Chevy, Roby looked at the pieces of paper. There were only three names on them. Because of the seven squad members other than Wind, Getty, and Broom, four had died, all of them years ago. That made Roby's job a little easier, at least potentially. There was something else that made it easier still. All lived locally, also included with their current addresses and a brief military history of each. The military kept impeccable records. He slipped the papers into his pocket, started up the car, and raced past the guard on his way out of the small government complex. As he retraced his route back to Virginia, he thought about Connors and his little cage back there. Connors had taught Roby pretty much everything he knew. The man was a legend in the field of sanctioned assassinations. When he'd officially retired, and Roby had gone full throttle, operating all over the world, he and Connors had lost contact. Yet Roby could still vividly remember the first mission the two had performed together. After the kill was done, Connors had kissed the barrel of his rifle. When Roby asked him why he had done that, Connors had replied simply, Because it's the only thing standing between me being here and me not being here. There were a few men who could not be bought under any circumstances. Shane Connors was one of them. Roby made sure he wasn't followed, and zigzagged the last ten miles of his trip just to be certain. He got back to the farmhouse early in the morning. Vance was awake with gun in hand and a serious expression on her face. Julie was asleep on a couch in the back room of the first floor. Vance had seen the car pull up. Where'd you get it? She asked when he came into the house. He held up the pieces of paper. Same place I got these. As they stood in the doorway, gazing at the sleeping Julie curled up like a cat on the couch, Vance said, 
She didn't want to go upstairs. I don't think she wanted to be that far away from me. He walked into the kitchen. Vance followed. They sat, looked over the names and current addresses. Three individuals, two guys, and one woman. How do you want to do this? Split up again? Don't think so. They've been warned by Julie's comments. They probably know what we're going to do. So they'll anticipate we'll go after these folks and they'll be waiting? Maybe something a little more efficient. Like what? Like maybe they'll make all three disappear. You mean kill them? If they kill two, then they've done our work for us. They left the one who really matters. If they make all three go away, we're in the same boat as before. Vance set her gun on the table and rubbed her eyes. You need to get some sleep. Look who's talking. I'll take the first watch. You can catch a few hours. It'll be 8 a.m. You won't go to sleep then. I actually feel pretty rested. She squeezed his arm. What was that for? Just checking to see if you're actually human, despite your ability to bleed. So we go after these people one by one, knowing that they'll be waiting. So they really have the upper hand. Like you said, they could just make them disappear. They could, except for one thing. What's that? If they need one of them for some reason to do something. Like what? If I knew that, I wouldn't be sitting here trying to figure it out. What do we do with Julie? We can't leave her here. And it would be really stupid to take her on something like this. It might be stupid, but I'm going anyway. They glanced over to see Julie standing in the doorway, looking at them with sleepy eyes that still managed, at their edges, to look angry and even betrayed. Boy, you're really good at eavesdropping. Julie retorted. It's the only way I find out anything with you two. It's dangerous. What else is new? Julie replied in an even tone. She sat at the table. I've been shot at, nearly blown up, seen my parents killed, chased on foot, chased by car. So really, your dangerous argument falls pretty flat. Vance glanced at Ruby and a smile tugged at her lips. At certain levels, her logic is awfully compelling. So the logic is, since you've nearly been killed a few times, the smart thing is to put you in another situation where you probably get killed? Don't feel you're responsible for me, Will, because you're not. She tucked her hair behind her ears and glared at him. Vance's smile faded. Okay, you two. The last thing we need is to turn on each other. I am responsible for you. I've been responsible for you ever since we walked off that bus. Your choice, not mine. I'm a victim of circumstance. But you'd still be a victim. I want to find out why my parents were murdered, that's all. Anything more than that, I don't care. She looked at Vance and then at Roby. So don't feel you have to care about what happens to me, because you don't. We're just trying to help you, Julie. I'm not your little do-gooder project, okay? Foster kid off the street you want to make all well and good? Forget it. That's not what this is about. You're stuck with us, Julie, whether you want to be or not. And if it weren't for us, you'd be dead. I feel like I'm already dead. I can understand that. But feeling dead and actually being dead are two totally different things. Why should I trust anybody? I think we've earned your trust. Well, think again. She stood and left the room. Roby said to Vance, Can you believe that crap? Vance stared across the table at him. She's just a kid, Roby. She's lost her parents, and she's scared. Roby immediately calmed and looked guilty. I know. We have to stick together to get through this. Might be easier said than done. Why? Events might conspire to tear us apart. Events? Your loyalty should be to the FBI, Vance, not me. Why don't you let me decide that for myself? She put a hand over his. And me being here shows exactly where my loyalties lie, Roby. Roby stared at her for a moment and then got up and walked out, leaving a surprised Vance staring after him. Chapter 80 Roby went out into the barn uncovered a box in the workbench, and took out a pack of Winston cigarettes. He popped one out, lit it up, and put the filter to his mouth. He drew in the carcinogens, and then exhaled them. Lung cancer slow or bullet fast, he thought.
What's the real difference? Time. Who gives a shit? He took another pull on his smoke, stretched out his neck. He took one final puff, ground the cigarette out on the workbench, and left the barn, locking the door behind him. He stared up at the small farmhouse. There were two lights on inside. One room where Julie was. One where Vance was. He was separated from them by about fifty feet. He was actually separated from them by about fifty light years. I am a killer, he thought. I pull triggers, I end lives. I do no more than that. He turned and pulled his gun so fast, she threw up her hands to shield her face. Vance slowly lowered her arms and gazed at him. He eased down his gun and said, I thought you were in the house. I was in the house, but I decided to come and check on you. I'm just fine. She eyed the gun. Fine, if a little edgy. I prefer to call it being professional. She folded her arms across her chest, took a breath, exhaled, and watched it turn into mist in the chilly air. We all are in this together, you know. He holstered his weapon but said nothing. She moved closer. You know, I understand guys who keep it all bottled up inside, the silent, stoic warrior. The FBI sure as hell has enough of them. But it does get old after a while, and a little grating, particularly at times like these. Roby looked away. I'm not like anybody at the FBI, Vance. I kill people. I'm ordered to do it. But I carry out those orders. No remorse. No nothing. So why didn't you kill Jane Wind? And her son? Why did you take the time to get her other child to safety? And you did it while people were trying to kill you. Explain that to me. Maybe I should have just killed him. If I thought you believed that, I'd shoot you right now. He turned to see Vance pointing her pistol at his chest. So are you just a killer, Roby? Don't give a damn about anything or anyone else? Why do you care? I'm not sure why. It just seems that I do. Maybe I'm just stupid. I just swore an oath of loyalty to you back there, but it didn't seem to register with you. I wasn't expecting you to jump up and cheer when I put you above the FBI and my professional career, but I did expect some type of positive reaction, but instead, you just walked out. 
Roby turned and started to walk back toward the house. Do you always just walk away when the questions get tough? Is that your way of handling things when the going gets shitty? If so, it sucks. I expected better from you. He turned back around, settled his hands in his pockets, and rocked back and forth on his heels. He took several shallow breaths and stared at a spot directly over Vance's shoulder. She walked toward him, sliding her gun back into its belt holster. I thought I came here to be part of something. Please don't tell me I was wrong about that. Roby glanced at the house. She's only a kid. She's in way over her head. She shouldn't be involved in this at all. I know that, but she's also a tough kid, and smart, and determined. Roby's mouth twisted. This isn't some scrape up on the playground, or some chemistry test you either pass or fail. One or both of us probably won't make it through to the end. So what chance does she have? But you're just a killer, Roby. You said that's all you are. So why do you care what happens to me or her? It's just another job. If we die, we die. But she shouldn't die. She deserves to have a life. Pretty weird statement for a cold-blooded killer to make. Okay, Vance, I get your point. She pointed toward the house. Let's go work on the plan, all of us. Roby didn't say anything, but he started to walk toward the house. Vance fell into step beside him. Whatever happens, Julie is going to survive this. And for what it's worth, I'll do all I can to make sure you do too. Chapter 81 Jerome Cassidy Elizabeth Clare Van Buren. Her maiden name was Elizabeth Clare, and she had incorporated that into her married name, Van Buren. Gabriel Siegel. Those were the three names on the list. Roby stared down at them as he drank his coffee at the kitchen table of the farmhouse. It was 8.30. The sun was well up. He could hear the shower running upstairs and figured Vance had just stepped into it. Julie was already up. She was in the back room, no doubt brooding about their last encounter. Fifteen minutes later, Vance was seated across from him, her hair still wet, her pants and shirt wrinkled but presentable. If we have to be off-grid much longer, I might have to get a few things. He nodded, rose, and poured her a cup of coffee. She spun the pieces of paper around and eyed the list of names. Who do we go after first? Roby handed her a cup of coffee right as Julie walked in. Her eyes were puffy, and her clothes were even more wrinkled than Vance's. She obviously had not bothered to undress when she had gone back to sleep. Roby held up the cup. Want some? I can get it. She took down a cup and poured out her coffee. They sat at the table, not making eye contact. Roby pushed the pieces of paper at Julie and said, Recognize any of these names? She took her time, looking at the list. No, my parents never mentioned any of them to me. Do you have pictures of them? Not yet. You sure, though? None of them ring a bell? None. He took the list and eyed it. Gabriel Siegel is closest distance-wise. Lives in Manassas. We'll go there first, find out what we can. Vance said, If we're doing it geographically, Van Buren will be next and Cassidy last. But they might be at work. I'm assuming these are the home addresses. I thought about that, too. But if they're not at home and someone else is, we can flash our creds and get the work addresses. Once we hit one of these addresses, we could pick up a tail, Ropey. And they could follow us right back here. Well, we just have to make sure they don't do that. How about we call the people on the list first? Said Julie. That way we don't have to expose ourselves. Or how about I call the Bureau in and get them picked up for questioning? Said Vance. They can't have bought off everyone at the FBI. That's what we thought last time. It didn't work out too well. Come on, you know what I mean. I prefer we do this alone. Okay, so we go with the Siegel guy first. I've looked at his military history. What does that tell us about him? He was the staff sergeant, the leader of the squad, 50 years old now, out of the service for years. Don't know what he does now. My source didn't have that info. Julie pulled out the phone Roby had given her. Let me plug in his military history and address and see if Google can tell us anything. 
She looked at Roby's sheet and then typed away on her miniature keyboard. She waited for the data to load. Mr. Siegel has a Facebook page. She turned the phone around so they could see it. An image of a jolly man with graying hair stared back at them. Do we know if it's the right guy? Julie said, His Facebook says he was in the Army during Gulf One, and he's even listed the name of the Army squad he was in. She showed this to Roby, who nodded. He's the right seagull. According to his profile, he works at SunTrust Bank as a branch manager. Lots of SunTrust branches around here, said Vance. Does it say which one? No. But his likes are guns, football, and chili cook-offs. He has 29 friends, which isn't a lot, but I don't know how long he's been on Facebook either. And he's a really old guy. He's only 50, Vance pointed out. Julie shrugged. Like I said, he's a really old guy. And I don't see anything on his page that would explain why all these people are dead. What about Cassidy? Julie hit some keys and the page loaded. Quite a few Jerome Cassidy's. She ran her eye down the page and hit the scroll key. Offhand, I don't see any that list military service or the address you gave, at least on the Google summary page. I can go more in-depth on each of them. Try Van Buren. That's not such a common name, said Vance. Julie did so. The page loaded. A lot more than one would think. It'll take a while to go through these. We don't have a while. We need to hit this now. He had pulled the car into the barn. He had earlier loaded the vehicle up with gear he thought they might need from the bunker underneath the barn. He showed Vance the firepower in the back seat. She touched an MP5 and gazed at a Barrett rifle that could punch a hole in an armored Hummer. Where'd you get stuff like that? Never mind. I don't want to know. Roby took out from the trunk three armored vests and put one on Julie while Vance slipped one on, velcroing it tightly to her torso and putting her jacket on over it. Julie said, Is this really necessary? Only if you want to survive. It's heavy. Better than taking the bullet, it'll stop, replied Vance. Roby drove. Vance rode shotgun, and Julie sat in the back seat. Roby had backed the car into the barn, so he pulled it straight out. He got out and closed and locked the barn door. When he got back in, Vance said, Might be the last time we can come here. It'll be what it'll be. Now let's see what Mr. Siegel can tell us. He gunned the engine and drove toward the road. Chapter 82 It was a quiet, tree-lined street with modest-sized houses with attached garages, houses that would sell for two or three times what they would fetch in most other parts of the country. The lots were small and poorly landscaped. The bushes around the cookie-cutter homes were overgrown enough to hide most of the fronts of the houses. Cars were parked along the streets, and in a few of the yards, small kids played under the watchful eyes of their mothers or nannies. Roby slowed his car and checked the addresses. Vance saw it first. Third one on the right. There's a van in the driveway. Hopefully someone's home. Roby eased over to the curb and killed the engine. He took off his sunglasses, picked up a pair of binoculars from the front seat, and surveyed the area. There were multiple attack points, too many for them to adequately cover. We're way out in the open here. No surprise. I'll go knock on the door. You cover me from here. How about the other way around? I've got my FBI creds, Roby. They trump yours. A federal shield is going to intimidate anyone. Vance already had the door open. If someone starts shooting, make sure you shoot back. And shoot straight. Roby and Julie watched as Vance walked up to the front stoop and rang the doorbell. Roby pulled his pistol from its holster, hit the button to roll down the passenger side window, and kept his gaze sweeping in long arcs, but always returning to an imaginary three-foot box around Vance. She's pretty brave to just walk up there, noted Julie. She's a super special FBI agent. It comes with the territory. Don't try to make nice with me, Roby. So I'm Roby now? What happened to Will? She didn't answer. The front door opened, and Roby fixed his gaze on the woman standing there. Vance flashed her cred pack, 
and then took a few minutes explaining to the woman what she wanted. The look on the woman's face, Roby assumed she was Siegel's wife, was one of astonishment. The two women spoke for about a minute longer, and then the door closed, and Vance walked quickly back to the car. Roby saw the curtain on the front window of the house move to the side, and the woman peer out. Vance got back into the car, and Roby started it up. Gabriel Siegel works at a SunTrust branch about ten minutes from here, got the address from his wife. She looked surprised. She was surprised. I think she thought it had to do with some problem at the bank. Maybe her husband is stealing money. Piped up Julie. Maybe he's laundering it for terrorists, and my parents and the others found out. Maybe, said Roby. He looked at Vance. The lady was watching you as you walked back to the car. I'm sure she was. She's probably calling her husband as we speak, so let's get going. I'll take the meeting with him. You stay in the car with Julie. And when do I get to do something other than sit in the car? She asked. Your time will come. Before this is over, everybody's time will come. They reached the bank branch in less than ten minutes. Roby left them in the car and walked into the small brick building right off a busy road in Manassas. He asked for Gabriel Siegel and was shown back to a glass-enclosed cubicle about ten feet square. Siegel was about five-eight, stocky and pale. To Roby, he had looked much better in his Facebook photo. Siegel rose from the chair behind his desk and said, What's this about? His wife obviously had called him. Roby flashed his badge and said, You were in an army squad in Gulf One? Yeah, so? Does the army want me to re-enlist? Not gonna happen. I did my stint and I'm too out of shape to carry a rifle in the desert. He sat down in his chair while Roby remained standing. I'm more interested in the people you served with. Keep in touch with any of them? Some, yeah. Who exactly? Exactly. What is this about? The banker was showing some balls, thought Roby. It's a national security issue. But I can tell you that it might be tied to the bus explosion and the deaths of those people at the restaurant on Capitol Hill. Siegel turned paler still. Jesus. Somebody from my old squad was involved in that? I can't believe it. So you know them all well? Roby asked pointedly. No, I meant that, well, we all fought for our country, and to turn against it. His voice trailed off, and he just sat there, pudgy hands on his cheap desk, looking like a little boy who'd just been told his puppy had been run over by a car. Which of them have you kept in touch with? Siegel came out of his trance and said slowly, Doug Biddle, Fred Alvarez, Bill Thompson, and Ricky Jones died years back. That I know, but they didn't live in the area. They were all spread out. Yeah, we would call each other, exchange emails. Doug came here once and I took him around to see some of the monuments. Fred got killed in a car accident. Billy put a damn gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Doug and Ricky both had cancer. Younger than me. I think it was all the crap we were exposed to over there. You know, Gulf War syndrome. I could be dying and not even know it. Every time I get a migraine, I think it's all over. He sank back into his chair. Roby sat down opposite him and said, Any of your old buddies locally that you hang with? I saw Leo Broom a few times. That was a while back. How far back? Over ten years ago. Ran into him at a bar in Seattle, of all places. He was out there on business, and I had just changed jobs and was at a seminar. He seemed to be doing okay. Think he worked for the government or something like that. Don't remember exactly. Anyone else? In the Middle East, I was closest to Curtis Getty. But I haven't seen him since we got back stateside. Don't even know where he is now. That would be dead, thought Roby. Leo Broom ever mentioned Getty? Don't remember. For some reason, it didn't seem like they had kept up. But like I said, that was a decade ago. Ten years ago. That might have been the case, thought Roby. Anyone else? Rick Wynn, for instance. 
I read that he had been murdered. Is that what this is about? Had you been in contact with Wynn? No, nah, not for years. Used to see him, but he'd gotten strange. Bought that pawn shop in that crummy neighborhood. I don't know. It was just different. How about Jerome Cassidy? Nope. Haven't heard from him since we left the Army. He lives in the area not that far from here. Didn't know that. How about Elizabeth Van Buren? That's her married name. Her maiden name was Elizabeth Clare, I know. It was unusual having a woman in the ranks back then, wasn't it? Yeah. Things are different now, of course. But I always thought the combat exclusion rule for women was crap. They could fight just as good as men. And in a unit, they really let their strengths shine. Guys are more macho. Women build a team perspective. And I gotta tell you, even though women were deployed in combat support positions, but technically weren't supposed to shoot back, they sure as hell did. At least in Gulf One. And Lizzie was one of the best. She was a better soldier than I was, I can tell you that. But she's no longer in the Army, said Roby. Well, there's a good reason for that, replied Siegel. You've been in touch with her? I have. So what's the reason she's no longer in the Army? Cancer. Started in her breasts and then it spread. It's in her brain, lungs, liver now. She's terminal, of course. Once that stuff metastasizes, it's over. They don't have any magic bullets for that. She's at a hospice center in Gainesville. You've seen her? Went regularly until about a month ago. She was in and out of it. Mostly out. Morphine. I'm not even sure if she's still alive. I should have kept up, but I guess it was just too hard to see her like that. What's the name of the place? Central Hospice Care. It's off of Route 29. Okay. Siegel exclaimed, I'm telling you, it's all the crap we breathed in over there. Depleted uranium, toxic cocktails from all the artillery blasts, fires burning all over the damn place, painting the sky black, burning crap we didn't know what the hell it was. And there we all were, just sucking it in. That could just as easily be me in that bed, waiting for the end. Roby handed Siegel a card. Anything else occurs to you, give me a call. What is this really all about? How can somebody from my old squad be involved in all this stuff? That's what we're trying to find out. Roby paused. Did your wife give you a heads up we were coming? She did, admitted Siegel. She worried about something? She's worried I might lose my job. Roby thought back to Julie's theory of money laundering for terrorists. Why? Problems here? I haven't done anything wrong, if that's what you're implying. But who comes into banks anymore to do stuff? It's all online. I'll be here for about eight hours a day, and I'll see maybe two people. How much longer do you think they're going to pay me to do that? There's a reason banks have all the money. They're cheap as hell. Writing's on the wall. World has changed. And I guess I haven't changed fast enough. Maybe I will end up carrying a rifle in the desert. What else is there for a guy my age? I can be a fat mercenary. But I'll die the first day out there. Well, thanks for your help. Yeah, Siegel said absently. Roby left him there, looking like he'd already received a death sentence. Chapter 83 They pulled into the parking lot of Central Hospice Care twenty minutes later. There were about fifteen cars in the parking lot. As they drove through the lot, Roby examined each one to see if they were occupied. He pulled into his space and looked at Vance. You want to do this one, or should I? Julie said, I want to go in. Why? She fought with him. Maybe she knew something about my dad. She's probably not in much condition to talk, said Vance. Then why are we even here? I'll take her in with me. You keep watch. You sure? Asked Vance. No, but I'm doing it anyway. He and Julie walked into the hospice building, a two-story brick structure with lots of windows and a cheery atmosphere inside. It did not look like a place where people would come to see their lives end. Maybe that was the point. The flash of Roby's creds got them escorted back to Elizabeth Van Buren's room. 
It was as cheery as the rest of the place, with flowers grouped on tables and on the windowsill. Light streamed in from outside. A nurse was checking on Van Buren. When she moved away, Roby's hopes for any personal information from the critically ill woman sank. She looked like a skeleton and was on a ventilator, the machine inflating her lungs via a tube inserted down her throat, with another tube bleeding off that to carry away toxic carbon dioxide. There was also a feeding tube inserted into her abdomen and multiple IV lines running to her. Bags of medication hung from an IV stand. The nurse turned to them. Can I help you? We just came to ask Miss Van Buren some questions, said Roby, but it doesn't look like that's possible. She was put on the ventilator six days ago. She comes in and out. She's on heavy painkillers. The nurse patted her patient's hand. She's a real sweetheart. She was in the army. It's just awful it's come to this. She paused. What sort of questions did you have? Roby pulled out his creds. I'm with the DOD. We were just making some inquiries into a military matter, and her name came up as a possible source of information. I see. Well, I don't think she'll be of much help. She's in the last stages of her disease. Roby studied the ventilator and the monitoring systems hooked up to the shriveled woman lying in the bed. So the ventilator is helping to keep her alive? Yes. He looked at Julie, who was staring at Van Buren. But she's in hospice. The nurse looked uncomfortable. There are many levels of hospice. It's all in what the patient or their family want. She looked down at the woman. But it won't be long, ventilator or not. So the ventilator is what the family wanted. I'm really not at liberty to say. Those matters are private and I can't see what this would have to do with any military inquiry, she added with some annoyance. Julie had wandered over to the window sill and had picked up a photo. Is this her family? The nurse looked curiously at Julie and then at Roby. You said you were with DOD, but why is she with you? I'm really not at liberty to say, answered Roby, causing the nurse to purse her lips. Julie brought the photo around to show Roby. She said to the nurse, my dad was in the same army squad as Mrs. Van Buren. I was hoping to find out some things about his past from her. The nurse's stiff expression vanished. Oh, I see, sweetie. I didn't realize, yes, that's her and her family. There used to be more pictures in the room, but her daughter and husband have been slowly taking them. They know the end is almost here. Roby took the photo. It showed Van Buren in healthier days. She was in her dress greens, her chest awash in medals. A man was beside her, presumably her husband. And there was a girl about Julie's age. So that's her husband? Yes, George Van Buren. And that's their daughter, Brooke Alexandra. She's older now, of course. That photo was from a number of years ago. She's in college now. So you know her? She'd been in to visit her mother quite often. That's how I know her. Brooke's a lovely girl. She's very torn up about her mother. And her husband? He comes here regularly. I know he's devastated, too. They're barely 50, and they have to face this. But whoever said life was fair? Anybody else come to see her? A few people, at least that I know. I'm not assigned to this wing all the time. You have a guest log? It's out front by the receptionist, but not everyone signs in. Why not? This is not a high-security facility. People who come here to visit friends and family are usually very emotionally upset. Sometimes they forget to sign in, or one person signs in for the group. As you can imagine, we're a bit flexible on that. They come here to show love and respect and support. But it's just not the sort of place anyone wants to have to visit. Understood. How long has she been here? Four months. Isn't that a long time to be in hospice? We have people here for longer and shorter periods. It's not a one-time period fits all sort of place. And until a couple of weeks or so ago, Mrs. Van Buren wasn't like she is now. The drop-off came relatively quickly. But the ventilator will keep her alive so long as it's on, right? I mean, even if she can't breathe on her own. I really can't talk to you about this. Federal and state law prohibits me from doing so. I'm just trying to understand the situation. 
The nurse once more seemed uncomfortable. Look, normally the use of a ventilator would decertify a person for hospice care. Hospice is to allow a patient to pass with dignity. We're not a place where someone goes to be cured of her disease or to artificially sustain life. So the use of the ventilator in a situation like this is unusual. It could be grounds for decertification and the transfer of the patient back to a hospital or other care facility. So why the ventilator? Does she have a chance of pulling through? Again, even if I knew, I couldn't tell you. What I can tell you is that sometimes families reach a point where they have false hope or where they made a decision to come to hospice and then reconsider that decision. I see. Julie added, It's hard watching someone you love die. The nurse said, Yes, it is. Very hard. Now, unless you have any other questions, I have some things to do for my patient. You said her husband visits regularly. Yes, but at odd hours. Brooke goes to college out of state, so she doesn't get in as often. Do you have any idea where her husband works? No, I don't. I can probably find that out easily enough. The nurse looked at Julie, who was staring at Van Buren. I'm sorry that she couldn't tell you anything about your father. Yeah, me too. Julie reached over and touched Van Buren's hand. I'm sorry. Then she turned and left. Roby handed his card to the nurse. If her husband comes in, can you have him give me a call? Roby glanced once more at the terminally ill former soldier, turned, and followed Julie out. Chapter 84 Roby held the door open for Julie and then climbed into the car after her. He buckled up and looked at Vance. Don't see anything with Elizabeth Van Buren being helpful. She can't talk, and she won't be alive much longer. And what about Siegel? You didn't say much after you left the bank. He said he spoke to Leo Broom, but over a decade ago. Said he didn't know Curtis Getty or Jerome Cassidy were in the area. He seems to just be waiting to see if he'll get cancer, too. Or lose his job. Unless he's hiding something really well, I'm not sure how he figures into this, either. So that leaves Jerome Cassidy. He's in Arlington, right? What the paper says. Note anything suspicious out here? Not a thing. Let's go. It took over an hour to get to Arlington because traffic was bad, or in other words, traffic was normal heading toward D.C. It was nearly lunchtime when Roby found a parking space and pulled into it. He turned to Vance. You sure this is the space? She held up the page, and he read off it. All three of them turned to look at the building. It's a bar and grill said Julie. Roby looked upward, but there seemed to be rooms above it. Maybe Cassidy lives in one of them. Vance undid her seatbelt. My turn. Roby looked across the street and then back at her. The area they were in was congested, like much of Arlington. There were too many homes and businesses with not enough land to put them on. That resulted in tight streets with not much parking and lots of hidden spots from which they could be watched. Let's all go in on this one. Vance shook her head. What about the car? We can't leave it unattended. I'm not looking to get back in here with a bomb under the chassis. I got this car from a special source, which means it has special defensive devices. Like what? Like if someone tries to break into it or booby trap it, it will not be a fun time for them, and we will most certainly know about it. They all climbed out of the car. Roby's gaze was shifting in every direction. What is it? You see something? No, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. You didn't seem this tense at the other places. That's because this is the last place. Vance took a quick breath and nodded. Right. I see your point. The name of the bar was the Texas Hold'em Saloon. At ten minutes to noon, it already had about twenty people inside. It was decorated in a western theme, heavy on saddles, bridles, cowboy hats, and boots, and with murals of horsemen, cattle, and the flat Texas plains. 
At the far end of the space was an enormous bar that spanned the entire width of the interior. Bar stools with faux bull's horns as seat backs lined the space in front. Behind the bar, a large Texas flag hung on the wall. All around the flag were stacked hundreds of libations, designed to wet the whistle, lighten the wallet, and dull the senses. Somebody spent a lot of cash on this place, commented Roby. A young woman dressed all in black, except for her white cowboy hat and white boots, and holding a menu, approached them. Party of three? Maybe. We were given this address for a friend of ours, Jerome Cassidy. You know him? Mr. Cassidy's the owner. Roby and Vance exchanged a quick glance. Is he here? Can I tell him who's asking? Vance held out her cred pack. FBI, could you take us back to where he is? The woman looked uncertain. Can you let me just check to make sure he's here? So long as you check while we can see and hear you. The woman's polite features vanished. She looked at them nervously. Is Mr. Cassidy in some sort of trouble? He's a great boss. We just want to talk to him, said Roby. So he is here? Back in his office. Lead the way. She turned and started off hesitantly. She walked past the bar and down a short hallway and turned right. Passing through a door marked authorized personnel only, she continued on. There was another short corridor down here, with two doors on either side. She stopped at one marked office and timidly knocked. They heard noises coming from inside this room. Roby's hand ventured toward his gun. Vance saw this movement and mimicked him. A voice from inside the room called out, Yeah? Mr. Cassidy, it's Tina. I have some people here who want to talk to you. Do they have an appointment? No. Then tell them to make one. Roby moved past Tina and tried to open the door. It was locked. Hey, Cassidy called out. What the hell is going on? I said to make an appointment. Roby pounded on the door. Cassidy, it's the FBI. Open the door now. Roby heard more noises, scuffling, and a drawer slamming. Roby moved back and then drilled his right foot against the doorknob. The door flew inward as Tina screamed and jumped back. Roby and Vance had their guns out. Vance moved Julie to the side. Stay back. Roby moved into the room first, with Vance covering him. Cassidy was standing behind his desk, staring at him. He was about Roby's height, but thinner, with broad shoulders and narrow hips. His hair was longish, gray and brown. His face was slender but good-looking, with a few days' worth of stubble. He had on faded jeans and an untucked white shirt. As Roby moved forward, Cassidy said, You want to tell me why you just broke my door and are pointing a gun at me? You want to tell me why you didn't open it when we asked you to? Cassidy glanced at Roby's gun. Then he stared over at Vance as she moved into the room. Let me see your creds right now. Roby and Vance held them out. Cassidy read them carefully and picked up a pen and wrote their names and badge numbers down on the white blotter on his desk. Just want to get the info right for my lawyers when they sue your ass. You didn't open the door, Mr. Cassidy, pointed out Vance. I was just fixing to when you broke it open, and I didn't know if you really were the feds. Your employee told you we were the FBI. I pay a ten dollars an hour to look cute and seat people. I don't trust her to know the FBI from a postal worker or some guy looking to rob me. He eyed Tina through the open doorway. It's okay, Tina. Just go back to work. She hurried off, and Cassidy looked at Roby, who had holstered his gun. And you're not even FBI. You're DCIS. You know DCIS? I was in the Army, so what? He sat down behind his desk, pulled a slender cigar from his shirt pocket, and lit up. You can't smoke in a restaurant or bar in Virginia, said Vance. While it's true that the good commonwealth of Virginia has seen fit to deprive its citizens of the right to smoke in an establishment like this, even though the health department, which enforces said law, has no real enforcement powers, and lots of places still light up to their heart's content, this is my personal space, and it has a special ventilation system, 
so I can smoke myself into late-stage lung cancer if I want to. Get a sit and watch? We have some questions for you, said Roby. And my lawyers will have no answers to your questions. He pulled a card from an old-fashioned Rolodex and handed it to Roby. Their contact info is right on there, Mr. DCIS. You always that quick to call in the legal beagles? asked Roby. I found they're worth every penny of their outrageous fees. So you have a lot of need for legal services? Ma'am, this is America. If a businessman wants to wipe his ass, he better have a lawyer on retainer. Roby looked around the office. It was high-dollar decorated, and there was a shelf full of business awards against one wall. You look to be pretty successful. Bar must do well. This bar is one of 20 businesses that I own, and all of them are highly profitable. And I don't have one dime of debt. How many of the Fortune 500 jerk-offs can say that? I've even got my own damn plane. Good for you, said Roby. He put the business card for the law firm down on Cassidy's desk. We're here to ask you about your old army squad. Cassidy looked genuinely surprised by this. He took the cigar out of his mouth. What the hell for? You keep in touch with any of them? Cassidy looked past him and saw Julie peering around the corner of the doorway. Cassidy slowly rose and said, Come on in here, girl. Julie eyed Roby, who nodded. She stepped into the office. Closer, said Cassidy. Julie drew nearer to the desk. Cassidy stubbed out his cigar in an ashtray and rubbed his chin. Damn. What is it? Asked Vance. You're Julie, aren't you? I am, but I don't know you. I knew your parents real well. How are they doing? Roby said, how do you know them? Like you said, the squad. Curtis Getty and me served together. Saved my ass a couple times in Gulf One. I didn't even know my dad was in the Army until just recently. Cassidy nodded, but didn't look surprised by this. He wasn't much of a talker. How did you know I was Julie? I don't think we've ever met. Because you look just like your mother. Same eyes, same dimple, everything. And we have met. Only you were just a baby. Diapered you a couple of times myself. Probably botched the job. Not great with little kids. So you kept in touch with them, asked Roby. Not for a long time. I haven't seen them since Julie turned one. What happened? Cassidy looked away and shrugged. Folks get busy, drift apart. He eyed Julie. Your mom doing okay? No, she's dead. What? Cassidy said quickly. What the hell happened? He put one hand on the desk to steady himself. Roby said, she and Curtis were murdered. Murdered? Cassidy dropped back into his chair. The questions tumbled out. Why? How? Wh who did it? We were hoping you could help us answer those questions, said Roby. Me? Yeah, you. Like I said, I haven't seen the Gettys in a long time. Didn't you know they lived in D.C.? asked Roby. No. They didn't used to live around here. They were in Pennsylvania last time I saw them. Pennsylvania? exclaimed Julie. I didn't know that. I thought they were from California. Curtis might have been. But when we got back to the States, they lived over near Pittsburgh. That was the last time I saw them, you understand. Didn't know they'd moved down here. Vance said, So you were living in Pennsylvania, too, back then? Yeah. In fact, I lived with them for a while, long time ago, trying to get back on my feet. I actually knew your mom before she met your dad. They got married while he was still in uniform. I was at the wedding. Roby glanced at Julie and noted her wide-eyed look at all this new information about her parents. Cassidy continued, Anyway, after golf won, I didn't do too well. Got into some bad stuff. They helped me out. Drugs? asked Roby. I wasn't the one into the drugs said Cassidy quietly, looking away from Julie. I know my parents had drug problems, especially my dad. He was a good man, Julie, said Cassidy. Like I said, he saved my butt over in the desert. Earned himself the bronze with valor, a purple, too. When we were in uniform, he never touched even a drop of liquor. 
But after we came back, we were all changed. The war wasn't that long, not like NAM or WW2, but we saw some serious stuff over there. Lots of deaths, mostly civilians, women, kids. A lot of guys came back messed up or sick. Anyway, your daddy started using pot, coke, meth. Your mom tried to get him straight, but never really could. And then she fell into that crap, too. Hard as hell to get out of that hole once you're in it. And what was your vice? Vance asked. I was a drunk. And yet you own a bar said Roby. Best way to test yourself on a daily basis. I'm surrounded by the best stuff and I haven't touched a drop of it in over a decade. Julie's 14, so about 13 years ago was the last time you saw the Gettys? That's what I said. Roby looked around the spacious office. The Gettys were pretty down on their luck. Might have been good if you'd returned the favor and helped them out. Cassidy said, would have been glad to do it if I could have found them. He opened his desk drawer and pushed a button located on the inside of it. A portrait of a woman on a horse on the wall behind his desk clicked open, revealing a safe. He opened the safe, pulled out a stack of letters, and held them up. Letters I wrote to your parents, Julie, over the years. All returned unopened, addressee unknown. I spent a lot of time and money trying to find you all. Never thought to look in my own backyard. He tossed the letters down on his desk and sat back in his chair. I can't believe they're dead, he said, his voice quavering. He wiped at his eyes and shook his head. Roby looked at the letters. A lot of effort went into those. Like I said, they were my friends. Curtis saved my life. They helped me when I needed it. He looked at Julie. If your parents are gone, who are you staying with? Who's taking care of you? Them, for now, said Julie, indicating Roby and Vance. Is she in protective custody or something? asked Cassidy. Or something, replied Roby. Cassidy looked at Julie. I can help you. I would like to help you, just like I wanted to help your parents. We can talk about that later, said Roby. Is there nothing else you can tell us about Getty? or the other members of the squad. Like I said, I haven't kept in touch. Do you remember Gabriel Siegel and Elizabeth Clare? Yeah, I do. How are they doing? Not so great, actually. How about Rick Wind? Yeah, he was a good guy. Fine soldier. He's dead now, too. So is Leo Broom. Cassidy stood and slapped his desktop. All these people from my old squad have been killed? Not all of them, but the mortality rate is higher than we'd like to see, said Vance dryly. Should I be worried? asked Cassidy. I think everyone should be worried, replied Roby. Chapter 85 As they walked back to the car, Roby said, We visited all three, and nothing happened. Meaning they didn't tip their hand as to which one was important, said Vance. Smart move, actually. Maybe it didn't matter. Siegel didn't know anything except that Van Buren was in a hospice. Van Buren couldn't tell you anything because she's terminal. Cassidy was a little strange, though. Julie said, I liked him. He sort of reminded me a little of my dad. Roby said, He definitely tried to locate your family but it was odd that he never knew any of the others were in the area. If the guy could afford to look for the Gettys, why not some of the others? My family helped him, like he said, and my dad saved his life. The other ones were just soldiers in the same squad. Maybe, said Roby, but I'm not convinced. Vance eyed his car. You think it's okay to get in it? I told you about the special features, but if it makes you feel any better, I'll get in first and start it up. Roby. You don't have to do that. We're in this together. And because we're in this together, I do have to do it. No sense in all of us going up in the same flame ball. They waited at the corner while he unlocked the car and got in. Vance and Julie tensed noticeably when he started the engine. When nothing happened, they both let out long breaths at the same time. He drove to the corner and they climbed in. Now where? Asked Vance. 
Back to our little HQ. Compare notes. Think it through and come up with new leads. I don't see anything to think through, grumbled Julie. You'd be surprised. Well, let's hope we're surprised, said Vance. Because I don't see any daylight in all this either. Traffic was just as bad heading west, and it was well over 90 minutes later before they were seated at the table in the farmhouse kitchen staring at each other. They'd grabbed some burgers and fries on the way back and had eaten in the car. But while their bellies were full, their heads were still empty of any promising leads. Okay, let's go through it again, said Roby. Do we have to? Said Julie. It seems like a waste of time. Most of investigative work can be a waste of time. But you have to do it to get to the parts that actually mean anything. Shot back Vance. Roby looked at Vance. Your turn. Okay, we've gone down some scenarios that petered out. Let's retool and start by ruling out some people. From what you said about Van Buren, I don't see how she can be involved in any of this. She's been in hospice for months. She's got a machine breathing for her. Her husband and daughter are just watching her die, basically. Roby nodded. And Siegel seems to be just as clueless. He's more concerned about losing his job. And he seemed genuinely surprised when I told him why I wanted to talk to him. So maybe you were wrong, Roby. You said it was what Julie mentioned about the other squad members that caused them to try and kill her. It just doesn't appear to be the case. Roby said, but what about Cassidy? What about him? He knew the Gettys. I don't personally buy the fact that he couldn't find them, or that he didn't know that any of his other squad members were around. The guy has cash, and cash gets your results. And while he seemed genuinely surprised that Curtis and Sarah were dead, it just seems pretty odd. Julie said, My mom and dad never mentioned him. That's pretty odd, too, considering how close he said they were. I mean, why didn't they answer his letters? It doesn't make sense, agreed Roby. Vance was about to say something when her phone buzzed. She looked at the number. Don't know that one, but the area code is Northern Virginia. Better answer it. Hello? Said Vance into the phone. The person on the other end of the line started speaking fast. Wait a minute, slow down. Vance clamped her phone against her ear with her shoulder, pulled out a notepad and pen, and started scribbling. Okay. Okay, I'll be right over. She clicked off and looked up at Roby. Who was it? Maybe you were right after all. About what? That was Gabriel Siegel's wife. I left my contact info with her. Why was she calling? Her husband got a phone call just after you left him. He walked out of the bank right afterwards and never came back. He missed a meeting with a client and a luncheon the bank was holding. He's just disappeared. Chapter 86 They didn't drive to the bank. They drove straight to Gabriel Siegel's house. His wife was waiting at the door as they pulled into the driveway. Roby led them up to the front porch. The woman looked at him strangely until she saw Vance behind him. We're partners. Roby, this is Alice Siegel. Mrs. Siegel, we're here to help find your husband. Alice Siegel nodded, her eyes brimming with tears. When she caught sight of Julie, she once more looked confused. Who is she? Roby said, It's not something we can go into right now, ma'am. Can we go inside? Alice stepped back and let them pass through into the house. They settled in chairs around the living room. Roby looked around. The interior had been done mostly on the cheap, but it was neat and clean and functional. The Seagulls were clearly frugal. The bank probably didn't pay that much. But the Seagulls obviously stretched dwindling dollars as far as they could go, just like millions of other families were doing right now. Vance opened the conversation. So you said he received a phone call and then walked out. Any idea who called him? No one at the bank knows. I was hoping the call could be traced. Did it come to his line at the bank or his cell phone? His office line. That's how they knew he had gotten the call. But if it came to the office, didn't someone at the bank ask who was calling your husband? I think they just put the calls through. It's a business, after all. I guess the person who answered just assumed Gabe would want the call. They don't have a formal receptionist or anything. Banks don't really do that anymore. They've scaled back. So your husband told me. 
Did the person at the bank say it was a man or a woman? A man. Are you going to go there? I mean, isn't the trail getting cold? We'll cover that end, Mrs. Siegel, said Vance. But no crime has been committed, and your husband isn't technically missing. He went off, apparently, of his own free will. But he didn't come back. He just walked out. That's not normal. Could he have had an accident? His car is still in the parking lot. So he might have walked off, or gotten a ride from whoever called him. Have you tried calling his cell phone? Twenty times. I texted him, too. Nothing back. I'm very worried. Ruby eyed her closely. Is there a reason why he would have just walked off like that? The phone call. It must be. Vance added. But we don't know that the two events are connected. He might have been planning to walk off anyway. The timing of the call might just be a coincidence. But why? He mentioned to me that you were both worried he might lose his job at the bank. Well, walking out like that is a pretty good way to ensure that he will lose his job. And you're sure he didn't try to contact you? On your cell? Maybe on your hard line? We don't have a hard line. We cut that out when Gabe's pay was reduced last year. Can you think of any reason why your husband would just up and walk off like that? She eyed him suspiciously. Well, you came to talk to him, and then he disappeared. Maybe you can tell me the reason. That was fair enough, thought Roby. Your husband was in the army during Gulf One. Is that what this is about? But he's been out of the military for years. He was a member of a squad. We were interested in that squad. Why? Roby hesitated and glanced at Vance. She said, We were just interested, Mrs. Siegel. We wanted to ask your husband if he'd been in touch with anyone from his old squad. I know that he knew Elizabeth Claire Van Buren. They had kept in touch. We know about her. She's dying. We know that, too, said Vance. Anybody else he ever mentioned? A few names from time to time. Hard to remember. Leo Broom, Rick Wind, Curtis Getty, Jerome Cassidy. Getty? Yes, that name I recall. Gabe said they had been close, but he hadn't seen him since he'd come back. Rick Wind sounds familiar. The thing is, Gabe didn't talk much about his military time. He was terrified that he was going to die because of the toxic conditions they fought in over there. There are soldiers dropping left and right, and the army won't even acknowledge there is such a thing as Gulf War Syndrome. After Elizabeth got sick, he went into a deep depression. He thought a lot of her. He was convinced he would be next. Julie said, You mentioned he and Curtis Getty were friends. Did he have any pictures of them together? Roby and Vance looked at Julie. Roby felt immediate guilt. He had never stopped to consider how all of this must have been affecting the teenager. Alice looked momentarily flustered, but the earnest look on Julie's features prompted the woman to stand up. I believe he does. Hold on for a moment. She left the room, and a couple of minutes later came back holding an envelope. She sat next to Julie, opened the envelope, and took the photos out. Gabe brought these back from overseas. You're welcome to look through them. Vance and Roby crowded in closer, and they looked through the photos. Julie said, There's my dad. Alice looked at Roby and then at Vance. Her dad? It's a long story, said Roby. He took the photo from Julie and studied it. The group was standing in front of a burned-out Iraqi tank. Someone had spray-painted the words, Saddam Kebab across the blackened shell of the armored vehicle. Curtis Getty was on the far right, dressed in combat fatigues with his shirt unbuttoned, a pistol clenched in his right hand. He looked very young and very happy, probably to be alive. Next to him was Jerome Cassidy. His hair was brown and cut military short. His shirt was off, and he looked tanned, lean, and muscular. Next to him was Elizabeth Clare, Shorter than the others, she looked tougher than all of them. Her uniform was sparklingly clean, with every button where it was supposed to be. Her sidearm was in its holster, and she stared at the camera with a very serious expression. As Roby looked at her image, he thought it probably would never occur to her that she would be lying in hospice, waiting to die just twenty years later. Alice said, That's Gabe on the far left there. Siegel was thinner, with more hair. He seemed confident, even cocky, as he looked at the camera. 
These days he was a shell of the man who was depicted in the photo, thought Roby. Alice pointed at two other men, standing next to each other in the middle of the group. They were taller than the others. I don't know who they are. Rick Wind and Leo Broom, said Roby. We know about them. Do you think they might know something about why my husband has disappeared? They might, said Roby. But he thought, we won't have much luck asking them. Vance, obviously reading Roby's thoughts, said, We'll check into that angle. I don't know why my husband's military service would come up now, after all these years. Does your husband have anything else connected to his time in the Army? Not that I know of. He had brought some things back, his helmet, boots, and some other things, but he got rid of them. Why? asked Vance. Alice Siegel looked surprised by the question. He thought they were toxic, of course. Chapter 87 When they returned to the farmhouse, Vance called in to the FBI and got an earful from her superior for going off-grid without authorization. After the man finished his tirade, Vance was able to ask him to trace the phone call Gabriel Siegel had received at the bank. He called back twenty minutes later with the answer. Disposable phone, dead end. He ordered Vance to come into the office right that instant. Roby overheard this part of the conversation. When Vance started to refuse, he grabbed her arm and said, Go, and take Julie with you. His gaze went upward where Julie had gone to use the bathroom. What? said Vance. Things are going to get really hairy very shortly. Vance put her hand over the phone. How do you know that? I just do. All the more reason for us to stick together. But not Julie. We can't have her in the middle of this. Take her to WFO and surround her with firepower. Then you can come back and hook up with me. She studied him wearily, distrust in her eyes. The voice squawked from the phone. Yes, sir. Said Vance into the phone. I'll be in directly. And I'll be bringing Julie Getty with me. I hope we can do a better job of protecting her than we did last time. She clicked off and gazed at Roby with a searching look. If you're screwing with me. Why would I do that? Because you seem to have a propensity for it. If you have this noble idea that you're the only one in the world who can tackle this thing, or that you're somehow protecting me from danger. You're an FBI agent. You signed up for this. I have no noble thoughts in my head. All I've ever tried to do is my job and then survive. If I engage in any sort of fantasy, it's that I keep on believing those goals are not mutually exclusive. Don't try to confuse the issue. Take your car and take Julie. Get her settled and then come back here. And you'll just be here waiting for me? If I'm not here, you have my phone number. I don't believe this, Roby. You're shutting me out at the very moment. Roby turned and walked away. Is that your answer? Ignoring me? Walking away again? What's going on? Julie peered over the stair rail at them. Vance looked at Roby and then sighed. Come on, Julie. We need to get out of here. Where are we going? To run down a lead. What's Will going to do? Run down another lead. Why are we splitting up? Because our fearless leader wants it that way, don't you, Roby? He was in the next room now and said nothing in response. Roby watched as the beamer with the cracked windshield and shattered rear window backed away from the house. Vance slammed it into drive and did a donut in the dirt and gravel before careening down the road away from him. Roby took a deep, cleansing breath. He had never played well with others. For the last dozen years, he had worked in almost total isolation. He preferred it that way. He was better alone than with a team. That's just how he was built. He felt an immediate freedom, a washing away of responsibility. He drove from his mind the promise that he had made to Julie to let her help find out what had happened to her parents. It was a false promise anyway. He'd had no business making it. Fulfilling it, he told himself, would only end up getting the girl killed. Yet it didn't really matter one way or another to Roby. He kept telling himself that, as he prepared to finish what he had started. His mind had not changed on one thing. This was about him, 
despite their detour down to the squad Curtis Getty had been in. This is about me, he thought, and it's also about something bigger. Now he had to find out what that was. This was once more a chess match. The other side had just made a move. Roby had to decide if it was a legitimate move or something else. He gunned up and set out to do just that. Chapter 88 The first stop was the bank. Roby talked to the employees, but they had no helpful information. Gabriel Siegel had left his briefcase behind, but it contained nothing helpful. Yet its presence did tell Roby that Siegel's hasty exit had been unplanned and not related to the business of the bank. He was pretty certain of that already, but in his mind it was now confirmed. As Alice Siegel had indicated, her husband's car was still in the parking lot. It was a decade-old Honda Civic. Roby picked the lock and searched it, but found nothing useful. He drove off in his car, wondering what had prompted Siegel to simply leave his place of business. Next stop was the hospice. He had forgotten something when he was there before. The guest book. The receptionist let him look at it. While she was attending to other business, he took photos of the pages for the last month or so. Then he walked down the hall to Elizabeth Van Buren's room. Nothing much had changed. She was still lying in the bed with a big pipe stuck down her throat. The sun was still coming in the windows. There were flowers, the photo of the family. And she was still dying. Hanging on to life, probably because she was a soldier, and it was just part of her psyche and the ventilator didn't hurt. At some point, the family would have to make a decision about that. Like the nurse had said, this place wasn't designed to cure or even prolong life. It was to let folks die with dignity, in comfort, in peace. As he stared at Van Buren, Roby decided she didn't look too peaceful. They should just let her go. Just let her pass to a place better than this one. He picked up the photo and stared at it. A nice family. Alexandra Van Buren was pretty, with soft brunette hair, a playful smile. Roby liked how the camera had captured the energy in her eyes, the life there. The dad looked rugged, but weary and haunted, as though he might have predicted the fate that would befall his wife in the not-too-distant future. At some point in his life, Roby had supposed... He could have had a family like this. He was long past that, of course. But sometimes he still thought about it. Right at that instant, Annie Lambert's face appeared in his thoughts. He shook his head clear. He just didn't see how something like that was possible. He walked back out into the fading sunshine and set off for Arlington, to the bar that Jerome Cassidy had built. He made good time and pulled to a stop in front of the bar at around five o'clock. He walked in, ordered a beer, and asked for Cassidy. The man came out a few minutes later and approached Roby, an uncertain look on his face. He eyed the beer like it was a stick of TNT about to go off. Like to talk to you, said Roby. What about? Julie. What about her? You planning on telling her you're her father? Let's go sit. Cassidy led him over to a booth in a corner. There were about fifteen customers in the place. They settled in their seats, and Cassidy said, Early drinking crowd comes in around 5.30. Place will be full by 7. Standing room only by 8. Empties out around 11.30. D.C. plays hard and works hard. Folks get up early, especially the ones in uniform. Roby cradled his beer but didn't drink it. He waited for Cassidy to pull the trigger on answering his question. The man finally sat back, slid his palms along the top of the table, and looked at Roby. First, how the hell did you know? Guys don't write bundles of letters to friends, especially guy friends. You don't spend time and money tracking them down. And I saw how your face lit up when Julie walked in. You hadn't seen her since she was a baby, but you knew who it was instantly. Not that hard to figure out, actually. 
And I recently saw a photo of you when you were in uniform 20 years ago. There may be a lot of her mother in Julie, but there's some of you, too. Cassidy blew out a long breath and nodded. Think she knows? No, I don't. Would it matter to you? Probably. So you thinking of telling her? You think I should? Why don't you tell me what happened first? Not much to tell, really. And I've got nothing to be ashamed of. I cared for Sarah. This was before she was married to Curtis. And she cared for me. And then Curtis came along. She and him just hit it off right from the first minute. Love at first sight. Stronger than anything we had. I didn't feel bitter about it. I didn't love Sarah like Curtis did. And like I said, he saved my life. He was a good guy. Why not let him have some happiness? But Julie? Stupid one last roll in the bed. Curtis thought Julie was his. Sarah knew better. I knew better. But I never said a word. You seem to be an impossibly good person on that score, remarked Roby. Cassidy said, I'm not a saint. Never claimed to be. Done lots of people wrong in my life, especially when I've been drinking. But Sarah and Curtis, well, they just belong together. And there was no way I could take care of a kid. It was an easy out for me, you see. Nothing noble about it. Not so easy now. Cassidy eyed the full beer. Roby said, You want it? Cassidy rubbed his palms together. No. No, I don't. I do want it. But no. Roby took a sip of the beer and set it back down. Not so easy now, he said again. Older you get, the more regrets pile on you. I never had any intention of trying to take Julie away. Never. I just wanted to see her. See what sort of person she'd become. But by then, I'd left Pennsylvania. By the time I got around to trying to find them, they'd left too. Looked everywhere. Except for right here. He paused and eyed Roby. What's going on here? Feds involved, people getting killed, Julie in the middle of it? Can't tell you. What I can tell you is that Julie will need a friend after all of this is over. I want to help her. We'll just have to see how it plays out. I can't make any promises. I am her dad. Her biological dad, maybe. You don't believe me? I don't believe anybody anymore. Cassidy started to say something, but then stopped and smiled. Hell me either, Roby. He gazed out the window. So I told you my side. You think I should tell Julie? I'm not sure I'm the best person to advise you on that. Never been married, never had any kids. Well, let's assume you are the best person. What would you advise? She loved her parents. She wanted their lives to be better than they were. She wants to find out why they were killed. She wants to avenge them. So you're saying not to tell her. I'm saying my answer might be different tomorrow than it is today. But you're the only one who can really make the call. Roby stood and eyed the beer. You're going to make it. Cassidy stared up at him. Why? You turn down a perfectly good beer under these circumstances. You can turn it down under any circumstances. I'll be in touch. Chapter 89 Roby didn't know why he had come back here. It was the apartment across the street. He opened the door, turned off the alarm, and stood looking around. He had this place. He had his apartment across the street and the farmhouse. Each place was supposed to be safe, secure. And yet they weren't. So Roby felt homeless. He half expected someone to walk down the hall and ask him what he was doing here. He looked at his watch. It was almost seven o'clock. He called Vance, but it had gone straight to voicemail. She was probably enduring some difficult times with her boss for going off-grid. He doubted she would be getting back to him any time soon. And he was actually relieved about that. He'd texted Julie and received a terse response. She no doubt was furious that she'd been snookered into going into protective custody again. At least she would get to grow up, do something wonderful with that big brain of hers. After leaving Cassidy, he had driven around. 
He'd ridden to the scene of the bus explosion, then over to Donnelly's, which was still closed. Indeed, Roby doubted it would ever reopen. Who would want to grab a drink or have a meal in a place where so many people had lost their lives? Now he was here, and he wasn't sure why. He looked at the telescope, drew closer to it, and finally bent over slightly and gazed through it. His condo building immediately came into focus. He shifted the viewing angle slightly and looked at the line of windows representing his space. It was dark, it was supposed to be. He moved the telescope to the left, and his gaze flitted over the lighted hallway running past all the apartments on that floor. His gaze shifted, as he knew it would, to Annie Lambert's place. Her windows were also dark. She was probably still at work. He wondered if her day off had gone well. He hoped it had. She deserved it. As he watched, he saw her come down the street on her bike. He continued to watch as she walked her bike into the building. Counting off the seconds in his head, he positioned the telescope so that it was right on the elevator bank on his floor. The doors opened a few seconds later, and Lambert got off, rolling her bike next to her. She unlocked the door to her apartment and went inside. Roby moved the telescope and watched as she parked her bike against the wall, took off her jacket and tennis shoes, and padded down the hall in her socks. She made a stop at the bathroom. When she came back out, she continued down the hall. Roby lost her, but picked her back up again about a minute later. She'd taken her blouse off and replaced it with a sweatshirt. Part of him wanted to go over and see her. Then he saw her lift up a long black dress in a hanger with a sheet of plastic over it. It had been draped over a chair. She took the plastic off and held the dress up to her. It was a strapless gown, Roby could see. She lifted up another garment. It was a matching jacket. The last items she picked up were three-inch black heels. Annie Lambert was going out on the town tonight, it seemed. And why shouldn't she, thought Roby. Part of him felt jealous, though. It was an odd emotion for him. It didn't sit well. He sat down, put his feet up on a leather ottoman, and gazed at the ceiling. He was so tired, couldn't remember the last time he'd truly slept. He drifted off and awoke with a start some time later. From the foggy recesses of his mind, he remembered something and drew out his phone. He brought up the photos he'd taken of the guest register at the hospice. He scrolled from screen to screen, not expecting to find much of interest. And he didn't. The only name he recognized was Gabriel Siegel from about a month ago. That made sense because Siegel had admitted he'd last visited Van Buren at that time. He scrolled to another page. There was nothing. He hit another page, nothing again. But then something caught his eye. It wasn't a name. It was a date. There was an entire day missing in the guest book. He enlarged the screen as big as he could. He looked at it closely. Down in the far left corner of the frame, he spied it. A triangle of paper. It would have gone unnoticed by anyone looking at the guest book itself. It was too small. But with the pixels swollen to an unnatural size on his phone, Roby knew what it was. The remains of the page that had been ripped out of the book, probably while the front desk had been unoccupied. Why would someone have taken a page from a hospice guest book? There could only be one answer. They wanted to cover up whoever's name had been written in there. They wanted to wipe away the record of someone who had visited Elizabeth Van Buren. Was it Broom, Getty, Wind? Two of them? All three? Siegel had told him that he hadn't seen Broom for ten years and hadn't seen Wind or Getty since Golf won. Cassidy had said he hadn't seen any of them since the war, except for Getty. But what if Broom or Getty or Wind had found out that Van Buren was here and had come to visit her while she was still lucid? Siegel had said she was in and out of it, and had she let something slip, something that had led to all three of them having to be silenced? It seemed a bizarre notion, but it was no more strange than any of the other theories that had floated through Roby's mind lately. 
Roby looked at the date before and after the missing page. Eight days ago. That would fit with the timeline. Siegel hadn't been targeted since he'd stopped coming a month ago. Rick Wind had been the first to die. Counting back, it seemed that Wynn might have been killed shortly after he had possibly visited Van Buren. And if Curtis Getty hadn't come to the hospice, that would explain the heated discussion that the waitress at the diner, Cheryl Cosman, had witnessed. Broom had told Getty. He then might have told Wynn. Or it could have been the other way around. Roby couldn't know for sure without seeing which of them had visited the woman. Getty didn't have a car, so it was doubtful he had driven all the way out to Manassas. No chance could be taken. Husbands, wives, and an ex-wife, who was also a potentially dangerous government lawyer, had to be killed. The Brooms had managed to escape, for a time. But with Roby's involuntary help, they had managed to get them, too. Roby's mind next drew to the timing of the insertion of the ventilator. It kept a terminally ill woman alive. But it also did something else. It prevented her from saying anything during her lucid moments. From saying anything else, he thought. They had put the tube in her to shut the poor woman up. But whatever she had told, one or more of her former squad members had been the reason they had been killed. Roby raced out of his apartment and took the elevator down. He had a hospice visit to make. Chapter 90 Visiting hours were over, but Roby's repeated raps on the glass front door brought an attendant. He flashed his badge and was allowed in. I need to see Elizabeth Van Buren, he said, and I need to see her now. That's not possible said the attendant, a woman in her thirties with short blonde hair. She hasn't been transferred out of hospice, has she? asked Roby. No. What then? The attendant was about to say something when the nurse Roby had spoken to before came forward. So you're back. She was clearly not pleased. Where is Elizabeth Van Buren? I need to see her. She can't see you. That's what she said. But why? asked Roby his gaze digging into the nurse's features. Because Miss Van Buren passed about three hours ago. What happened? The ventilator tube was removed. She passed peacefully an hour later. Who ordered the tube removed? Her doctor. But why? Wouldn't he have to get permission from her family? I really can't speak to that. Well, who can speak to it? Her doctor, I suppose. I'll need his name and number right now. Roby called and spoke with the doctor. The physician was reluctant to discuss the matter with Roby until Roby said, I'm a federal agent. Something is going on here we're trying to figure out. The only common denominator is Elizabeth Van Buren. Can you tell me anything? It's vital or else I wouldn't be asking. The doctor said, I would not have removed the tube without the family requesting it. Who requested it? The doctor paused, then said, Mr. Van Buren had the medical power of attorney. So he told you to remove it? Why the change of heart? I have no idea. I just did what he asked us to do. Was it by phone or did he come here in person? By phone. Pretty strange that he didn't want to be here when his wife died, said Roby. Quite frankly, Agent Roby, I thought the same thing. Maybe he had something more important to do. Although for the life of me, I can't imagine what that might be. Do you know where he works? No, I don't. Ever seen him in person? Yes, numerous times. He seemed like a perfectly normal person. He was deeply devoted to his wife. He was intimately involved in her care. I liked him. But not devoted enough to be with her at the end? Again, I can't explain that. Roby clicked off and looked at the nurse. Is the body still here? No, the people from the funeral home already picked it up. And her husband never came in? Does her daughter know? I have no idea. I would assume Mr. Van Buren has contacted her. He didn't ask us to do so, and thus we couldn't make that sort of communication. Roby called Vance, but still got voicemail. He next called Blue Man, but the man didn't answer either. Roby raced down the hall to Van Buren's room. He pushed open the door and saw the empty bed. He drew nearer, picked up the photo, and looked at George Van Buren. Short hair, muscular physique. 
Roby wondered if he was maybe military or former military. The nurse had followed him down the hall and was standing in the hallway. Is this really necessary? Yeah, it really is. He whirled around. George Van Buren. You said you've seen him. Was he ever wearing a uniform? A uniform? Yeah, like military or something. No, not that I ever saw. He was just dressed normally. She took a step forward. We need to collect Mrs. Van Buren's personal effects and send them along home. I'll need that home address. We can't give out that sort of information. Roby took a long stride until he was within a couple of inches of her. I don't like playing the asshole, but in this case I'm going to. This is a case of national security. And if you have information that might be able to stop an attack against this country, and you don't provide it to a federal officer who has requested it, you're going to prison for a very long time. The woman gasped, then said, Follow me. A minute later, Roby was flying down the road in his car. Chapter 91 The Van Burens lived about twenty minutes from the hospice center. Roby made it there in fifteen. The homes were solidly middle class, basketball hoops, vans and American-made cars in short asphalt driveways. Do-it-yourself landscaping, not a butler or Rolls-Royce in sight. Roby zeroed in on the Van Buren's house. It was set at the end of the street. The home was dark, but one vehicle was parked in the driveway. Roby stopped his car at the curb, pulled out his pistol, and crept toward the house. He didn't knock at the front door. He peered in one of the windows. He couldn't see anything. He hurried around to the back, putting his elbow through the glass in the back door. He reached through and turned the lock. He pulled a flashlight and made his way through the house. It didn't take him long. He ended up in the front room after clearing the others. He shined his light around. It hit on various objects on walls and shelves. He passed one item and then came back to it. He rushed over and snatched it up. It was a photo of the Van Burens. Mother, daughter, and father. Mom was in her combat fatigues. Roby's gaze focused on Dad. George Van Buren was also in a uniform, a very distinctive one. White shirt, dark pants, dark cap. It was the uniform of the United States Secret Service Uniformed Division. George Van Buren helped to guard the President of the United States. And then in a flash of synapses, Roby finally made the connection. He was watching Annie Lambert walking down the hall. He had lost her for about 30 seconds, but then regained her. She had changed clothes in those few seconds. And then Roby forgot all about Annie Lambert and took his mind back to that airplane hangar in Morocco. Through his scope, he had watched Khalid bin Talal climb the steps to his jet. After that, he had lost sight of the prince for a brief period. And then he had regained him as the Saudi walked down the aisle of the plane and took his seat across from the Russian and Palestinian. That's when Roby had noticed the straps around the prince's middle. He had assumed it was the straps holding on his body armor. But the prince had not been wearing body armor before he got on the plane. Roby had been watching him closely. He would have seen the outline of the armored vest under the robes. And it took longer than a few moments to put on, especially if one was wearing a long robe and was very heavy in the belly. What had happened was now clear. Talal had been warned about a possible hit. He'd had someone, perhaps a double he routinely employed, take his place at the meeting. Maybe he thought the Russian and Palestinian would try to kill him. Maybe he suspected a traitor in his inner circle, or a sniper like Roby waiting to take his shot. He had outsmarted them all. He had had his double die in his place. Roby thought back to the conversation he had overheard that night. It now took on a critical importance. Something that everyone assumed was pointless to try, he thought. The weakest link. Willing to die. That could only be one possible target. The President of the United States. Now the theft of the Secret Service SUV made sense. They had someone on the inside. They had George Van Buren. And the fact that they had let Elizabeth Van Buren die 
told Roby that the time to make the attempt was right now, and Talal's billions had bought him people in this country to do his bidding. Then he remembered something Annie Lambert had told him. When the president got back to D.C., there was going to be a big event at the White House. He pulled out his phone, did a quick internet search. He got the results and raced out of the house. Tonight, the president would be entertaining the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Talal was multitasking tonight. The son of a bitch was going for both men. Chapter 92 Roby was halfway to D.C. when he finally reached Blue Man. In terse sentences, he told him about his latest deductions. Blue Man's response was equally terse. He would meet Roby at the White House with backup, and he would alert the appropriate parties. Twenty minutes later, Roby slid his car to a stop at the curb, jumped out, and ran. He was on Pennsylvania Avenue, heading to the front gates of the White House. He looked at his watch, nearly eleven. He imagined the party would be winding down by now, and if the attempt hadn't occurred yet, it would have to shortly. He spied Blue Man and a group of men huddled outside the White House front gates. Roby could see that it was a mixture of FBI, Secret Service, and DHS. He saw no uniformed Secret Service around. He assumed it had been determined that they couldn't know how far the conspiracy had gone, so it was best to leave the uniforms out of this. Roby ran up to them. Do they know where Van Buren is? he asked. Blue Man said, He's on duty. We've spoken to the Secret Service agents inside. They're hunting for him now. The problem is we don't want to show that we're suspicious of anything. Van Buren may not be the only asset they have in there. One man in a suit stared over at Roby. He was about 6'3", with graying hair, and a face that seemed to have a worry line for every national crisis he had endured. Roby recognized him as the director of the Secret Service. Roby recalled that the man's father had been a veteran agent with Reagan when he had been shot. It was said that the current director had become an agent at the urging of his old man, and he had sworn that no president would ever die on his watch. The director said, You're the one who called this in? I am, said Roby. I sure as hell hope you're right, because if you're not, if I'm wrong, nothing bad happens. If I'm right, the director looked at Blue Man. We'll move in through the visitor's entrance. We'll attract less notice that way. Hopefully they'll snag Van Buren before we even get in the place. And the president? asked Roby. Ordinarily, with any threat like this, we would have already moved him either to his personal quarters or to the bunker underneath the White House. But if Van Buren is involved, he'll know that's our protocol and may have set an ambush somehow. So we decided to sequester the president in an atypical place. The family dining room, along with the crown prince, some of the president's staff, and some select VIPs who we know are not threats. No uniforms are part of the security detail. All suits. Van Buren can't get near him. We did it subtly. Now we just have to find Van Buren. He said again, But I sure as hell hope you're wrong about this. The fact that you haven't been able to locate Van Buren yet tells me that I'm right, replied Roby. They raced to the visitor's entrance and moved quickly through the security checkpoint there. All uniformed Secret Service had been pulled off interior guard duty and massed in a hallway. They had not been told why. Each of them had been questioned. None of them knew where Van Buren was. He had been assigned to a security perimeter on the lower level near the library. He wasn't there. All rooms on the lower level had been checked. Roby and the others ran down the hall and up the stairs to the main level of the White House. As they were fast walking down the cross hall toward the state dining room, which adjoined the family dining room, one of the agents with them received a message through his earwig. They found Van Buren, he said. Where? the Secret Service director asked immediately. A storage room in the West Wing. They changed direction and quickly reached the West Wing. There they were directed to the room where Van Buren had been found. The door was thrown open by the lead agent. Inside they saw Van Buren. He was on the floor, unconscious and trussed up. A patch of shiny blood was mixed in with his hair. One of the agents knelt down next to him and felt for a pulse. He's alive, 
but somebody hit him hard. Blue Man said, I don't understand this. Why knock out and tie up your assassin? Roby was the first to spot it. His gun is missing. All eyes went to the man's holster. The nine millimeter that should have been there wasn't. Roby said, he wasn't the assassin. They just needed his weapon. That way, they didn't have to try and sneak one past security. He just walked in with it, part of the plan. And then Roby remembered the last part of the overheard conversation from the plane hangar in Morocco. Access to weapons. Not a Westerner. Decades in the making. Willing to die. He said, The shooter has his gun. They have to be in with the President and the Crown Prince. The director paled. You mean... Part of his staff? Or one of the guests? Roby didn't answer. He was already sprinting down the hall. Chapter 93 The family dining room was one of the most intimately scaled rooms on the main level of the White House. It was bracketed on one side by the chief usher's office and could also be accessed through the much larger and adjacent state dining room. The president and vice president would often have one-on-one -on -one lunches there. It was not as elaborately decorated as the far larger East Room, or the ornately furnished Green, Blue, and Red Rooms. Yet if Roby and company failed tonight, it would be the room known forever as where a U.S. president had lost his life. The group marshaled outside the door to the state dining room. The director said, we're going to alert agents inside the room that the shooter is probably in there. They've already formed a hard wall around the president and are awaiting my order to get him out of the room. Blue Man said, If they do that or start searching people, the assassin will fire. In such close quarters, and despite the wall around the president, the bullet might hit its target. We can't just wait and see if the person acts or not, countered the director. Protocol says to move and to move fast. I should have already given the order. Roby said, How many people in that room total? About fifty, said one of the agents. This could turn into a bloodbath, said Blue Man. The director said curtly, No one wants that, but my focus is only on the president. We plan to take him out through the chief usher's office and from there to the entrance hall. Another agent said, and the longer we wait, the less chance we have of getting him out of there safely. Blue Man said, What if there's more than one shooter? You could be leading him directly into an ambush. Roby said, The shooter must be someone who works here. That's impossible, said the director. The person was involved in a conspiracy with someone we know worked here. That's indisputable. That could not be an outsider. How many of the people in that room with the president and the crown prince or staffers, correct? The director gave a start. It could be one of the prince's staffers. It was a major mistake to put them in the same room together. Shit. Roby shook his head. Van Buren was found in the West Wing. Did one of the prince's staffers have access to the West Wing tonight? Because Van Buren's head injury was recent. The director looked at one of his men. Do you have the answer to that? None of the prince's staffers were anywhere near the West Wing this evening. Son of a bitch, exclaimed the director. Roby said, People have been paid off up and down the line on this one, sir. The person behind this has lots of money. No one is off limits. For all we know, he might have bought off a Secret Service agent in there. I can't believe that, said the director. No agent has ever been a traitor. The same could be said for the Uniform Division, said Blue Man. But it obviously happened. One of the men forming the wall around the president right now could be the backup shooter, with the primary one using Van Buren's gun. But if there is a Secret Service agent on the payroll, why bother getting Van Buren's gun? Something like this, you have a fallback plan, sir, said Roby. The stakes are too high. I'm not saying there are two shooters in there, but I am saying that we can't responsibly discount that possibility. So what do we do? asked the director. Roby said, let me go in there. A staffer will know the interior security agents, but they won't know me. Let me go in dressed as a waiter. I can go in under the pretense of bringing in something, maybe coffee. And then what? demanded the director. I identify the shooter or shooters and take them out. 
How will you identify the assassin from all of the people in that room? Snapped the director. Blue Man spoke up. Agent Roby is very adept at spotting assassins, director. He drew closer and whispered into the man's ear. He happens to be one for this country. In fact, he's our best one. If you need a man who can make the kill shots under pressure in a room full of people, he's it. The director gazed sternly at Roby. This goes against every protocol and procedure the service has. Yes, sir, it does, agreed Roby. If you fail, the president dies. Yes, sir. But I am prepared to die, making sure he doesn't. If I can't alert the agents in there about our plan, and you pull your gun, they will shoot you. It's always in the timing, sir. The director and Roby locked gazes for a long moment. Then the director said, Get him a waiter's uniform and a cart of damn coffee. Chapter 94 Roby pulled his jacket more tightly around him. The waiter's uniform they had gotten him was for a bigger man. Roby had insisted on this. He couldn't allow a gun bump that someone could spot. He had two pistols, one in his holster, one hidden under the cloth covering the coffee cart. He was also wearing body armor, although at least some of the agents would fire into his head if they thought he was a threat to the president. The agents inside had been told that the danger was over, but to still maintain the wall around the president. The crown prince and his staff were standing in a corner diagonally across from the president, surrounded by other agents. The thirty-odd White House staffers and other guests were in the middle of the room, between the prince and the president. The door opened, and Roby wheeled the cart into the room. He had no earwig, had no means of communication with anyone. The force right outside the door was standing by to rush in after him. The director had his walkie-talkie ready to order his agents not to fire at Roby if he pulled his gun. Yet he knew that would be an impossible order to follow. As far as the director was concerned, Roby was a dead man from the moment he walked into the room. The door was shut behind Roby, and he continued to push the cart along. He gritted the room without seeming to do so. The family dining room had been established by James Madison and was where many first families ate until Jackie Kennedy created a dining room upstairs in the family quarters. The room was about 28 feet by 20 feet in size. A blue and white oriental rug covered much of the floor. There was a blue and white marble fireplace surrounded with wall candelabras on either side of the mantel. Above that was a portrait of a woman in 19th century garb. The long dining table that was usually in the center of the room had been shifted to one side, the accompanying chairs lined in front of it. A cabinet blocked off one door, a mirror hung over a Chippendale-style chest, a crystal chandelier anchored the middle of the ceiling. The walls were painted yellow. Although the VIPs and staffers had not been told of any threat, it seemed from their anxious features that some of them realized that the move to this room was out of the ordinary. Roby's thoughts went back to the overheard conversation at the plane hangar. Not a Westerner. Decades in the making. That obviously couldn't be George Van Buren. He should have realized there had to be a second person. Roby saw the Crown Prince hovering nervously in one corner. There was a wall of security around him and his staff. Roby quickly sized up each of the staff members. Some, like the prince, were wearing traditional robes. Others were in suits. The crown prince looked like his black sheep cousin, Talal, both fat and both too rich. A lot of damage one could do with all that money, thought Roby. The world would be safer if people didn't have so much damn wealth. His gaze next swept to the other side of the room. He could see the president in the middle of the wall of agents. He had possessed dark hair when winning the White House. Now, after three years in office, a good deal of it had turned white. Maybe that was the real reason why the place was called the White House, thought Roby. It quickly aged all the occupants. There were six agents forming the hard wall around the president. But even with that, there were clean shooting lines right to the man if one was close enough. Each agent was looking outward at possible threats. 
Roby looked for any agent who was not doing this, who was looking at the president or at other agents. Even if they believed the threat to be over, their vigilance should never relax. For in truth, the danger was never over. All of the agents' gazes were directed outward. Maybe there was only one shooter. Roby could use a bit of luck right now, and having only one person to deal with would be lucky indeed. He rolled the cart farther into the room. He checked the Crown Prince's corner one more time. If the threat came from there, it would be a difficult shot to hit the President. He turned his attention to the last group. The staffers and other members of the group sequestered here stood in the middle of the room. They were all formally dressed. Roby saw lots of black. Many of the women wore shawls, jackets, and wraps to cover bare shoulders. Some carried tiny purses, all too small for Van Buren's sidearm. The men huddled together. Tuxes were the rule. Suits with pockets, and maybe a stolen 9 millimeter from an unconscious guard in one of them. Most were Caucasian. The majority of them appeared to be Westerners, but of that, Roby couldn't be certain. But there were about a dozen who looked to be from distant places. Roby fixed his sights even more on this middle group. Equidistant between the two national leaders, this positioning made the most sense if the plan was to kill both men. It would take miraculous shooting, but it was not impossible for someone who knew what he was doing. The distances involved were short. I could do it, thought Roby. The first shot would create a panic. If it hit its target, the focus would momentarily be on the victim of that shooting. As the person fell to the floor, those around him would scream, run, duck. But it was difficult to fire a gun in close quarters and go unnoticed. Someone would identify the shooter. Agents would rush forward. People would grab at the person. But the shooter might get off another shot. It was certainly feasible. And with that thought, Roby came to understand the order of targets. President first, Prince second. You didn't get this far and kill the second banana first. The president would be the priority target. If the shooter could get off another round, it would be aimed at the prince. As people came forward to get their coffees, Roby made another sweeping gaze of the room to check for possible position advantages for the shooter. A group of guests and staffers hung back, clustered around the table. Some had turned chairs around and were leaning on the backs of them. Mostly women, Roby noted. Three-inch heel syndrome. Their feet were probably killing them after the long evening event. Roby took in the people here one by one until he arrived at the woman. And then he stopped looking. Annie Lambert was looking back at him. She was dressed in black. She had a jacket over her strapless dress. She held no purse. Her hands were folded across her chest and rested inside her jacket. Her hair was done up with a few strands trickling around her long neck. She looked beautiful. So this was the reason for the black dress and high heels Roby had seen through his scope. She had told Roby she would be working this event, but he had somehow failed to make the connection. He promised himself that whatever happened, he would save her from harm. She would not die tonight. Her lips were set in a firm line. She obviously recognized Roby, but she did not smile. She was probably scared, he thought. For a terrible second, he wondered if she would raise the alarm about him. To her, Roby was an investment banker. Why would he be here dressed as a waiter? Maybe she would think he was here to kill the president. He wondered how to signal to her, but he could think of no way to do that. He just had to hope she would not panic from seeing him. Yet there was a calmness about her that Roby found enviable under the circumstances. His respect for her grew even more. Her eyes were wide, and seemed to take in every bit of him in one glance. Then he saw that her pupils were also dilated. And then she smiled at him, in a way she never had before. And in that moment, Roby saw a side of Annie Lambert he had never suspected even existed. There was a split second where Roby's mind shut down, as though he'd been struck by lightning. Then his brain immediately fired back up. He shouted, Shooter! He drew his gun, but with astonishing speed, 
Annie Lambert pulled the gun from where it had been hidden in a compartment in her jacket, aimed and fired, seemingly all in one smooth motion. The president was only a few feet away. Her shot hit him in the arm instead of the chest. An agent had grabbed him when Roby had shouted. If the president hadn't moved, his heart would have been pierced by the round instead of his limb. She started to point her gun at the prince. She never made it. Roby's shot hit Lambert directly in the head and blew out the back, the slug embedding in the wall behind her along with some of the woman's brain and skull. The yellow paint turned red. She fell backward, hit the table, and slid to the floor. The Secret Service removed the president from the room so fast, his blood barely had time to touch the floor. Roby heard screams, sensed people rushing in and out, but he simply stood there his gun pointed down. All he could do was stare silently at Annie Lambert's body. Chapter 95 Roby was in a room at the White House. He didn't know which room and he didn't care. He had been led to it by others and told to wait there. He sat in a chair and stared at the floor. The light overhead was dim. He heard noises from outside somewhere. People were talking in the halls. Occasionally, the sound of a siren reached him. None of it made an impression on him. He only saw Annie Lambert's face. Her eyes, really. The pupils big and pulpy, seemingly too large to be contained in such limited space. He saw the round from his Glock hit her head, explode her brain, and end her life. He saw this a hundred times. He could not make his mind turn the image off. It kept playing like a video reel. Part of him wanted to place his gun against his temple and make it stop for good. But they had taken his gun from him, and so this was not an option. Right now, that was probably a good thing, he thought. Right now, Roby was not sure he wanted to live. He could no longer make sense of anything. The door opened, and Roby looked up. Agent Roby? He saw the director of the Secret Service. Behind him was Blue Man. Yeah, said Roby. The president would like to personally thank you. How is he? Fine. Hospital released him. Thank God the bullet went clean through his arm. More blood than damage. He'll be fine in no time. That's good, said Roby. But there's no need to thank me, just doing my job. You can tell him that for me. He looked down at the floor once more. Roby said Blue Man, stepping forward. It's the president. He's in the Oval Office. He's expecting you. Roby glanced up at the man. Always neat as a pin. Twelve in the afternoon or twelve at night didn't matter. Blue Man had a confused look on his face. While he had known that Annie Lambert lived in Roby's apartment building, Roby also knew that Blue Man was not aware of their relationship, and he did not feel like enlightening him. Roby said, Okay, let's go. The trip to the Oval Office took a few minutes and involved them walking outside and past the Rose Garden. Before Teddy Roosevelt had had the West Wing created, a series of glass conservatories had occupied the spot. As they trudged along, Roby recalled that Roosevelt had been shot while campaigning for president. The only thing that had saved his life was the thickness of the speech that had been folded up in his pocket. The bullet had hit this mass of paper, and it had robbed enough of the round's kinetic energy that Roosevelt had been able to give his speech, albeit while bleeding heavily from the wound in his chest. He had only consented to be taken to the hospital after his speech was done. They didn't make presidents like that anymore, thought Roby. And so Roosevelt had lived, and so had the current president. He had lived because of a bit of skill on Roby's part, and a lot of luck, just like the rolled-up speech. The president sat behind his desk. His left arm sat stiffly in a sling. He rose when he saw Roby. He had changed clothes. Gone was the tux, replaced by a white dress shirt and black slacks. He looked shaken still, but there was firm resolve in his grip as he shook hands with Roby. You saved my life tonight, Agent Roby. I wanted to thank you personally for that. I'm just glad you're okay, Mr. President. 
I can't believe that one of my staff was involved. Miss Lambert, I believe. They tell me there was nothing in her background that would have hinted at this. I'm sure it was a surprise to everyone, replied Roby dumbly. Especially me. How did you recognize so quickly that it was her? She had taken a drug to calm her nerves. Suicide bombers often do this before they detonate. Her pupils were dilated from the drug's action in her body. She was drugged, but could still shoot straight? There are chemicals that relax the nerves, sir, without dulling the other senses, and it actually makes you a better shot. Nerves kill the aim faster than anything, and I would assume that even the most gifted assassin would have been nervous tonight. Because they would know there was no way out. That they would die? said the president. Yes, sir. And she was close to you, only a few feet away. Her accuracy, of course, was important, but not as critical as her speed. In fact, she was faster than me, thought Roby. Her gun had appeared in a blaze of motion, aimed, fired, and started to move to the secondary target before he could even get off one shot. It was only his shout that had made the agent nearest the president act swiftly enough to move him so that a mortal wound became something far less. As though he had been reading Roby's thoughts, the president said, They tell me that if I hadn't been moved, I would be dead. And I wouldn't have been moved except for your warning. I wish I could have stopped her before she fired. The president smiled and held up his wounded arm. I'll take this any day over being dead, Agent Roby. Yes, sir. Roby wanted to leave now. He wanted to be alone. He wanted to get into his car and just drive until he ran out of fuel. We will honor you suitably another time, but again I wanted to make sure that I conveyed my personal thanks as soon as possible. And again, not necessary, sir, but I appreciate it. The First Lady would like to thank you as well. As if on cue, the President's wife walked in looking pale, the night's terror still clearly in her eyes. Unlike her husband, she had not bothered to change. She swept over to him and took his hand in hers. Thank you, Agent Roby. Neither of us will ever be able to repay the debt we owe you. You don't owe me anything, ma'am. I wish you both the best. A minute later, Roby was walking fast down the hall. It was as though he couldn't breathe in here, like he was submerged in water. He had reached the front entrance lobby before Blue Man caught up with him, showing a speed Roby would not have expected. Where are you going? he asked. Somewhere other than here, replied Roby. Well, at least it's over, said Blue Man. You think it is? Don't you? It's not over, said Roby. In fact, in some ways it's just beginning. What are you talking about? It'll be in my next report. The Crown Prince would also like to thank you. Send him my regrets. But he's waiting expressly to talk to you. I'm sure. Tell him to email me. Roby! Roby walked out the front door of the White House and kept going. It isn't over yet. Chapter 96 It was still early in the morning. Roby was in the other apartment. He stared through the telescope to where Annie Lambert had lived. The place would be swarming soon with federal personnel. They would go through every inch of her life. They would find out why she had tried to kill the president. They would discover why she was doing the bidding of a fanatic from the desert world that possessed limitless petrodollars. Roby thought about what she had told him of her past. She was adopted, an only child. Parents lived in England. But were they English? What had her upbringing been like? Again, the words of the Palestinian came back to him. We own that person, decades in the making. Did they own you, Annie Lambert? Were you decades in the making? And now you're dead, on a metal slab a few miles from here, dead from my round fired into your head. And I slept with her right across the street. I had drinks with her. I liked her. I felt sorry for her. I could have maybe come to love her. Roby knew that Annie Lambert, living in the same building as he did, was not a coincidence. This is still about me. She came to live there because of me. Prince Talal wants his revenge. 
He wanted to mess with my mind, screw my life every way he could. And he'll want it even more since I destroyed his plan. The phone rang. He looked at the screen. It was Nicole Vance's cell phone. He hit the answer button. He knew what was coming. Hello? The package will be delivered to your door in thirty seconds. Okay, said Roby evenly. You will do what it says to do. I hear you. You will follow the instructions completely. Uh-huh. The connection went dead. He put the phone away. Blue Man had already told him, although Roby had figured it out previously. Vance and Julie had never made it to the WFO. They had been taken. This was Talal's failsafe. All the really good ones had such a plan. He counted off the seconds in his head. At thirty, the manila envelope was slid under his door. He did not rush to it. He would not attempt to capture the messenger. That person would be able to tell him nothing. He walked slowly to the door, bent down, and picked up the envelope. He fingered open the clasp and took out the pages. The first ten were glossy photos. Him having drinks with Annie Lambert. Him being kissed by Annie Lambert outside the White House. Finally, him having sex with Annie Lambert in her bed. He wondered briefly where the camera had been placed for that shot. Roby dropped the photos on the coffee table and looked at the other pages. He sifted through them. There was nothing surprising here. He had anticipated most, if not all, of it. It is still very much about me, and Talal wants me. He wants me back where it all started. The offer was crystal clear. Him, for Julie and Vance. He considered it a fair trade, if Talal could be trusted, which he could not, of course. Yet Roby would still have to accept it. There was one advantage. This would render unnecessary the need for him to hunt the world looking for Talal. The prince was summoning him right to where he would be. Roby had already killed the double. He doubted that Talal had another one in reserve. And as much as Talal wanted to end his life, Roby wanted to end Talal's life even more. Using Annie Lambert as a vicious tool, Talal had taken something from Roby, something precious, perhaps even inviolate. He's taken away my ability to ever really trust myself again. He took the photos over to where the light was better and looked at them again, one by one. Annie Lambert looked like what she might have been under vastly different circumstances. A beautiful woman with a bright future ahead of her. A nice person, wanting to do some good in the world. She had not been born a killer. She had been raised to become one. An extraordinary one because he had never once suspected until he had seen those swollen pupils. I was not born to be a killer either, thought Roby, but I am one now. He pulled out a Zippo from a drawer, carried the photos into the kitchen, and burned them to blackness in the kitchen sink. He ran water over them, let the smoke rise up and wash over his face. He watched as Annie Lambert disintegrated into the bowels of his sink, then he rinsed the residue down the drain. Annie Lambert vanished, like she had never even existed. And the Annie Lambert he thought he knew never had. Roby left the kitchen and started to pack. The instructions had been explicit. He intended to follow them, at least most of them. For certain key elements, he intended to create his own rules. He assumed that Talal would expect this. He had beaten Roby in Morocco. Roby had bested him in Washington. The next two days would determine who would be the winner of the third and final round. Chapter 97 The Costa del Sol was not as warm as the last time Roby had been here. The wind was chilly, the sky was gray, and there was rain in the forecast. The ride over in the high-speed ferry was rough the big boat pitching and swaying until they got fully up to speed. And even then, the twin hulls of the catamaran were beaten by the heavy waves. Roby wore a leather jacket, dungarees, and combat boots. 
If he was going into combat, he needed the appropriate footwear, he figured. He had no weapons on him. As always, he had to trust that what he needed would be waiting for him. He sat in a seat next to one of the windows and watched the seagulls, fighting the swirls of wind over the choppy water. The gray med lashed up at the hull of the ferry, and spray battered the windows. Roby did not flinch when this happened, as did other passengers around him. He didn't react to things that could not hurt him. Because of the rough water, the crossing took longer than normal. When they pulled into Tangier, the sky was growing dark. Roby clambered down the walkway of the ferry and joined the crowd making their way to transportation into town. Unlike last time, Roby boarded one of the tour buses along with a group of other passengers. When the bus was three-quarters full, the doors hissed closed, and the driver swung the bus onto the road leading away from the port. Roby looked back once at the ferry and wondered if he would be alive to take it back across the strait. Right now, he wouldn't bet on it. The bus ride took about twenty minutes, and by the time it stopped and the doors hissed open again, the rain had begun to fall. While the tour guide took charge of the group, Roby walked off in the opposite direction. His destination had been planned well in advance. There was supposed to be someone waiting for him. There was. The man was young, but his features carried the weariness of someone much older. He wore a white robe and a turban and had a jagged scar down the right side of his neck. It was from a knife, Roby knew. He had one of them, too. But on his arm. Knife wounds never healed properly. Serrated blades ravaged the skin too much, tearing up the edges of the flesh so badly that even a gifted plastic surgeon couldn't fix it completely. Roby, the young man said. Roby nodded. You come here to die, said the man matter-of-factly. Or something, replied Roby. This way, he said. Roby went that way. They entered an alley, where there was a van. There were five men in the van. They were all larger men than Roby, and looked just as fit and strong as he was. Two wore robes, three didn't. They were armed. Two men searched Roby in every possible way that one could search another. You came without weapons? said the young man in an incredulous tone. What would have been the point? replied Roby. I thought you would go down fighting, said the young man. Roby didn't answer him. He was hustled into the van and driven back out of the city. The rain was falling harder. Roby did not mind the rain. What he did mind was wind, but that had fallen away. The drops fell straight down, but they fell fast. The storm was moving quickly, he thought. The van kept going. About thirty minutes later it stopped and passed through a security checkpoint. It was not the same private airport. That would have been too easy. The doors to the hangar opened, and the van drove straight in. A different jet was parked here. It was smaller than Talal 767. To Roby, it looked like an Airbus A320. The man owned two planes that were used by commercial airlines to fly hundreds of people at a time. Roby was pushed roughly out of the van. The farther away they had gotten from prying eyes, the harsher the treatment had become. He was now completely in their power, so the kick in his back that knocked him to the cement was not wholly unexpected. The young man said something in Farsi to the man who'd kicked Roby. Roby picked himself back up and said, Tell him he hits about as hard as my sister, and if he wants his ass kicked, Tell him to try that again, only with me facing him. The young man said, I will not tell Abdullah that, otherwise he will kill you. No, he won't, because if he robs Talal of his fun, he'll be dead too. Is that what you think this is? Fun? For him, maybe. Not so much for me. You have ruined a great plan. I stopped a maniac from screwing up the world. I can debate you point by point. I don't care what you think you can do. We're a special agent, Vance and Julie Getty. They could be dead. They could be, but they're not. How can you be so sure? Again, the fun factor. I know Talal really needs to feel it right now.
Yes, I do. Roby turned to see Prince Khalid bin Talal walk down the stairs from his jet. Chapter 98 Talal faced Roby. The interior lights had automatically come on because it had grown dark outside. Roby could hear the rain pinging off the metal roof of the hangar. The large windows on the upper levels of its side walls revealed moisture-laden clouds. Talal came to a stop about ten feet from Roby. He wore not robes, but a stylish three-piece suit that somehow managed to make his portly form look sleeker. You look slimmer than your body double, Talal, said Roby. Not quite as fat, at least. You will refer to me as Prince Talal. Where are Vance and Julie? Prince Talal. Talal nodded, and the two women were led out of a far corner of the hangar. Vance's face was purple and black. She walked stiffly, as though every step was killing her. Julie had two swollen eyes, and she carried her right arm at an awkward angle, and her left leg dragged a little. Their condition made Roby's anger rise, but he willed himself to remain calm. He would need it for what was coming. When they drew near to Talal, he casually snapped his fingers, and the men accompanying the two women pulled them to a stop. I'm sorry for all this, said Roby looking first at Vance and then at Julie. They stared back at him without speaking. Roby turned to Talal. But at least the only one who died was your person. The president is safe. The only one to die just yet, said Talal. He smiled. But you knew her, didn't you? You knew her quite intimately, if the photos are any indication. Vance said sharply, What photos? I know it was a game to you, Talal, said Roby, but it's never been a game to me. Talal wagged a finger at Roby. I could possibly excuse you for trying to kill me. I could perhaps excuse you for thwarting my plans to assassinate men who would lead the world to disaster. But I cannot excuse you for disrespecting me. My name is Prince Talal. The blow hit Roby from behind, knocking him to the floor. He rose slowly, his ribs aching. He looked at the man who had struck him. Abdullah was the biggest one of them all, and the look on his face was the fiercest. My friend here, Abdullah, also does not like your disrespect. Abdullah bowed slightly in Talal's direction, and then spat at Roby. Yeah, said Roby. I can tell. He looked at Vance and Julie. But now you have me and you can let them go. As soon as you came here, as soon as your foot touched dirt in Tangier, you knew that was not possible. It's why I came. I expected you to honor our agreement, me for them. <laughs> and you are an idiot. You don't keep your word? Roby looked at the others. So how can they trust you, Talao? You tell them one thing and do another? Leader doesn't keep his word, then what's he worth? Nothing. He's worth nothing. Talal was unfazed by this, and his men did not seem to even understand what Roby was saying. You might try explaining that to them in Farsi, Dari, Persian, Pashto, and the old reliable Arabic. But I doubt their opinion of me would change. They do what they do because I pay them far more than they would earn elsewhere. Roby said, I'm going to offer you a chance to surrender. I'm only going to offer it once. After that, it will be withdrawn, and it won't be offered again. Talal smiled. You want all of us to surrender to you? Not just to me. Who, then? You were not followed here. We know that for a fact. You're right. I wasn't followed here. Talal blinked and then looked around. You speak gibberish. I expected better from you. You are obviously paralyzed with fear. Trust me, it would take a lot more than your fat ass to make me afraid. Before Talal could respond, Roby added, I'm just making the offer. It's up to you to take it or not. Do you refuse? What I think I will do 
is watch all three of you die right now. I'll take that as a no, said Roby. Abdullah, kill him, said Talal. Abdullah drew two guns. It only took a moment, but he flipped one pistol to Roby, who used it to shoot three of the men closest to him, including the young man who had first met him. The bullet wound joined the knife wound on his neck as his life ended. Abdullah fired twice, killing two other guards. When the other men drew their weapons, Roby emptied his mag at them, grabbed Vance and Julie, and pulled them behind the front landing gear of the jet. Cover your ears, said Roby to them. What? said Vance. Just do it, now. Abdullah, he shouted, and the big man threw himself to the side and slid behind the van. An instant later, the right side window of the hangar blew open, shattered by massive rounds from a 30 millimeter chain gun. Next, rifle rounds fired through this opening, slammed into the remaining guards. The shots were fired so fast and with such spot-on accuracy that the men had no chance even to fire back. One by one, they dropped, until the only one left standing was Talal. When two more men appeared at the door of the jet, they were immediately shot. Their bodies fell to the floor, making dull thunks on the cement. Outside the window, the chopper hovered. Its 30 mil chain gun, mounted between the front landing gear, is now silent. It was a stealth aircraft, and the rain had covered any sounds it had made. Until the chain gun had opened up, that is. There were few things on Earth that could cover the noise a 30 mil made. Shane Connors slid his self-loading sniper rifle off the metal support and kissed the hot barrel, his longtime ritual. He gave Roby a salute from the chopper and then signaled to the pilot. The chopper slowly moved off. Roby came out from behind the landing gear and approached Talal. Abdullah rose from behind the van and joined him. Talal gazed at Abdullah in disbelief. You betrayed me. How do you think we got on to you in the first place, Talal? said Roby. And if you can buy off our people, we can buy off yours. Roby lifted his gun. Talal stared at him. So you kill me now? No, it's out of my hands. I'm sorry. You're apologizing for not killing me? Talal said slowly. The hangar door opened, and a gold SUV pulled in. Inside were five men, all in robes, all armed. They got out of the car, lifted Talal up, and carried him to the vehicle. He screamed and tried to break free, but he was a man of little muscle, and he soon gave up. You're going back to Saudi Arabia, Talal, said Roby. The Americans have officially turned you over to your countrymen. I think you would have preferred the bullet. The SUV drove off, and Roby beckoned to Vance and Julie. There's a chopper outside that will take us to our ride home, he said quietly, and there's a medical crew on board. Vance and Julie crept out from behind the landing gear. Vance hugged him and said, I don't know how you managed all this, Roby, but I'm sure as hell glad you did. Julie looked at the departing truck and said, what will they do to him? There's no reason for you to waste a second of your life thinking about it. Why did he kill my mom and dad? I promise you that once we make sure you and Agent Vance are okay, and we put a few miles between us and this place and get some food in both your stomachs, I will answer all your questions, okay? Okay, Will. Roby put one supporting arm around Vance and held his other one out to Julie, who took it. They walked over to the waiting helicopter, which had set down in front of the hangar. Within the hour, they would be winging their way home. After that, Roby didn't know. He just didn't care to look that far ahead anymore. Chapter 99 Blue Man and Shane Connors were sitting at the small table in the conference room, when Roby walked in. Connors and Roby made eye contact, exchanged a brief nod, and then Roby sat next to him. Blue Man said, I've just congratulated Agent Connors on a job well done. Got me out from behind a desk, said Connors. That was reward enough. Roby eyed Blue Man. What did Van Buren tell us? 
Pretty much everything. Why did he turn on his country? Basically, money and morals. The money I get. Explain the morals. Well, the money was not exactly what you would have imagined. It was going to pay for medical bills with plenty left over for Van Buren to retire on. Even though they had insurance through the government, it didn't cover some of the experimental treatments that they used to try and save Elizabeth Van Buren. Without this money, they were going to have to declare bankruptcy, and without the money, she wouldn't have gotten the treatments. Unfortunately, they didn't work. And the morals. George Van Buren blamed the U.S. government for his wife's cancer. He said it was exposure to the toxins in the battlefield that led to her illness and death. He wanted his revenge, and the president and one of the leaders of Saudi Arabia were excellent targets for his rage. He must have talked to Gabriel Siegel, said Roby. He thinks the same thing. It doesn't excuse treason, commented Connors. No, it doesn't, agreed Blue Man. And Van Buren's daughter? Knew nothing about any of it, her father said, and we believe him. Nothing will happen to her. But she's lost both her parents now, said Roby. Yes, she has. Why was Van Buren knocked out? The original plan had been to leave him completely blameless. You discovering what you did made this impossible, of course, but they didn't know that. So Lambert knocks him out and steals his gun. Van Buren was going to hang around for a while longer in his job than retire and go live somewhere else. And all the deaths leading up to that, said Roby. George Van Buren screwed up. He told his wife what he was planning. Maybe he actually didn't even think she was listening or lucid. Maybe he just wanted to get it off his chest. But she had heard him. And being the patriot she was, the lady was pissed. When she was visited by Broom or Wind or Getty, she told them. Van Buren found out an action had to be taken. Scorched earth. Kill them all. You pretty much nailed what happened, said Blue Man. It was actually Leo Broom who had visited her. Broom later confronted Van Buren about what his wife had said. Van Buren tried to claim that his wife was simply hallucinating, but Talal's people had Broom put under surveillance. Broom told both Rick Wynn and the Gettys. That signed their death certificates. They dialed you up to kill Jane Wynn because they were terrified her ex had told her something. And it was also the catalyst to set you in motion along the course Talal had planned for you. And they put the tube down his wife's throat so she couldn't talk again noted Roby. They actually wanted to kill her, but Van Buren said he wouldn't go through with it if they did. When the plan was set and about to go off, he took her off the ventilator, and she died naturally. What about Gabriel Siegel? asked Roby. They wanted us to think he was involved. They called him at work, told him his wife would be killed if he didn't meet with them. I am not sure we'll ever find his remains. They had no reason to keep him alive. The attack at Donnelly's? The Saudis interrogated Talal. He wanted you to suffer, wanted you to blame yourself for what happened. He was certain you would figure out that you were the real target in all of this. They used the Secret Service van Van Buren got for them. Stupid on Talal's part, because it would naturally swing suspicion that way. But I guess he thought no one was smarter than he was. Broom's money? We did some more digging. It apparently was stolen Kuwaiti antiquities. He and Rick Wind were involved. Broom invested well. Wind did not. Curtis Getty was clean. Blue Man paused and studied Roby. But even though the President and the Crown Prince were the actual targets, you were at the center of this, Roby. I didn't kill Talal, and he decides to find out who I was, and then to come after me. When Elizabeth Van Buren talked, Talal saw a way to involve me in all of it. My handler orders the hit on Jane Wind, and I'm off and running from one orchestrated event to another. Connors said, It's a win-win for them. If you killed Wynn and her son, and later found out she was innocent, they probably figured that would screw you up. And if you didn't pull the trigger on a mother and son, that's why they had the backup shooter. They'd learned of your exit plan on the bus, and they made sure Julie would be there, too. Roby said, 
and they probably figured whether I pulled the trigger or not, I'd most likely get on the bus with Julie after I figured out who Jane Wynne really was. Blue Man added, But when they learned Julie came up with the idea of questioning other squad members, the game suddenly became too risky. That could lead to Van Buren. They would kill Julie and you too if necessary. Nothing could jeopardize the assassination attempt. Guess it all makes sense, said Roby slowly. Blue Man said, and Annie Lambert was an even earlier plant. After Talal escaped the attempt in Tangier and found out you were the shooter, he had her move into your building. This was before any of Elizabeth Van Buren's old squad members found out what her husband was up to. Talal evidently had certain plans for the two of you, he added quietly. Roby looked down at his hands. He had not brought himself to think about Lambert since the night he had killed her. She was better than me, he said at last. Faster, steadier. Never seen anyone that calm in a situation like that. She was also drugged, Blue Man pointed out. Have you ever drugged yourself to carry out a mission? No, but I've never gone into a mission where I absolutely knew I was going to die, either, Roby countered. More uneasy silence followed until Connors asked, how does an Ivy League-educated young woman from Connecticut end up being a traitor willing to die? Blue Man said, We've done a lot of digging on that, and the Saudis were able to get some information from Talal. Her adoptive father was English, her mother Iranian. They had emigrated to Iran while the Shah was still in power. Apparently, they were brutalized by members of the Shah's regime and even lost family members during the course of it. They appealed to their home government and to our government for help, but apparently were turned down. Back then, the Shah could do no wrong. As you know, we helped keep him in power. After the revolution in the late 70s, the Shah was deposed, and we lost all of our influence in that country. The Lamberts hated the West, obviously and apparently America in particular. They returned to England, adopted Annie, moved to America, and raised her as their daughter. But they were brainwashing her, programming her the whole time, said Connors, for something like this? Apparently for all of her life. There was no guarantee, of course, that she would get a position at the White House, but one can attempt to kill the president in other places as well. Her parents were wealthy and politically active. She was a brilliant student, and she was clearly a superb actress. We haven't interviewed one person who had any inkling. She was a ticking time bomb, not one. She led the perfect life, was able to interact socially, perform outstandingly at work. There was no flaw, no warning sign. It was as though she was two different people residing in the same body. She was, thought Roby. She had to be. Blue Man paused and looked over at Roby. She fooled the best we had, he continued. She was the most remarkable cell plant in my experience. Sort of a true-life Manchurian candidate, only better. Roby asked, And where are her parents now? Talal didn't know. Perhaps back in Iran. If so, we can't touch them. There's no place we can't touch said Roby sharply. And there's a Russian and a Palestinian out there who need to be addressed as well. They were the ones who brought this thing to Talal. I know. We're working on that. The three men fell silent as Roby brooded. Blue Man looked equally pensive, and Connors merely seemed curious. There are many ways to hurt people, Roby, said Blue Man finally. I know you know that. Yeah, Roby said brusquely. She was trained for this her whole life, and we're all terrified because she didn't fit any profile we have. What if there are more Annie Lamberts out there? Connor said, We have to find them and stop them. Roby smacked the table with the palm of his hand. She was the puppet. Her life was taken from her by her parents. She's dead and they get to live? Tell me what's wrong with that picture. She was a cold-blooded killer, said Blue Man. Bullshit. She was what they made her. She never had a chance. You're not the best person to make that determination. 
Then who is? Some analyst who never even met her? You got an algorithm for that? Blue Man said nothing for a few moments. If it makes you feel better, Khalid bin Talal is no longer among the living. Roby said nothing because this meant nothing to him. Then there is the matter of Julie, said Blue Man. I've got that covered, said Roby abruptly. He rose. How? I just do. He looked at Connors. I owe you, Shane, more than I'll ever have in the bank. We're square, like I said. Got me out from behind the desk. Roby looked at Blue Man. There are maybe five men I know who could have made the shot Shane did that night, and two of them are in this room. You might want to keep that in mind. Rules are rules, said Blue Man. No, rules, as we've seen, are made to be broken. He turned to walk out the door. Roby. He turned to look at Blue Man, who held up a manila folder. This was delivered to us by messenger. I believe you received a set, too. I think you should take this and do what you want with it. It's of no use or concern to us. Roby took the package, opened it, and glanced at the photos inside. The first one was of him and Lambert on the rooftop bar. The next was of her kissing him in front of the White House. He didn't look at the rest. He closed the package back up. Thanks. He walked out the door. Chapter 100 Roby drove. This time Julie was shotgun. Vance was in the back seat. They had mostly recovered from their injuries, though Julie still limped a bit, and Vance's face was still puffy. Where are we going? asked Julie. Somewhere you've already been, he replied. He had explained what he could to her about her parents' deaths. He had watched her sob, given her tissues. He'd talked with her quietly as her anger grew, peaked, and then faded to more tears. The fourteen-year-old, street-hardened kid had finally and fully unraveled in the face of overwhelming misery and grief. But at least she had some closure. He parked the car and the three got out and walked into the bar. Jerome Cassidy was waiting for them. His face was scrubbed pink, and he was dressed in what looked to be a new suit with shiny black shoes. His hair had been cut short and lay neatly on his head. From the whiff Roby got, the man had used hairspray to keep some errant strands in place. What are we doing here, Will? asked Julie, as Cassidy came forward to greet them. Roby and Cassidy had worked out the story beforehand. Cassidy said, He brought you here so I could tell you the truth. Truth? What truth? asked a bewildered-looking Julie. I wasn't just friends with your parents. He paused, eyed Roby, who gave a bare nod. I was your mom's half-brother. That means I'm sort of your uncle. Well, technically, I guess I am your uncle. We're related? Yes, we are. And I seem to be the only relations you have left. Now, I know you don't know me or anything, but I have a little proposition. Julie folded her arms across her chest and looked at him suspiciously. Like what? Like we take some time getting to know each other. See, the reason I was trying to track you all down was because your dad and my sister really helped me out when I was down. I owed them big. Never got a chance to repay that debt. I see where this is going. You don't owe me anything. No, Julie, it's a real debt. They loaned me money. I signed a note. That note was transferable into stock in a company I started with the loan. That company now owns all of my businesses, including this bar. If the note wasn't repaid by a certain date, the loan amount plus accrued interest was transferred into stock. The loan never was repaid and the stock was issued. You're a 40% owner in my business, Julie. I've got the documents to back it up if you want to see. I should have told you when I first met you, but I was so surprised to see you, I just didn't. But I'm a man of my word. And what your parents did for me changed my life. They earned the right to share in the rewards. Well, since they can't, you should. Because whatever they had now belongs to you. I'm a man of my word, and that's just the way it is. He stopped talking 
and looked at her uncomfortably. Julie's suspicious look faded. She glanced at Roby. Is this really on the up and up? We checked out his story. It's all true. You'll be able to go to any college you want. You'll be able to do anything you want. She looked back over at Cassidy. So what does that mean for you and me? Well, it means you can live with me. I can even legally adopt you. Or, if you prefer, you have the financial means now to have a guardian appointed until you reach the age of 18 and live in your own place. It's totally up to you. Live with you? Well, it would be flexible. I keep pretty busy, but I've got a housekeeper who's been with me a long time. She's got a daughter about your age. I think it'd work out, but again, it's up to you. I'll need to think about it. Absolutely. Take all the time you need, said Cassidy quickly. Roby said, Why don't you start trying to get to know each other right now? I don't think Mr. Cassidy here dressed up just to talk to you for a few minutes. Would that be okay, Julie? I can come back and pick you up later. I guess that would be okay. Roby looked at Cassidy and smiled. Have a good time. Thank you, Agent Roby, from the bottom of my heart. Roby and Vance turned and walked out. Julie caught up with them before they even reached the car. Okay, that story was total bullshit. What's really going on here? Roby said, I was telling you the truth. You are related to him. He cared for your parents deeply. He will care for you deeply. He's rich. Life will not suck. A smile crept across Julie's face. Pick me up in two hours. I will. She held up something. It was a small canister. It's the paralytic spray you gave me, just in case he turns out to be a creep. She walked back to the bar. Vance said, I feel sorry for whoever ticks her off. I don't. They'll have deserved whatever they get. Vance looked at him as they got into the car. You ever going to tell me the real story about Cassidy? No. Okay. Roby put the car in drive and pulled away from the curb. She touched him on the shoulder. You doing all right? I'm fine. I hate to bring this up, but what did Bin Talal mean when he said... Roby slowed the car and looked at her. She glanced away and said, Never mind. So we have two hours. You want to grab some lunch? Yeah, I do. They ate, talked about things they might do together. But part of Roby wasn't even listening. They said their goodbyes. As she was climbing out of the car, Vance said, If you keep saving my life, I'm really going to start developing an inferiority complex. There's nothing inferior about you, Nikki. You're top-notch in my book. I don't understand you completely, Roby, but I want to understand you. Does that make sense? He looked at her, a smile edging across his lips. I think you'll have the opportunity. I'll hold you to that. He picked up Julie at the appointed time and drove her back to an apartment the feds had temporarily gotten for her. It came complete with a housekeeper who packed a gun and could kick the crap out of most intruders. Before Julie got out of the car, she turned back to Roby. Is this goodbye, like forever? Do you want it to be? Do you want it to be? No, not really. But you're not sure. I don't want you to ever be hurt again because of me. Life is what it is, Will. You take it as it comes. That's always been my philosophy. Where do you think I learned it from? She playfully punched him in the arm. Thanks. I mean it. For everything. I think I owe you more than you owe me. How about we split it down the middle? She reached over and hugged him. He was tentative at first, but finally, Roby hugged her back. She got out of the car and slowly walked up to her apartment. She turned back, waved at him, and then, despite her still gimpy leg, Julie skipped up the last few steps, like a kid. Roby smiled and watched until he could no longer see. Her injuries would fully heal, at least her physical ones, and her emotional ones might too, given her age. Roby could not say the same for himself. The image of Annie Lambert came bursting into his mind like it had been fired there with a rocket launcher. Every moment they had spent together, everything they had said to each other, 
every possibility he might have given thought to about what could have been between them. And she had been a killer, just like he was a killer. His had been by choice. She had no real choice in the matter. So who was the guiltier one? It was like Julie had said, you had to take life as it came. It gave no quarter, spared no feelings, limited no pain, put no ceiling on happiness. This was his world. He was who he was. He could not change that. He was not an innocent. And the people he hunted certainly weren't innocent. Maybe the best Roby could do was protect those who actually were. This has been an Achette audio production of The Innocent, written by David Baldacci, read by Ron McClarty with Orla Cassidy. Executive producer, Michelle McGonagall. Produced and directed by Kevin Thompson. Engineered by Danny Famiano. Post-production, Paul Goodrich, Merlin Music, New York City. The Innocent is also available in print and as an ebook from Grand Central Publishing a division of Ashet Book Group. Text copyright 2011 by Columbus Rose Limited. Audio production copyright 2011 by Ashet Audio. All rights reserved. In accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, the duplicating, uploading, and electronic sharing of any part of this audiobook without the permission of the publisher is unlawful piracy and theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like to use material from the audiobook other than for review purposes, prior written permission must be obtained by contacting the publisher at permissions at hbgusa.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.